Here's some rules for pattern language. Number one, just look up here, and then you'll write it down. Once you get the understanding, you see what I'm doing? I want them to demonstrate understanding before I allow them to write, because I keep interrupting that pattern of having to write without understanding. They want to write so they can memorize later. I want them to pay attention and understand so they don't have to memorize ever. Because when you memorize, when you understand, you don't need to remember the exact words. You can always write it out in your own words. But if you're looking at your notes, writing word for word, you can't understand. So look up here first. Yes? One of the rules for patterns is they have to use the right theme. Remember what I said? If you can put it on a chart, a graph, or prospectus, it's the wrong thing. So they have to use the right thing. So you can write that down. It uses the right thing. The right topic, the right thing. Conversational thing, topic. How are you doing, Lisa? You bored? I may start teaching this to women because I'd rather have a room full of 50 women. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Okay, kind of warning. Are, are we enjoying this? It's not bad for the first evening, is it? That was very good. Okay, so you have to have the right thing, the right topic. A another element is pattern should contain, pattern should address the emotional processes and states and subjective experiences that you want her to go through. So it's the feelings, feel attraction, feel whatever. So they should address the feelings and the states of mind and the emotions that you want her to undergo. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Pattern should also be, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look up here when you finish writing that. <coughs> Pattern should also be delivery vehicles for suggestions and commands. Yes? Pattern should be delivery vehicles for suggestions and commands that use weasel phrases and that use ambiguity as to who's being referred to. Look up here and don't write. Get the understanding. Pattern should also be delivery vehicles. You can write in a moment. For so when I see that their heads go down in their writing before they can possibly understand it, I bring their attention back out. Patterns are also delivery vehicles for suggestions and commands and ambiguity as to who is being spoken about. So, uh, and suggestions, commands take the form of feel that, do that, feel that happening. Recognize that's happening. Feel, do, recognize, realize. Use commands. Feel that, do that, recognize, feel that, feel that growing, feel that happening. And suggestions, suggestions take the form of that's what's happening, that's what's happening, that's taking place, that's what's taking place now. You understand? And I also said ambiguity is to who you're referring to. So you say it's like you realize that's happening. Well, does that mean it's happening with the people you're describing or between you and the girl? You understand? So a good pattern also uses ambiguities of who you're referring to. Are you referring to the people you're telling the story about or what's going on between you and the woman? Do you understand that ambiguity? Yes. yes. Look here before you write. See, so they don't totally get it yet. Do you understand the difference between that and the wrong way to do it, which is, and you realize that's what's happening between you and me, Debbie, right now. <laughs> right? Yes. That's being specific. Here you want to be vague. By being vague, Look here, I want you to demonstrate understanding. When you're vague, what happens? The unconscious mind goes on a search and tries to find all available meanings and applies all available meanings. Mm -hmm. So the unconscious mind says, oh, is he talking about the people in the story? Is he talking about he and I? The unconscious mind says, they're all true. It's both true about the people in the story and it's also happening between he and I. This takes place unconsciously, they're not aware of it. You understand? Mm -hmm. Understand how the tool works and you understand how to apply the tool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see now why I'm not just letting you write and memorize? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Do you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So pattern should also be delivery vehicles for commands, suggestions, and ambiguities to who's being referred to. Yes? Yeah. Hold on. 
pattern should also require her participation and incorporate her transfers. Pattern should require her participation and incorporate her transfers. Let's discuss that. I know you have a question. Now, Jack and uh, Connie, I'm going to make them explain to you what that means. They're going to have to participate if they want to run through. So, what do we mean by that? Why is it important to incorporate her trans words and require her participation? What happens if we don't incorporate her trans words? She's not a She's not a person. You don't open up the, uh, the safe door. You don't open up the safe door if you don't use the combination she's handy. Yes, what? Trans words are like pre wired fishing lines right down into that level for mind that responds to this stuff. It's like that trail of red. So you want to use her transwords both because they open up those paths in her mind in a way where there's no resistance because it's her word. You're feeding her word back, so how can it be resistant? It's like you're mentally throwing your voice into her head. Ross, well, mental head You're yeah. saying therefore you should also, in terms of rapport, say at the speech she's saying it, deliver it how she's saying it. So her word. You don't want to trigger that. that. You don't have to even go there. Just use her words. Just use her words. I use her words now online. How do you understand me? Well, I read your profile, picked out your transcripts, and fed them back to you, Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> it took me one minute and 30 seconds. I'll show you the email I'm getting. It's remarkable how well you understand me. How did you do it? I read the profile, I knew what to look for, and I ignored everything else. Those three words popped out to me and got bigger. Or I'm going to use those. End of story. And I even titled my email, Passion and Compassion and joy. And she used those words. Those were her trans words. So my email said, passion, compassion, joy. It's amazing to see a woman who really wants to experience passion, compassion, and joy with me. So I think about what would it be like to meet someone with whom you could really share it. It'd be, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to experience? I'm curious to learn more about the person wrapped inside all the pretty find me. Pete. Wow, you understood me. No. Really. Is this fair? Yes. <laughs> Is it fair? Yes. Who gives a fuck? Wrong answer. <laughs> Is it manipulative? Yes. 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 Of course it isn't. Because just looking at my picture, they would never give me a second look. <laughs> they wouldn't. Why should I allow their first response to fuck up their chance to be with someone like me? That's not fair. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's funny, but it's serious. Is that fair to them? No. No, it's not fair to them either, is it? You can rationalize anything, but it's not fair. So, hold on. You had a question. Let me go back to your question. Yeah, it was just about your consciousness. Stop a minute. So one of the things I also do is watch to see who interrupts themselves with too many questions. Because over time, I will begin to reshape that pattern. Initially, I take every question. But then, by listening, I begin to see what their pattern is of asking the question. Do they want too much detail? Do they want me to provide a lot of reassurance that, yes, they can do it? Are they asking a question to just demonstrate to me how much they already know? Are they confused? If they're confused, is it because they don't understand? Or they have ideas that appear to conflict? <coughs> understand? I don't know yet. But go ahead, your question. <laughs> I can talk to a woman, I'm sitting down, and I can say this man or woman over here talking about how good they may be with Stop. Sex. I'm not describing, I'm talking about something I saw two weeks ago. I'm not talking about something I'm actually observing because it may not fit. Okay. Right, or her unconscious is listening to my story, and then she's, it's just going into her head. <coughs> she's, uh, she's not saying we're well, directly talking That's about right, because she doesn't know consciously, but unconsciously, the unconscious is, is talking about me and her. Right. Okay. So basically, this unconscious mind is built up and built up and built up and built up, and then, you know. I don't know if it's about built up and built up and built up and built up, but yes, you're understanding me. You are understanding me. Yes. So all these patterns, does it require that you are alone with her? Because, 
let's say there is a party or there are people interrupting. No, because once you start communicating with her like this, you may as well be alone with her because no one else will matter. <laughs> 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 You don't need to take the girl into physical isolation if you're so fascinated that no one else exists in that room. Oh, there goes MM method again down the tubes. You don't need to take a girl into isolation if you're so fascinated that no one else exists in that room. Oh, you see how they're not thinking at the right level? Yes, Eric. Yes. Um, How's your comic going? Uh, you know, coming out in three weeks. Huh? Volume two. Good coming for you. Out um, you said, um, play a fun game, and then you followed that by going into a deeper, you know, yeah. something more meaningful, and you said about fractionating that. Yes. Now, and a good pattern, hold on, a good pattern, so it requires her investment and involvement, because if we get her invested, then she's getting, first of all, it's more real to her, and second, she's going to be giving us words that we can feed back, right? So, a good pattern gets her to invest and incorporates her answers. Right? We got that? A good pattern also fractionates back and forth between. A good pattern should be preceded and followed by something that fractionates around it. Usually something not so serious. We got it? These are the basic hold on building blocks. Yes? Can I ask you, if you're doing that pattern too, and you're saying, oh, you won't be polite yet, then if she interrupts you and starts spouting off about something, would you then try to... Usually it's not an interruption. Usually it's her wanting to participate. Would you then... Well, what Stop. This is an example of you didn't hear my answer because you see his head. So you got to be able to teach it to see that. It's not an interruption. It's her participating, giving you information flowing out of that deep part of her mind. That's not an interruption. That's her feeding you the answers because her unconscious likes the whole thing. So. Not an interruption, usually. You're talking about her changing the topic completely. What do you mean by interruption? Yeah, if she, yeah, basically, she interrupts you and sort of changes the, the topic as well. I mean, would you try to recover? I've never had it happen. Okay. Not once. I've had women show no interest in the topic to begin with. I've had women not participate, so it's like pulling teeth, so I walk away. I've had women show a bad attitude, so I go, they're not worth playing. I'm not of a mind to give a gift to someone who's not of a mind to eagerly, gratefully accept it. I'm not kidding. Uh, still, yes, still about the fractionating. Yeah. I think, was that when you brought up the example with the candy as a girl? Or, yeah. or could it be anything except from the three other levels of the mind, something less personal? Yeah. Yeah. A good pattern is preceded and followed by <coughs> fractionation of something that's lighter to mm -hmm. Are there A good pattern, usually, not always, is preceded by something that's lighter than tone, lighter in tone, and it's followed by something that's lighter than tone. Mm -hmm. Does everyone know what I word, mean by the word proceed? It means come before. Yeah. A good pattern has something before it that's lighter in tone, and it's followed usually by something after it that's lighter in tone. Because we're fractionating back and forth overall. These are the elements of a good pattern. But you gotta have the right topic, so there's connections. Another topic, we're just, that's just one topic. I've been giving you the other five, have I? <laughs> there's five more. So I've got a big overall loop. A big overall loop is topics and things. And within that, I have to work with their understanding. I have to get answer their questions. I have to get them participating, demonstrating that they understand what I'm doing. Okay, I'm yes. What is your name, sir? Vijay. Vijay, I love it. Vijay. Uh, so, you, do you suggest, I mean, it, the talk, uh, talking of a fractionation, pattern one, fractionation, pattern two, fractionation, is it what you suggest? He says, do I suggest pattern one, fractionation. Yeah. And pattern two, fractionation. Pattern two, mm -hmm. fractionation, yes, but pattern two is all, pattern one, fractionation, mm -hmm. then pattern two, yes, but fractionation is a pattern of seduction, even though it doesn't require a lot of language, anything that moves the transaction along is a pattern. Touching in the right way is a pattern. But language pattern, fractionation, language pattern two. The language pattern two is going to incorporate all the responses we got from language pattern one. We're not just going to leave them behind. 
Think of the metaphor of an avalanche. If you create an avalanche, you don't have to shake the whole mountain. You just have to know the vulnerable spot and make sure the snowball starts from there so it keeps rolling down the hill. So the next pattern we're going to do is going to incorporate all those juicy responses, verbal and nonverbal, that she gave us in the first one, and all the information we gain about her seduction map in the world. You understand? And at each point, we're tugging the safe door. If it's ready to swing open after the first pattern, are we going to keep talking? No. Yes or no? no? Yes or no? No. Yes or no? No. no? no. You're not answering. Yes or no? No. no? no. So remember, one of the metaphors to carry along with you is opening the safe. Opening the safe. Tugging that safe. Ross, should you fractionate, say, two or three times on each thing, so it's a connection you're going for, should you fractionate two or three times on that before you then move on to the next? I can't give you an exact number, but I'm always fractionating, that's how I do this. Can you give another example of fractionating? You can fractionate back and forth between being, being like a more heavy topic, but it's not heavy, but you know, a more hypnotic topic by connection and then doing something ridiculous, like, um, so when you were a little girl, was there some kind of candy that was the king in your candy castle? I'll go into that pattern later. Or fractionate, you could just go, look at those guys over there. I bet you that guy farts in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, something like that. The point is something in the environment again. Remember, you started by looking out at the environment. Now you're going to then take her out and look back at the environment. You can fractionate to the focus of attention. The focus of attention was you and her speaking, then focus outward again. So you can fractionate whether it's paying attention to each other or to the environment, right? You can fractionate among being serious and being funny. You can fractionate inside of the pattern. You can fractionate what body you're coming from. You can fractionate intensity. How intense are you when you're not so? You can fractionate intensity. There are all sorts of levels that you can track. Fractionation is huge. It's the F word. You notice now I'm taking the general principle fractionation I talked about and incorporating it into another broad topic, which is themes, and tying it back to specific pieces within that topic. It's loops within loops. Ross, when you're training them to teach, as I when you're taking an embedded command or using an embedded question. Um, would you fractionate that, say, by slowing down and then other parts of what you're saying speed up somewhat? No. Right. He's thinking at a very small chunk level that's not too small. Right. Now, that's a samskar. That's a what? That's a fixed way of learning right. that's not useful. You would do better by chunking up and focusing on the broader principles rather than being so detailed. Right. Right. And remember, you're dealing with very chaotic systems. You're dealing with women who are chaotic. Yeah, so I don't mean that in a negative way. Chaos is sexy. Mm -hmm. It is. But they're chaotic. And I mean specifically meaning they're complex. And at any given moment, any of the elements can control all the other elements. Even if it seems to be a very small input, it can take over and control the whole system. Right. Like a butterfly flaps its wings in Margaret Thatcher's crotch. It causes a thunderstorm. <laughs> a little tiny, it's my imagery that's funny. You won't forget that. <laughs> Are you getting this? Yes. 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 Now, before you walked in that door, you didn't even know to think about fractionation most of you. Now you're asking good questions about where do I apply it? What level do I apply it? So it tells me that it's going in. I'm starting to get it. Yeah? yeah. Yes. 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 Another theme is indulgence. So there's connections, there's indulgence. What kind of things do we indulge in? What we like for indulgence? I lump indulgence, escape, fantasy, and adventure as one thing. So there's another one. Indulgence, escape, fantasy, and adventure. Adventure. To me, they're all a general thing. I clump them into one theme category. Indulgence, escape, adventure. Fantasy. So that's another. You done for the night, mate? Yeah, I am. Sorry. See ya. Gotta go home. We'll see you tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, right. Ta-ta.
Are you following this? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. Indulgence, escape, fantasy, adventure. Would these be useful things to get a woman talking about? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah? You think? Oh, yeah. Here's a good one. of the girl with other guys or other lovers. Say so what? Is it useful to speak? To is it useful to have her talk about experiences she has with other lovers? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think in terms of you got to put it in context. At what point in the seduction and in what context is it being brought up? At the, at the starting of the seduction? No, absolutely not. At the start, no. Usually I don't even, you don't go there. Make her arouse too. We get smart children. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it. Leave it alone. So, <clears throat> indulgence, escape, fan. Here's a good question I like to ask. Look up here. You got to kill your initial autopilot response, which is look down at your notes as soon as I start talking. That's the wrong response. That's like putting your pants on when she says, I want to fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> My metaphors are shocking. I know. All right. Here's a really good question. Someone's going to look down and write. Here's a really good question. If you could go somewhere where no one knew who you were and nothing you did would ever get back to anyone who did know you, what kind of experiences would you like to try? What kind of feelings? What kind of person? That's a good question because in order to answer the question, what part of her mind does she have to reach deep down into? Four. Four. That's right. Now, whether she answers you verbally or not doesn't matter. Ask me about that tomorrow and I'll tell you what to say to get her thinking about that, whether she answers verbally or not. It may actually help for her not to answer verbally. Because if she doesn't answer verbally but starts thinking that way, you can give her suggestions and start looping at it. You can say, you know, I find when I find when I let those thoughts run through your mind, <laughs> just keep seeing the pictures and feeling the feelings, for whatever mysterious reason your mind moves in a new direction, it's like there's another part that you want to take on. <laughs> and now I've got that anchor, so when I want to fire off those looping thoughts, I do that. So she didn't even have to answer me verbally. If she answers me verbally, so much the better. <coughs> If she gives you a non-verbal response when you've answered that question, then you don't mirror that. She responds from that bigger thing to do as well. With that kind of thing, she, the kind of non-verbal responses that I want you to mirror back are the ones she does just before she starts talking. Right. She goes... Yeah, so I, as you ask the question, just before she starts responding, she may have some kind of non-verbal response. Yeah, but I'm saying she doesn't even have to respond verbally here. This to work. Because she's going to be thinking about it, and then you can give her commands to loop all this stuff. See, hypnotists in the room, just because she runs the suggestion once doesn't mean it has power. But if you can install a looper, she keeps ruminating on it, then it's got power. But you have to give those commands for her to ruminate on it by saying, I find when I let those thoughts run through your mind. Did you feel that temporary little shift of confusion? I find when I listen, I find that when I let my teaching run through your mind, there's like a, whoa, that, that didn't make this a little shift. There's a little bit of, you have to do that. And then you can anchor it and they'll, they'll keep running those thoughts. Now, would it be useful for a woman within the first 20 minutes of talking to you to be running all sorts of sexual fantasies and things she'd do if no one would ever catch her? <coughs> and you say to her, it almost becomes like you're looking at those thoughts through something you've got to have. Like there's another part you've got to take on. <laughs> so not only she's not know, not only she's not looping at those thoughts, she's looking at you through those thoughts. And then you talk, there's a part you want to take on. So there's a, a much bigger part that you want to take on tonight. <laughs> that ambiguity means she wants to take your penis. <laughs> so if I were directed to Debbie, I'm going to bring up the topic. I want you to think about your most exciting, vulgar, vile sexual fantasies. 
I'm going to arrange it so you not only have those stops obsessively whenever I fire off a post of non suggestion, but you're going to look at me through all those lustful thoughts, and you're going to imagine my penis as being the end reward for all of them. That's what you're really saying, but you're saying it to the unconscious mind. You really appreciate this at a very deep level, aren't you? Yeah, you say, wow, this is masterful hypnosis, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But we're not waiting any watches, are we? We're not, we're not telling them to look into my eyes. <laughs> but it's all going in. But it won't go in if you don't use her own words. If she's not participating, if you're not incorporating her own words, if you're not keeping her feeling safe and comfortable, and if you're not fractionating, it's not really going to go in as effectively. It might. With a really good, with like 15%, maybe 10 to 15, some have said 20% of the population are synambulists. You need any suggestion you give them, they'll go right in, utterly make it their world. The problem with people like that is they can have a very loose grip on reality. These are the ones who have no people an iPhone. Hmm. Or suddenly decide one day they hate your guts when the moment before they were madly in love with you. The reality is not very stable. So they'll accept whatever reality you put in there, but the next minute you don't know what's going to happen. You don't want that. Right? You want someone who's participating, who's investing. You're fractionating. Here's the other cool thing. You're learning about her world. When she talks, when she brings this stuff up, you're learning. You really are truly learning about her. You really are. When you do this M&M candy shit, you don't learn anything because you're doing all the talking and you're not listening to her answers anyway. It's no fun for me. This is fun, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Someone said hey, this is manipulative. <laughs> Hold out your hands like this. What is the most important digit on that? These hands, if you lose them, you're in trouble. Oh. Right. Because the thumb allows you to manipulate. The thumb works through both opposition and cooperation by moving in a way that's opposing to the other finger and in coordination and cooperation with them that enables us to move the world unlike any other animal. Chimps have opposing thumbs too. My cats have made it very clear to me telepathically that if they ever woke up one morning and had opposing thumbs, they killed me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they open the cans. My cats have made it very clear. You know, Tabitha was laying on the chest one morning. She looked at me and said, you know, Dad, if you woke up one morning the size of a mouse, I would torture you greatly before I killed you and ate you. <laughs> and it's nothing personal. <laughs> Just the way it works. So, that's a thing. Now, another thing are games and quizzes and tests. I get. Games, quizzes, tests, demonstrations. Games, quizzes, tests, demos. Games, quizzes, tests, demos. Games, quizzes, tests, demos. An example of that would be, who's got my gold walk-up DVD? The twin brothers, right? Snack quiz. We'll go through them tomorrow. Someone remind me. The cube. The cube. Snack. Someone remind me tomorrow to do twin brothers and the snack quiz, right? The twin brothers, snack quiz, the cube. Yes. Um, the SRT. SRT, signal recognition, when you have them imagine what's the first flow of feeling you get. Now watch them. Anything we get, it has to participate. Like handwriting analysis, that's one of them. The cube. But remember, they're all delivery meters for suggestions and commands. Remember? I'm not doing it for an academic curiosity. If you start doing the cube and she starts talking about sexual stuff, Fuck the rest of the team. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? So tests, demos, poems. Poems, stories, poems, jokes, demonstrations, games, tests. Well they all part of the same group as well. They're all part of the same group. Games, poems, stories, tests, jokes. I got some great jokes here from the hot as hell. <laughs> You don't want to hear them. You're tired. No. <laughs> yes. I may just go to midnight. Are you sleepy? No. 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 
Jones poet. Poems. S has poems. That's another example. Poems are great. Uh, uh, how about uh, palmistry? Palmistry. Penny's chick crack things. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's poem stories. Is it? Um, I have a couple of good jokes. <clears throat> Guy has a thing for Paris Hilton. He worships Paris Hilton. <clears throat> he finds out that Paris Hilton, his book to cruise, this very exclusive luxury yacht. There's only her cabin and one other cabin, and it's up to three hundred thousand pounds. <clears throat> So he mortgages, he sells his house, sells his car, raids his kids' college trust funds, sells a kidney, sells his retarded child to slavery in China. <laughs> Pays the 300,000 pounds and he gets that cabin right next to Paris. So. And he's, you ever, you ever really want something? And you work up your appetite. Think about how good we can finally find the end of this. The more you think about it, the more you want it. The more you want it, the more you think about it. It's almost like you start to look through the world and those kind of thoughts. Like there's another part of you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> they're on the ship, and it gets tossed by a storm, hits the rocks, the ship sinks. Everyone, or so it seems, dies. He washes up on the shore. Who washes up on the shore? The parasol, and she's sub drowning. So he, you know, rips open her shirt, pumps her heart, gives her CPR. She coughs up all the spot and she revives. And she says, Oh my God, you saved my life. Here we are in this desert island. There's no one around. There's no reason at all we can just drop all the inhibitions because nothing we do will ever get back. We can do anything we want. <laughs> and things we never knew we wanted to try. And I'll do anything for you if you're my master. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so the guy looks at her and he says, Can I be honest with you? She says, You're my master, anyways. I've never in my life wanted to fuck anyone the way I want to fuck you. I want to fuck you like you are the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the last man. <laughs> and all the fucking we ever want to do is going to happen right now. <laughs> now, who am I really talking to? <laughs> you see girls going. Do you see how? 
Yeah. So what I, my method is, I hear a joke and then I embellish it. I think, here's the standard joke. How can I embellish that with verbal commands and suggestions and descriptions that'll get it really hot? Right? <laughs> it could be a joke. It could be a demo. A demo is like SRT or the Blamo pattern. You know my famous Blamo pattern? That's a demo. So joke, stories, poems, demos, quiz. A quiz could be something like, I'll say anything to a girl, don't say it. It seems like a non sequitur I'll say anything and he'll say, so, are you a roller, a folder, or a thrower? He said, what? Okay, we're on vacation. We're going to finally, we're going away on your ideal vacation. Our suitcases are open. Do you roll your clothes, do you fold them, or do you just throw them in? Now in America, I say, are you a roller, a folder, or a tosser? But I understand <laughs> that tossing has a different meaning. Are you a roller, a folder, or a thrower? And it's just a fun thing, and, and they always bite down on that. Just so you a little quiz, a little something like that. Okay. The next topic is sex, but not necessarily sex. It could be. What do you think makes for a really fantastic kisser? Understand? So sex, desire, sometimes it's directly sex. If they're really into it, you know, you can bring it up. For me, a topic, the next topic that I talk about is for me, I talk about sometimes what I teach, sometimes. Because it can be very fascinating. You can talk about what you learned in this wacky seminar. Mm -hmm. You understand? It's being didactic. Didactic means the role of a teacher. That's for me. But you can talk about what you learned. Or for you, you can say, it's so interesting, you learn so much about people. Right? How people learn about themselves, that's the topic. For me, it's about what I teach people. You get it? And the final topic. Can you, can you use a quick example of that? Of what I teach? Sex one. Sex? Yeah. <laughs> if they're into it, and they're starting to get really sexual with you. Just go blatantly into it. If they're getting really sexual with you, you can say, so really, so what's the wildest thing you've ever done? If they start with the topic, I never introduce sex, I let them bring it up. But if they bring it up, I'll talk to them about it. They gotta bring it up first. But you can also talk about things that are sort of sexual, like so what do you think makes for an absolutely fantastic kiss? Right? And as they describe it, they're gonna go through what it would feel like. I don't start with that topic. I let them bring it up. But if they bring it up right away, I know they're a tease, so I don't do it. But deep in the conversation, if they start bringing it up, if they say something like, you know what? I think the girls just need a really good fucking sometimes. You let them go real life. So if that were to happen, how do you think it would start? Do you understand? If they bring it up, I'll bring it up. You can bring up kissing and that sort of thing. And another topic is I bring up what I teach sometimes because it's useful for me. So you can bring up about what you learned we were at. at a wacky seminar or how you learn so much about people. Understand? I learned so much about people by learning how they connect with their desires. Right? Do you get it? Final thing is observations that I have about that. Observations, intuitions, or challenges that I throw their way. No, uh, hold on. Observations, I meant intuitions I have about them or challenges I throw out. So I was just picking up when we walked out of the break floor and those two girls walked out of the seminar but didn't look too happy. Yeah. But then straight away they sort of lit up. Yeah. I said, boy, that doesn't look very interesting. You notice what I did? I do a thing. Or as I was walking away from them, I said, that doesn't look too interesting. <clears throat> Why? Because they didn't look like they were too interested in talking to anybody. So, observations, intuitions, challenges. <coughs> Observation, intuitions, challenges. Games, sex, desire. But I also put what I do. I talk about what I do, what I teach. You forgot that. But you can put what you learned at a wacky seminar. Okay.
Those are the six. Yeah, go ahead. You, any questions? I'll take questions for five minutes, then we're going to wrap it up. It produces tremendous suffering, and it makes the learning process very difficult. If you can drop that, you do really well. So, one of the big pieces of speech seduction is learning technology, learning how to learn from your mistakes, and shutting down all that rumination so it doesn't ever have to happen ever again. If you were to take that same process of dwelling on mistakes and lift it out of you and virally put it in the head of someone who's really good with women, how, what do you think their life would look like three months from now? <laughs> Here's an exercise to do. Tomorrow, I want you to go to a public place and look at someone who looks like they're very happy in their life. And imagine that program of dwelling on mistakes over and over, you're planting in their head. <coughs> imagine what they'll look like three months from now after running that 24-7 in all the important areas of their life. How do you think they'd look? Yeah. What would happen? <laughs> I want you to do this. I realize it's an assignment to do that drill. I mean it. My mother used to shake her finger at me to make a point. I mean it. I'm completely serious. Do the drill. Because when you see it, you'll begin to understand it. It's not that you're fucked up or anything. It's just your running shit that's getting in the way. Does this make sense? Yes. 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 I want you to do that drill. Just pick people who look like they're really happy in their life and imagine you're putting that bad programming into their head where they dwell on every mistake over and over and over and over and over and over. And then imagine what they'll look like three or four months from now, what their life will feel like. Are you going to do it? Do it. So that's the first piece. The second piece of speed seduction is building energy and vibe, understanding how energy and vibe attracts one another, learning how to, how to build that. That's a lot of fun. Third piece <coughs> are the language patterns. You guys all love that shit, don't you? <laughs> That's the third piece, the language patterns that turn women on, get women money. Oh boy, I'm getting good at this stuff. I'll show you some games I'm playing with some people on the internet. Uh, <laughs> Do you have my computer? Oh, where's my computer? Okay, well, that's all right. We'll get to it later. <coughs> Sorry, guys. You can do a lot more. And basically, those are the pieces that you're going to be learning this video. So, are they working on cooling down the room? Yes. All right. Twice. Check in with them in like another 10 minutes because it's getting warm in here. All right. Any questions so far? I'm going to take a little pause. Any questions? Yes, sir. You know, when you you're not French, are you? Okay. <laughs> Is that microphone set up, mate? It doesn't need to be up here? All right, go ahead. You know what you're saying, how um, when you do like your meditation, you can work out different signals, you know, you can take what's good and what's called. Cool. Right. right. Are you going to be able to so you can do it in, for other situations as well, not just with women, but with yeah. parts of Yes, parts. of course. Of course. The greatest thing that's happened to me is developing a really good meditation. Not because it's new age or airy fairy for granola eating sense of new age guys, trust me, I'm not. But because it's a practical tool for quieting the mind and seeing things that when when uh, trust me, here's something that's true. When you go to change a very important area of your life where you have a very strong set of fixed patterns, fixed ways of thinking and responding, <coughs> stuff will come up. But when you start to do this stuff, it's very likely at some point all of your old bullshit will come up. I can't do this, this is too scary, I'm only going to fail. When things come up, you have two choices. You can stuff them back down or you can buy into them and, and get rehypnotized. Hmm. Those are the two bad choices. Or you can try to push through the pain. So there's three bad choices. You can buy into all this old stuff that comes back up. Do you understand what I mean by buying into it? Like believing in and swallowing it back down. You can do that. You can suppress it, just push it down. When you push things down, you ever kink a garden hose? You ever take a hose with water and kink yeah. it? What happens? It was all pressure. Can we turn that off? Thank you. Please turn off your phone. Who is it? Who's this? It's about 40 pounds now.
So, or you can push through the pain. The problem is when you push through pain, it's better than sitting it, but when you push through pain, you're also pushing the pain out in front of you. And as you're going to learn, women are very sensitive to vibe. Part of peering deep into the mathematics, the code, and how women move through the world is they're very sensitive to the vibe. So if you push through pain, you're pushing that wall of pain out in front of you. Not a good idea. But there's a fourth alternative, which is to be mindful of what comes up have a full experience of it without buying into it. And a good proper meditation practice allows you to be aware of all that without buying back into it. If you're aware of it without buying back into it, you can hijack the emotional energy and divert it into actually serving you instead of trying to. What if all the emotional energy, all the stored emotional energy you worked into your system by grinding those gears in your mind? What if all that stored up, pent up, fucked up emotional energy could be clean, diverted and cleaned up and purified and refined and then returned to you as raw power for you to empower yourself to go over and go. Would that be a good thing? Yes. Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. Sound off like you have a pair. I can't hear you. Yes. Sorry if I got your frilly pink panties in a bunch. I can't hear you. Yes. Very good. I am Sergeant Major Roth, Jeffries. Yes, sir. From now on, the first words out of your filthy golf. And the last words out of your filthy gob will be, Sir, is that clear? Sir, is that clear? That make sense? Yeah, yeah. sir. So. We need to pick on someone. Later. So. Let's get started talking about language patterns since you horny bastards want to learn how they work. <laughs> right? Right. right. <coughs> now I should say, part of your job as a speed seducer is testing women to see how open they are to this. <coughs> speed seduction is not a tool to get laid with everyone you see. Rather, it's a way of filtering for those women who would be fun and good and sexy and hot to be with, who otherwise might not give you a fair try. You understand? Yeah. Some women are just not going to be open to this. And there are other women, and here's the real tricky thing. Look here. Don't write. They're gonna, there, there are some women who will be open to it, but you have to do all the talking. You have to talk constantly, and you have to uphold them in that transaction. Probably <coughs> women like that, is they're not a lot of fun, and you're going to have to do that throughout the whole time you're with them, whether it's one night, five weeks, or, or for years. I would prefer to look for women who are fun, adventurous, have some sense of what they want in life, know how to participate along with me. I don't want to make this wisdom tooth extraction. This is not emotional tooth extraction. Write that down. Not emotional dentistry. Write that down. This is not emotional dentistry. This person bought from the child. I'm German. This is going to be to bait all those women out there. You're German? I'll see. Because you were telling me about the German. No, it's nice. Swiss yeah. person. Mm -hmm. I love it. I'll be eating all this chocolate out of the girls in the hotel. I'll be quite hot. <laughs> Look here. This is not emotional dentistry. You're not going to use this to pull the emotional wisdom teeth of women who need you to do all the work. When you start to get good at this, you'll be able to scream within a minute whether she's a good candidate or not. <coughs> the joy of this is you're going to get fantastic looking women who are also a lot of fun, who otherwise might not have given you a fair try. You'll be able to get them without having to date, and you'll be able to do it reliably and consistently, but it's not for every woman. So this is not emotional dentistry. Clear? So one of the things you should do, don't do it now, but one of the things you should do is make a list of the emotional qualities in the women who you want to use this with. Let's assume, look up here, we'll just assume that they're hot looking. We'll assume that's a given. Assuming they're hot looking, what are the emotional qualities that you look for? For me, I look for a sharp mind, a sense of adventure, someone who's already sexual and is into sex. It's not my job to convert her from 
being um, Queen Victoria <laughs> to Lindsay Lohan. That's not my job. So she's already got to be into sex. She's got to have good knowledge of her body. She's got to be healthy, adventurous, giving. She's got to be attracted to men who are, who are smart. I have my own list of things, and if they don't fit that, I screen them out. So part of this is learning to screen. Some of you are saying, Ross, the only thing I'm screaming, screening for is a vagina that's alive. <laughs> <laughs> and not a direct relative, but like, my mom's been looking pretty good. <laughs> and, and so, but if you can screen, what happens is you become more attractive. The irony is, the cheesier you are, the more choice you get. You can write that down. The choosier you are, the more choice you get. Now that seems utterly paradoxical to those of you who are going through a five-year blood trap. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you can get what you want. Was it the choosier you are? The choosier you are, the more choice you get. Okay. Yes, my pepe, you feel from more. You have the point to make. Yes, how about set it to choose good or high for it to good? Or? I really didn't understand what you said. I'm not having fun. I didn't understand. Eric? You should pray for high self-esteem in the ground. He's <laughs> hedge. <laughs> Actually, if you want to understand self-esteem, what they're trying to say is, first of all, the person has an internal locus of control. They decide how they're going to feel about events and circumstances, rather than feeling a certain way because something happened. They have a really good strategy for learning from their mistakes. So they have a lot of confidence because they know if they make a mistake, they'll learn immediately and grow more powerful. And third, they have, a, they have a way of finding happiness outside of external circumstances. They have a way of, of being happy, even if things aren't going their own way. Fourth, they have a vision of where they want to go that's not dependent on external support. But at the same time, can take in information so they can adjust. All right, that's what I think they're trying to say is self-esteem. And five, they have a really good explanatory style. If something happens that they don't like, they don't say it's because they're a loser or like hates them. They just say, well, something happened, I'll figure it out. That's what really high self-esteem is. But the way people, the way it's defined, it has no meaning, it doesn't mean anything. It's like saying, I have high horrible, horrible, moral wish. So, language. My proposition to you is that when women speak and when women hear language, they process it differently than we do. Not necessarily better or worse, it's just different. And if you take a female brain, here's a female brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's divide it. Okay, here's the female brain. No, I'll divide it that. Okay. When women hear language, they process it unconsciously. First, it's a little bit called the amygdala. The amygdala is that little bit in the brain that controls the basic unconscious emotional response to the situations. The F's, it runs home along the F's, flight, fight, fuck, feed. Fight, flight, fuck, feed. Those are the four F's. So you're going to fight, you're going to flee, you're going to fuck, or you're going to feed. It goes there, like in a tenth of a second. And then it goes to the right brain, where they process it on a more, that's an emotional level, but it also contains an intellect, and then it goes to the left brain. Men, when we hear language, go straight to the dick. Are we going to get or not? Are we going to get or not? So women process language. Here. That's the first thing I want to buy into. Buy into the proposition that women process language differently. And the way it works is sort of like, this model is important to understand. So you can draw it, but I want you to go along with me first before you do. Is the computer in the room and such? My basic theory is only in models that women have four levels to their mind. It's only a model. I'm not saying it's true, but it's useful. The 
first level is what I call get it done. This is the get it done level. It's very simple. That's where they keep their checklist, all the things they have to get done. Can you have them check again? It's still very warm in here. I literally just called. Okay. So I just... There's the get it done level. We all have this. We're for checklist. I've got to get the car washed. I've got to get to school. I've got to balance my checkbook. I've got to cheat on my boyfriend. You know, it's all that stuff. And get it done. Make sense? Yes. yes. Second level of mine is what I call the social programming level. This is where she thinks about all the things. Well, what should I wear? What does the newspaper tell me about what I should wear? Should I be slutty or not be slutty? Would my friends approve of, of me fucking my first cousin or not? Mm -hmm. um, what does Madonna say? What does Oprah say? <laughs> Who are some chat shows in Britain? I don't know. Who? Who? Jeremy. What did Jeremy, what would Jeremy Chai say? <laughs> you understand? This is where all the conflicting media messages come in. Things from popular music, magazines, movies, TV programs what their mom told them, what uh, their social group says, right? We don't want them to be in that place when they think about us. Why? Because this is where they keep their checklist. What would my girlfriend approve of? Oh, what does Cosmopolitan Magazine say I should look for in a man? What would my family think? Oh, here's the latest magazine, and this is what a guy should look like. This is where we get caught. Because the dating game is all played in there. All of the things from dating, like asking her out, or all, all that stuff is trapped there. We don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. Because most of us, for most of us, that's a losing game. For most of us, that's like trying to play blackjack against the house. <laughs> We're going to have to count our cards pretty closely and try to cheat. That game. For me, here's my <coughs> definition of gambling. You pay for all my bets. I get to pick what cards I draw, throw out ones I don't like, and I get to see your cards before I bet. That's, that game I'll sit down and play. But we can't win there. Now, there are certain styles of pickup, I won't mention them. They rely on playing the game there. They rely on tweaking yourself to look like the kind of guy that women in that particular social group would approve of. So when those methods do work, I won't mention them, but there's a famous candy. You ever see those candies? They're chocolate coated with candy and they come in a bag and they're two letters. <laughs> M and, okay, give you a hint what method that is. When that method does work, that method is designed to tweak yourself so you act and look and live the lifestyle that guy, women in that social circle who live in clubs would actually like to be around. It's the ultimate supplication because you're changing yourself and being the kind of person, the kind of life that women would be attracted to. That's the ultimate in supplication. We don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. It's a little easy. <coughs> then the third one is what I call the illusion of choice. Now this starts to be a pretty interesting place to play. We can play here a little bit. This is what women. You ever hear a woman say, you're just not my type? You ever hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, when, I, when they hear that, when they tell me that, when they say, you're not my type, I don't do that, or I have a boyfriend. <laughs> this third level of mine, the illusion of choice. This is where she says, it's her typical responses. It's, it's the autopilot program. If you ever heard things like, you're not my type, or this is going too fast. Yeah. Or, I don't do that kinky shit. <laughs> right? Whenever I hear those phrases, mentally I get the sound of a zipper open. <laughs> Some girl said to me, she said to me, this is a couple of months back, she said, I just want you to know that I'm just not attracted to you. And I said to her, you know, if I had a nickel, what's a equivalent of British pound nickel? I need to pay for If I had uh, a ball, <laughs> if I had a ball for every time I heard that from a girl, just prior to her dropping her knickers, I'd be rich. I went, wait a minute, I am rich. <laughs> I 
and I walked away. I walked away. I walked away. She said, wait a minute. And I changed the subject. I said, anyway, when you were a little girl, was there some candy that was the king of your candy castle? And she said, well, I like so-and-so. I said, isn't it interesting how when we're kids, the beginning of the same sounds and the same responses we'll have to adult pleasures start right as kids when we pop a piece of candy in your mouth and you really, really want to taste. Remember that? When you've been cooking, you so much excitement from jumping up and down. Whatever happened to that ability to stop? It's so open to pleasure that you just couldn't stop bouncing around. Because there's something you wanted. So anyway, um, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll go into something to pull it away. Go into something to pull it away. And every time she reaches for more, she's investing in it for more and more and more. I was having a discussion today. The metaphor I use is, you know, you got to get women, I'll show you how to do this, to invest in this. It's not you doing all the talking. She's got to invest to reach for it. Because every time she reaches for it, she confirms for herself that she wants it, and you're the one with the value. You're the one who she has to chase out. Wouldn't that be really good, guys? Yeah. 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 How many would like that? Yeah. Not yeah. just yes. that they're into you, but they're chasing out. Would you like that? Yeah. You've got to condition that early on by how you present things, and then you change the subject. And if she reaches for more, then you go back and give her more. It's sort of like in a breakfast of ham and eggs, in a breakfast of ham and eggs, the chicken is interested, the pig is committed. <laughs> so the difference between her being interested and her committing to the transaction. So you want to make sure that she's reaching for more. I'll show you how to do that. You don't want to do all the talking. So the illusion of choices, which is coming out with stuff like I have a boyfriend or or you're not my type. Now when she says you're not my type, assuming that's true, what is she really saying? She's saying at first glance she didn't have a feeling inside of being aroused looking at you. Yes? yes? How does she know when someone is her type? How does she know? What has to take place? Now look here. Look here. This is important. Part of being a speed seducer is we're peering deep into the code of how women experience their life emotionally. So whereas uh, someone who's doing another method would skip right over that, we say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. She's about to tell us something interesting. She's offering information about how she deeply processes her world. So I want to ask you guys, when a woman says you're not my type, first of all, assuming that's true, how does she know? She's not going on. How does she know? She what does she have to do? She compares with the past. Say what? She compares with the experiences she had in the past. She compares you with the experiences she has in the past, so she has to look into her past and go, he doesn't look like Bob, Joe, my brother, my stepfather, etc., etc., <laughs> the guy in the trailer in the store. <laughs> There's also something else she's doing. She's checking in her body. Her body doesn't give her a feeling of arousal when she looks at you. She doesn't, damn, I like how he moves her. There's just something about his energy. Whatever. She's not feeling arousal when she looks at you. Yes? Yes. yes? Everything a woman, every decision a woman actually makes is done through a flow of feelings in her body. She'll check, and she's not, she may not. Some women are consciously aware of it, but most aren't. There's a split second, one one hundredth of a second check to the body feeling. The only thing I can give for guys is, you ever spell a, spell a word right? Spell a word in your head. Spell the word duck. Got it? Yeah. Now deliberately spell it wrong, by just however you would spell it wrong. Now, is there a feeling in here that's a little bit different when you spell it wrong as opposed to when you spell it right? That little check. Women run like a check like this at a tenth of a second speed. That's how they make these decisions. You heard the phrase, a woman decides in the first minute whether she's going to fuck you or not. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not really true. It's a half truth. Women can tell in the first minute whether they feel an attraction to you. Mm -hmm. By the way, just because she's attracted doesn't mean just because she's attracted doesn't mean she's aroused. Just because she's attracted doesn't mean she feels desired. Just because she feels desired doesn't mean she's aroused. Just because she's aroused doesn't mean it's on right now. Those states can flash back and forth and any one of them can drop at any minute. For us guys, attraction, arousal, desire, and it's on are all clumped together by a big tumbleweed. Right? <laughs> right. Yep. They don't work that way. 
they can have discrete states that have some overlap. Look here, I'm the important thing. Look here, I'm the important thing. You follow that? Yes. Just because, so you have to be able to look for that. So when she says you're not my type or you are my type, there's some check going on in here. Now we as speed seducers, remember I said the most important thing is we're peering deep, deep, deep into the code of how women deeply feel their way and emote their way and walk their way through this world. So we have to listen. For other men shut down and don't listen, we have to listen with precision and look with precision and, and laser-like clarity into that and ask, what's the process? When you hear a woman speak, you have to say, for that to be true, what is the process that she has to undergo inside subjectively? So write that down. It's a key thing. In order for a woman to have the experience that she's describing to you, what has to be going on for her on the inside? What is she doing with the flow of feelings in her body? What is she doing with how she's imagining and visualizing? What is she doing with herself energetically? You understand? I want you to look here just for a minute before you write that. I want you to stop thinking of women as these mysterious, unfathomable creatures from another planet. I want you to really put aside all the old programming, put aside the lust temporarily. <laughs> There's a time for lust. And instead, really tune in with profound curiosity to what it means. When a woman says, you're not my type, what has to be going on inside of her to produce that expression outwardly? The outward expression, you know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Mm -hmm. Do you know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Yes. They were lost in the woods, so they left a trail of breadcrumbs, and they followed the trail backwards to find their way out. I want you to look at the words that come out of a woman's mouth as a trail leading back to the internal emotional processes that drive those words. So really, speed seduction fundamentally is about being able to peer deeply past the surface code that society ignores. You're going to pay attention to what most men ignore, and you're going to ignore what most men consider to be important. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're going to ignore all that stuff about dressing like a GQ model and spending lots of money and bullying women and bullshitting women. And instead, you're going to pay attention to things that most people don't even think are important. But to do it, peer into it. So when a woman says you're not my type, the thing, to, the thing to ask yourself is what must be going on internally in the flow of feelings in her body, in her emotions, in her energy, and what part of her mind she's thinking from? Write that down. This is the key. In order for her to be experiencing what she's coming out of her mouth, what is she doing inside? What's going on in the flow of feeling in her body? Initial approach. I'll give you another way to look at this. One of the things that AFCs, average frustrated chunks, and daters and those kind of people, is they ask themselves the wrong question. One of the kind of questions that the typical AFC asks himself when it comes to dating. Part of speed seduction is asking yourself the right questions. Somebody. What should, what, should I wear? what should I wear? Where do I take her? Where do we go? What else? Do I have enough money? Am I good enough for her? Uh, will I get lucky? <laughs> she got a sister. Has she <laughs> what? <laughs> she what? She's got a good-looking sister. Does she have a good-looking sister? <laughs> now, speed seducers ask a different question. First, they ask, what are the flows of emotion? What are the emotional states where she's more likely to naturally do the behaviors that I would like her? So instead of thinking, how can I get her to fuck me, how can I get her to you know, take me back home, instead we're thinking, well, what are some of the emotional states that would be good for women to experience around this? Do we want a woman, for example, to feel revulsion, anxiety, and disgust? <laughs> now, I'm not saying is that what they normally feel like they do. I'm saying, do, you, do we want them to feel that? Yes or no? No. Here's a key for success with women. Look up here. You can write it and you understand it. Instead of focusing on the behaviors you want, getting her to go out with you, getting her to fuck you, getting her to blow you, getting her whatever, instead of focusing on behaviors, instead focus on the flows of emotion and emotional states where it would be natural for her to just do those behaviors, right? Yes. So what are some of the emotional states? If I could push a button, I'm your magic marker man, 
for the motions. Visualize some hot paint you would like to do, okay? Got it? Mm -hmm. What are the emotional states that you would like her to feel around you? What is it? Some of them. Lust. Lust. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the end. You're starting at the end. But okay, it's better than I'm saying. Lust. Yes. Come on, but. Can I what? Intrigue. Intrigue. Hold on a minute. Actually, it's lust that she's invested in that's better than lust. It's one thing to create lust attraction, but it's another to manage her investment. If you can manage her investment in her desire for you, her interest in you, then you've got something going. We'll discuss that later. Set that aside. Lust, what else? Fascination. Good one. I go very far with fascination. Fascination is one of my mainstays, particularly with very young women. I'm 48 years old. I'll be 49 September 20th. Gifts are accepted. <laughs> I travel many miles on the fascination air, airfare ticket because at my age, 48, I can't, it's unlikely that I can talk to a 22 year old in a way where I'm going to go for like some kind of strong attraction or desire out of shooters and scare her pants off. And I would like her pants off, but not in that way. I, Instead, by demonstrating that I deeply understand her world and by showing I have things that she would like to learn from, I create a lot of fascination very quickly. Now, fascination is not necessary, nor is it sufficient, but it's very useful. Fascination is not necessary, you don't need it, and it's not sufficient. By itself, it probably won't get you anywhere, but it's very useful particularly if you're going to deal with women who are much younger than you. It's very unlikely that I would approach a 20-year-old, 22-year-old girl and say, you know, I just had to tell you, you were so absolutely breathtaking, I had to come up and say hello. Because typically speaking, her social conventional mind will go, what is this old fucker doing being horny for me? <laughs> <laughs> Unless she's from Alabama, which she'll say, Grandpa, what are you doing? <laughs> and she won't be being sarcastic, she'll mean it. <laughs> but fascination is a very good one. And one way to get fascination, we'll teach you this, is demonstrate that you understand her world. So what else? Fascination, lust, what else? What? Career safety. Safety is a good one. Women have to feel safe. What? Curious. 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 Well, that's akin to fascination. What? Intrigue. These are all different shades of the fascination of love. Curiosity, intrigue. Actually, intrigue is even better than fascination. Because intrigue, to me, implies that they're thinking about you when you're going around. When you're fascinated with someone, it's a statement about what you're feeling in their presence. But in, intrigue is even better. Because I think intrigue says something about how they're emoting about you when you're not around. A great deal of the process by which women become really invested in you is what takes place when you're not even there. <clears throat> you know how you run this, you used to run mistakes in your head about women? Women run men through their head who they're really attracted to. And those men may not even have spoken to them for years. So this is a deep process. We're peering deep into the code. So if by how you present yourself she starts running you in that way, that's very useful. You understand? That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I like intrigue. You got me beat. I, 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 I nod to you. Intrigue is actually more useful than fascination. You can move from fascination to intrigue. Very good. Excellent answer for the lunch. Somebody else. What other emotions? Connection. What kind of emotions do women feel around nice guys who are only nice? The only thing a guy can be is nice, and that's all his responses are. What does she feel? What emotions? Wait. No. No. Hold on. Hold on. Stop. That's the first, that's the initial answer. The initial answer without looking deeply is that she'll feel comfort. But it's not true. Here's an understanding. If the only thing you can be is nice, women actually feel distrust. Women actually feel distrust. If the only thing, listen to me. 
If the only thing you know how to do is to be nice and agreeable, that's all you do, women will not trust you because that's not how humans operate. Humans operate, if someone does something that pisses you off, you're going to be pissed off. Being nice all the time doesn't work because it's properly distrusted. Someone said, some woman said to me a couple years back, you are so nice, I said, stop, I am not nice. I'm pleasant. Nice means people roll over you and you never speak your truth, you're dormant. Pleasant is power, held under proper restraint and exercised with absolute precision. And she went, <laughs> <laughs> You're writing that down, aren't you? You may. You can, you can pinch this stuff for me. You're paying for it. So this, uh, Consider it's a lifetime rental. You'll return it when you die. Yeah. So you see, it's really critical in order to build up your power not to be nice as well. Listen to me. Trust is a very potent, powerful component of any kind of attraction process, whether it's a sale or seduction or anything. And to one of the vibes, I promised I wouldn't get into vibes later, but one of the vibes I teach is being vulnerable. But vulnerable doesn't mean needy or weak. If you write vulnerable and then put an equal sign with a cross through it, vulnerable and then cross, equal sign and then cross up equal sign, but needy and weak. Vulnerable does not equal needy and weak. Vulnerable to me is simply about being authentic. You mean to say, Ross, one of the most manipulative things you can do is be honest and authentic? Yeah. It's a really powerful manipulation. <laughs> Hold on. Here's what I mean. Okay. <clears throat> the basic belief behind being vulnerable is this is a killer. You really want to get women in bed like a rock star and not spend any money and have them chasing after you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Look at this thing. Really, you're interested. <laughs> Would you like to esoterically learn about energy simply because it's an interesting subject and that's what you came here for? No. I don't hear you. No. <laughs> but you want to learn to use this because it means your dick is going to be wetter than Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. People think I'm entertaining you. Why did you quit comedy writing? This is a different job. And I was not good at it. Um, being vulnerable is you're not saying it, but fundamentally what you're saying without saying it is speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. Speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. Write that down. Speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. Now there's an entire energetic vibe. There's a flow of energy in your body that feels different than when your truth does all do anything to get into it's not only different cognitively, but the flow of energy in your body literally feels different. They're all writing in the game. That's so cute. Shirlene and I have had discussions about you guys writing this. Look up here. Look, now they're talking to each other about that. Mm -hmm. Speaking my truth is more important than getting into your pants. Look here. Look here. We'll get into this later this weekend. But when you truly walk through the world that way, the energetic vibe that you feel in your body, the flow of feelings in your body is completely different than, I'll say <coughs> anything, because I need vagina more than I need air. <clears throat> now, this gets into pure lust. If you really can come from this position, the speaking your truth, if it really is not just something you're faking, but you really begin to believe it, you may have to fake it first, fake it till you make it. But if that really, it really truly, Here's the paradox, and you're going to have to step into across the little chasm of faith with the entrustment. If this becomes your actual truth, when it really is how you walk through the world, that speaking your truth is more important than getting into your pants, that is a very fearful place to go because you've been trained to believe that if you tell your truth, women will run. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest lie. The biggest lie ever is that lie. And if you can come from the place, truly come from it, where speaking your truth is more important than getting into your pants. First of all, first of all, you don't have to do any work. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> There's no lie to keep track of. There's no faking you have to do. It's fucking easy. That's number one. It's the lazy man's way of doing it. 
<laughs> yes, now you can be a lazy bastard and get all the food you want to. Okay, first and foremost. Second thing, now I didn't say you can't be crafty. Within that, you can be crafty. Nothing wrong with being crafty and clever. But here's the thing. When you come from that position, first of all, it's a deep challenge to women. Wait a minute, you mean there's something more important to you than me? Well, that can't be. I'm going to work to make myself more important than that. Right? Second, it shows you have standards. When you have standards and you're willing to really genuinely say no, wait a minute, then, boy, now you're really good material. You actually have standards, you'll say no. Wow, it must be the case that lots of women want. Not necessarily true, but that's how women will appear, right? So it's a challenge. It shows that you have standards, which means you're a guy of high value. <laughs> Although those guys are teaching you to fake your standards. But the only thing those guys know about the standards is the standard hotel when they go and pick up chips. You wouldn't get it because you're not going to know it. Right? Because you have standards, it's a challenge. And then it sets a frame for her to live up to. Then in order for her to match you, she has to begin to come to a place like that. It's really powerful. Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You like this? Yeah. This stuff? So what other states? Trust, lust, fascination, what else? Intrigue. Hmm? Intrigue? Fun. Well. <laughs> things. Right, turn it off, mate, please. Thank you. What else? Fun. Fun. Being fun. Feeling carefree, that's great. Yeah, what else? Connection. What? Connection. Connection. Very good. Very good. Magnifique. <laughs> Connect? Yes, feeling connected. Would that be a good one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wouldn't it? Yes. Now, here's the problem with dating. When you take a woman out on a date to a fancy dinner, she's really connecting with how good the pasta tastes in her mouth. She shovels it in. Right? Or she's connecting with how hot the waiter is, or how yummy the dessert is. She's not connecting with you. What else? Giving a challenge. Get that man a con. <laughs> yes, 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 women want to be challenged. They want to feel challenged. Boy, you can throw some challenge in there. That's like putting in a little, like, little, it's chick, chick crack is what they say. It's like crack, it's a guy's challenge. Now, you could be a challenge, you could go to the dark side of the force and be a challenge by being an asshole and invalidating women. That's not what I'm talking about. There's no mystery as to why that's <laughs> We're not talking about it. You can be a challenge, first of all, if your attitude really is, hey, speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. That's the ultimate challenge. It's a huge challenge. First, and it creates a lot of trust because women aren't used to hearing it. Like, wait a minute. He just, he just said something that could piss me off. How dare he speak the truth instead of trying to get into my pants? Wait a minute, what's going on here? Like they go, huh? Because they're not used to it. It's what an ex-trainer of mine, I don't take credit for lines in our mind, this is his line. When you come at this way, when you come at women from this way, and talk the way that you talk because you really deeply understand them, it's like a guy walks into a bar with a talking dog. He says, I bet you 10 pounds my dog could talk. The dog starts reciting Shakespeare. What the fuck? It's like a talking dog. <laughs> if you actually really were in a pub and someone brought in a German Shepherd and it started talking, <laughs> you'd freak out. You'd go, oh, did I really just see what I just saw? <laughs> right? That's the response women have when you first come at them from this place or come out or whatever. What? I've had women say to me, I can't believe how intuitive you are. It just blows me away. I say, yeah, and then I move off the intuitive bit because it's, you know, already too. This is another thing I have to warn you about. It is not your job to be an emotional dentist, remember? But also, it's not your job to get off on doing this. <coughs> a lot of guys, when they first start doing this, when guys go from getting no attention or getting shunned to suddenly having beautiful women utterly fascinated with them, the power of that gets them really turned on. And now they're focused more on how turned on they're feeling rather than whether they're being effective. So it's also, see, I tend to learn in extremes. My way of learning is to take something and push it to the 
absolute extreme. That's how I learn what works. I'll push it to the absolute extreme, and now I'll start to calm it down to see how I can drop it down until it's still and keep it effective. That's me. You don't want to learn my way. You don't want to learn. I mean it. You don't want to learn at the extremes. So it's also not your job to do this to turn yourself on. It's okay to have a little bit of that. And it's not your job to pop women's heads. Does anyone remember the movie Scanners from years ago? You remember Scanners? Yeah. Where these, tele these telepaths could make people's heads explode? You're not there to make her head explode. Right? You want it to be just enough to be effective, but not be more. So yeah, these are really good states of mind, and a really good one, look here, it's a meta state. A meta state is sort of like, they're raw states, like fear, anger, desire, lust. But a meta state is sort of a state that reflects on the other states. It's more of an intellectual thing than a, than a mid-brain mammalian response. The other state that you really want is investment, that she's invested in all of this. Investment. No, I don't mean a portfolio. By the way, Patricia Shalane, you're, you're, you're welcome to go. You're, I mean, you're welcome to stay. Don't, don't feel you have to be here. You can contribute what you need. Right. Patricia, did you have fun hanging out with her? Yeah, Yeah, of course. So I lived up. Uh, that's why I left you guys. <coughs> I actually hauled my ass from all the way from California to Canada to go to her wedding. I put on a fucking black tie tuxedo. Wow. How the hell did you do that? <laughs> and he flew from England. How did you manage to manipulate me like that? Yes, sir. Yeah, just is it necessary that we write every little thing down as we go? No. If you understand, you don't need to take deep notes. Yeah. Deep understanding trumps lengthy notes. Well, that was a good little Portuguese. Deep <laughs> understanding trumps lengthy notes for writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Jane. The energy of vulnerability is one question I was asking myself. How genuine can I be with this person? His question is, how genuine can I be with this person? That's a good one. You get laid a lot, don't you? Yeah. You specialize in de-virginizing lesbians, right? No. It's one of his specialities. He does it. This is his best clothing, too. This is his Turn the camera off. Camera off. I create a lot of laughter in these events because it's a subject that's surrounded by a lot of pain. If I can get you in a state that you're laughing, if you're laughing, you're learning, and you're opening to new information. When you laugh, you open to a new direction. Uh, <laughs> I know there's a very big new direction. You say, the sky's the limit. Because you're looking for a, a different, you've struggled to be happy. You're looking for a happiness. You're asking yourself the question, but, Really, there's the things, you know, I had a friend, there are things that enhance them, there are things that wreck them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you're not amused by this, are you? Yeah, you. Exactly, you. You're not enjoying this, are you? Huh? You're not? Enjoying the lot. You think I'm full of bullshit, don't you? You're like, you've been to other people's seminars, haven't you? What? You're the first one. Oh, that's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm popping your seminar chair. <laughs> we'll hang the bloody sheet out. <laughs> well, they used to do this in Middle Eastern cultures. They had to hang out the sheet on the wedding night to prove that she really was a virgin. So it was a great black market of like little animals you could kill on the slide. <laughs> I imagine so. Yes, these are great states. How are we going to create those states? Can I walk up to the party and go, Debbie, in a moment, I'm going to use some speed seduction and plum duggery on you. <laughs> or can I say, Debbie, I command you to experience fascination with me, and then in short order, you'll experience desire. Invest in that desire and have absolute lust <laughs> to the point where you'll feel like you're suffocating and there's air in my balls. <laughs> 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 That's unlikely to work. However, if I walked up to Debbie and I said, Debbie, I have a bag full of notes here. <laughs> that might work for the evening, but it gets very expensive. 
how are we going to be able to get women to experience these states? Well, the dating game says it happens randomly. That the chemistry through men and women works on random molecular movement. There's no way to order those molecules. There's no structure. There's no table, periodic table of the emotional elements. Ooh, I just coined that one. Mm -hmm. The dating game says there is no periodic table of emotional elements. I'm saying, oh, yes, there is. And you can arrange those atoms. Oh, yes, there is. Good night. Right, now that she's gone, you just have to lie your way into it. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Well, <laughs> good night. Y'all come back now. Are they gone? <laughs> now, we'll get the vibe tomorrow. But setting aside vibe, let's start talking about how we use our language to begin to create these feelings. I say there's a couple of ways to create these feelings. Number one, there are certain themes. And here's where I do want you to take notes. But look up here first, and then we'll go on. There are certain themes. A theme is a topic of discussion. There are certain topics of discussion that are more likely to lead to those feelings coming up than not. Here's a good rule. Look up here, look at me, get the understanding, and then you can write down to your heart's content. I'll even give you all the time you need. Here's a rule. If you can put the discussion, if you can put what you're talking about on a chart, a graph, a prospectus, a business report, if it's something that's you can put it on a chart, a graph, a business report, a prospectus, a curriculum, the tie, is that what you call it? Okay. CV. CV. It won't get you late. Anything that go on a chart, graph, resume, CV, prospectus, business report, they named a deodorant after it in America. It's called Soft and Dry. Or Bill Gates' company, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Those topics are not useful. Stay away from them. You can write that down. This is the rule for not getting it. Any topic that can fit, any topic where you talk about something that can be put on a chart, a graph, a business report, Mm -hmm. A chart, a graph, a business report, a prospectus. This prospectus is when you want to sell a piece of property or a stock or make an additional public offering of stock. Chart, graph, prospectus, CD, curriculum vitae, a resume. Stay away from it because it's not going to ignite your imagination and emotions. The speed seducers. We ask the question, how is this communication designed to capture and lead our imagination and emotions? This we should write down. This we must write down. This I insist you write down. How is this communication designed to capture and lead our imagination and emotions? This is crucial. This is the real question to ask. Not where do I take her on the date? When do I make my move? Any of those behavioral-related questions are off to one side. They're, they're trivial. Use a mathematical term. How is this communication designed to capture and lead our imagination and emotions? This is a crucial question that enables us to peer deeply into the code, the machine language, the alignment of the molecular molecules and atoms that create chemistry. Capture and lead Imagination and emotions. This kind of thinking is designed to look deep into the machine language to arrange the molecules and atoms that make up the chemistry between men and women. When you start learning to think in this way, you begin to have a lot of power and an awful lot of choice. No one here was at my March seminar, were they? Anyone here? I'll put up some of the video. I had this gorgeous 18-year-old girl who I picked up on the street that night. We were walking along on Friday night after I did uh, the Friday day. And uh, one of my students had stopped this beautiful girl, 18 years old. And she said, what are you all doing here? I said, well, I'm teaching a seminar for guys on how to pick up chicks using hypnosis. And she said, really? She said, that's so interesting. I've been reading this book called The Game. And I said, well, I'm Ross Jeffrey. She said, no, you're not. 
Yeah. I said, yes, I am. I'll prove it to you. I started running out of it. She said, oh my God, you are Ross <laughs> She winds up coming to the seminar, and uh, I have her on stage. And I have her on the edge of orgasm the whole time. She's completely hanging all over me. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it's really wicked when you do these things. I wound up making out. I couldn't get her into bed, but I wound up heavily making out with this 18 year old girl. I'm there making out my place. Not my place, making out with this beautiful 18 year old I'm thinking to myself, life is good and you're really going to hell. <laughs> Look at me. It was a very, I had her on camera. Look at her. I mean, she was like an eight and a half and nine. But when the eight and a half is 20, is not even half your age, she's a 10. <laughs> and, you know, so you can do, when you have this kind of understanding, you can do the seemingly impossible. The metaphor I give you is, um, you ever see a stage magician? You know, these guys like, do you, have, do you get the Chris Angel here, the mind freak? Yeah. Right? You could be the most intelligent person in the world if you go to see the show. If you don't know how the trick is done, you won't figure it out. But a magician, a colleague, can see exactly what the effect is. When you start seeing women in this way, you begin to see what's invisible to most people. And you can, st you can do stuff that's sick. <laughs> Either it's sick or it's beautiful, depending on how you look at it. So, there are certain topics of conversation which are more likely to bring these feelings up. Here are some of them. These are my six topics. I usually only use four. And most of the time, I only use two. But here they are. There's connections. We'll get to how to bring this up tomorrow. But the topic of connections. That's a powerful topic to begin to trigger these deeper levels of a woman's mind. You know, it's so interesting how people connect with their desire to escape. If you could go somewhere for money and time with no object, where would you go? What do you think you'd like the most to enjoy? Or when you really want to cut loose and just absolutely indulge yourself in escape, what do you love to do? What's your favorite part? Well, I'd like to go scuba diving there. Well, excuse me, Debbie, but I'll tell you what. Take me along with you. I want to understand what your world feels like. So here we are. We're on the boat to go scuba diving. Yes, what time of day is it? Well, she's well the sunset. And I said, how's the water, temperature of the water? I said, OK, so I'm a chicken, right? I'm a chicken, chicken. So you got me by the hand. Do we dive? Do we fall backwards off the boat or do we jump in? So we fall backwards. Tell me, how does the water feel as we go into it? Well, this and this and this. Now, the ones that I'm not telling you, what is that a clue to do? I, there are many great philosophers who influence me. Um, uh, Archimedes, the guy who, who taught Eureka, you know, uh, who taught principle oh, leverage. Archimedes has deeply influenced me. Patanjali, who wrote the Yoga Sutras, mm. deeply influenced me. But what's influenced me a lot in my seduction career is an American philosopher named Snagglepuss. <laughs> you remember Snagglepuss, the cartoon lion? He used to say, exit, stays left. And he'd run away. When you say, if she's not willing to play with you, she goes, well, I'm not going well. You go, you know what? I can feel my, my ankle bracelet by your hand. <laughs> my court appointed therapist. Please. Remember, this is about screening for women who are fun and adventurous. They don't want to go along with me. If she doesn't offer curiosity and compliance, I leave. Curiosity and compliance. To me, curiosity and compliance are deeply mixed together. She, because she's curious and having fun, she complies and goes along. Not only the bullshit compliance test that the other guys are telling you, like, does she hold on to your hand? Fuck like that. I want to grab her mind and not her hand. If I grab her mind, her hand's going to be going along with her mouth and every other part. <laughs> so fuck that. Their compliance says, does she grab your hand? Fuck you. I want to grab her mind. I grab her mind. She'll be grabbing whatever I want, any way I want. They're not thinking at the right level. They're at the surface. We're peering deep into the code. Yes? That little story, just, because I like the way you talk, I heard you were describing the scuba and the falling in. Right. You plant yourself inside 
while you are talking like that, are you talking to that fourth level? I'm talking in a way where she has to involve me in her fantasy. Which would Right. So already I've done this and I'll say, you know what? Now that we've been to Greece on it for a weekend, let's go let's go have a drink. <laughs> it's a trivial thing now, because now in her mind I'm in the fantasy with it. But you know, I'm not just talking, I'm asking her. She's describing. She's she's invested in the interaction by doing the talking. Get it? Yeah. This I, is just one example. I've got I'm just I was just asking. Am I talking? Not I'm not imagining that fourth level of your mind. No. No, no. But that's what's happening. Oh, I, I see the whole idea. What I'm just wondering is, as you were saying, is it in that fourth part where my she's already put you in there thinking of these? Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah, so right. you're already in there just yep. five minutes on the street. Ye well, yep. Yeah. There you go. That's not bad. Yeah, it is cool. Now I don't open up with that. I'll do some things to make her feel comfortable and down. Sure. So, how we connect, how, we, how what are some examples of how we connect? What do we connect with? Some, anybody. Similar test for food or clothes or... We connect with our desires for what we want to buy. What else do we connect? So listen, we can connect with interpersonal, I-N-T-R-A, or interpersonal. So there's interpersonal things that we connect and interpersonal. Interpersonal is how we connect with the stuff outside of us. Nature, the universe, other people. Intrapersonal, I-N-T-R-A, is how we connect with the things that are inside of our skin. Interpersonal, outside our skin. Intrapersonal, inside our skin. Both of those are suitable topics for connection. So what are the, some of the things we connect with interpersonally, outside of us? Yes, Jan? Huh? How we connect with the challenges in our life. What else? Recent positive experiences. Huh? Recent positive experiences. Positive experiences. Be more specific here. What do you mean? Any experience. How about how we connect with nature, right? You know what's interesting? I find you learn so much about people, about how they connect with things outside of themselves that really just make them feel fantastic. Like when you really want to get away and connect with things that just make you feel fabulous, what do you love to do? I gave you some bigger secrets today. You see where you're driving this. You'll learn tomorrow. Come on, you guys are like so fucking boring. You're the worst audience I've had in the last hour. <laughs> Wake up, yes. Does it feel uncomfortable to learn this from the two? <laughs> I'm a hooter bench. Uh, come on, wake up. What else do we connect with? You're connecting, you, in order for you to be here, you have to connect with your desire to learn, right? Yes or no? Yes! yes. Start peering into your own experience and get answers about other people. What else do we connect with? What? People. Connect with other people. Holy fucking God. Yes. I love the fuck to you. Give this man a comment. A used one. You got mine. No, because it's got your sister's juices on it. Connect with our experience. Huh? No, make that your brother's. Huh? Connect with our experiences. Speak up, Dougie. How we can connect with our experiences. Dougie's used his stuff to get laid a hundred times. Beliefs. Connect with your beliefs. How about how we connect with each other? You know what's interesting, Debbie? You know what I'd love to do in a place like this, Debbie? Let's say we're at like a place where there's a party or a big gathering. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to play a game called Who's Had Some? I'd like to look to see who's, who hasn't had any in at least a year. <laughs> right? And then once I get a lock, I'll say, you know the other game, the other thing I like to do is I like to watch for that moment when two people who are going to really feel that, you know that, I let her give me the word. Why do I let her give me the word? Just it reflects deep meaning for her. So, so you know the other thing? First I play a fun game with her, right? Then I go to them, you know what? The other thing I like to do is I like to watch that moment when two people are really going to feel that, you know that? I want her word. Because that gets her invested in the process. The minute she supplies her word, she's bought into the process. Versus me doing all the talking. Mm -hmm. Early model speech reduction prior to like 97 was we do all the talking. Too much work. So, 
well, let's stick with this thing. Okay? So I said, you know the other thing I like to do is I like to watch for the moment when two people are really going to feel that. She says, chemistry, yeah. You know, that, that chemistry, that certain, she'll give another connection. Yeah, that chemistry and that connection. Um, <laughs> when two people who are really starting to feel that, really feel that fidelity, Debbie, you hear the command? When two people who are really starting to feel that, really feel that happening between two people, you know, gesture back and forth. I like to look for that moment when two people are really starting to feel that. Feel that really happening between two people. Hmm. I like to look for the moment when that first happens. You know, it's like people go on talking, but then there's that moment when two eyes across a crowded room. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a place and I saw that. And you could see, you looked at him and you looked at her, and you could see they were both starting to feel that. And, and just because you feel that doesn't mean you also feel it's on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason you could see, it wasn't just that you were feeling this, it was also that they were feeling it's on. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that makes, when you surround yourself in a bubble of that with someone, it's, well, anyway, what happened was he would walk to her. He started to walk towards her, and then at the last minute, you could see she was getting more hopeful. You know what it's like when you're really attracted to someone, and they're getting closer and closer, <laughs> and you're, the voice is just yes, and then he walked away. And oh my God, oh my God, you could see she was just... You know what it's like when you want something to work and you're hoping it work and it doesn't. And why am I taking her there, guys? What am I doing? Expression. I'm giving her a great thing enough. Yeah. And I then I'll say, you know, what is it? What has to happen inside a person where they say, fuck it, I'm reaching for this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and if she doesn't have a good answer, what does that tell me? Exit, stage left. But if she gives me a good answer verbally or non-verbally, I know I'm going home with her that night. You got it? Yeah. Or she may say, well, you know, I never go on that. I need to know someone for a while. I'll say, really? It's interesting, because for me, it's not knowing someone for a period of time. Because you can go for six months, and you think you know the person, but then they disappoint you. I'm matching her experience, right? But then again, I've met people, and within a few minutes, I knew who they really were, and you knew who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like everything would have gotten in the way just drops away. Like sand running through your fingers, it's gone, and then all that's left is what you want. Anyway, we can a little girl. <laughs> or is there a favorite kind of candy that was the king of your candy castle? I changed the subject. Once I see that it's gone in, change the subject. Why do I change the subject? Fractionating. Fractionating her again. Now it's in there. She's going to be chewing on it. Wait, 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 wait. Mentally, she's wait, wait. If I keep presenting it, then she's going to back away. But by fractionating, mm. by the way, if you're ever worried about how to fractionate, you say, anyway. You just say, anyway. When you were a little girl, was there some candy that was the king of your candy castle? You can write that way. Anyway, when you were a little girl, was there some candy that was the king of your candy castle? Jack and home, you're getting this conclusion. Jack is like, are you sorry you're married now? He <laughs> <laughs> got married, he knew the girl a week, he got married. I gave him something, he's a hypnotist. I gave him something devastating to you as a hypnotist. And I'm like, oh, he's like, why didn't you do this before? <laughs> you could have asked. <laughs> when, if, you, if you're ever stuck about how to fractionate, just fall back on it. Anyway, when you were a little girl, was there some kind of candy that was the king of your candy castle? And then you can go into my snack quiz, which I'll teach you later. But look at that little piece of language. So I started out, look here, look here, look here, look up here. I started out by playing a fun game. It's so a fun game I like to play in a place like this. Who's getting some? Like, who do you think has gone at least a year without getting any? And they always pick some schlubby looking guy. And I go, I don't know. For all we know, he's hung about King Kong. I saw For all you know, man, he's got a girlfriend that makes you look like a cat that's been beaten in a back alley. <laughs> and if 
example. So we play a fun game, you know, and we pick out who's, and I say, okay, who's had someone but that person's been frightfully ugly? We play this game where it's me and them looking at the rest of the world. So I'm getting them feeling fun and relaxed and excited. Then I go into, you know, the other thing I like to do is watch for that moment. And now I'm starting to, what's the thing? Connections, right? How people connect with each other. You understand? So that theme of connections, how people connect with each other. How about how, that's interpersonal. How about intrapersonal? How about how people connect with their indulgence, their desires, their fetishes, their fantasies, their need to escape? Would that be a good topic? Yes. yes. Wouldn't that? Yes. Do we need to take a pee break? Yeah. 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 Take a quick five minute break to urinate only. For those of you at home, the password is blart. <laughs> blart. <laughs> We're talking about themes, right? One of the themes is connections. I gave you an example. Many of you would like that little piece of pattern I did word for word because you've been good on the it to you. But first, here's the structure. The first part of that pattern is just to map it out. I didn't start with that pattern. I started by playing a fun game. Play fun games. I have found through the years that you start out with something fun and playful where they're playing, it's you and them versus the rest of the room. It creates a nice, fun, relaxed atmosphere. Right? I'm going straight in with the pattern. You get it? Yeah. So I play this fun game. You know what I like to do in a place like this? I like to play the who's had some game. So let's look around and say, who hasn't had any in at least a year? <laughs> okay, who's had someone, but was, they were kind of the ugly one and saw their arm off the next morning? We play a little game right? You're enjoying this, aren't you? You're looking back and laughing your arse off. What language were you speaking? Uh, the one just before? Yeah. That was Polish. I'm a quarter Polish myself. Very nice. Congratulations to this quarter. <laughs> I haven't done the impotence incontinence pattern. <laughs> So I played a fun game, right? And then I went into connections. And how did I go into connections? I related it to the context of where they were. You know what I like to do? You know what else I like to do in a place like this? Right? Now stop a minute. Back up here on screen. What if I had said to her, you know what, you know what game? What if when I said, you know what I like to do in a place like this? I like to play the who's had some game. Who's getting some game? Who's getting some? What if she'd said no response at all? Oh, what would I have done? Stage left. They can snag with us. Exit, stage left. Here's an assignment. You all have to Google snag with us. Go to Google, click on images, and then click on, no, Wikipedia. Go to Wikipedia and do a Wikipedia search on snag with us. S N A. G G L E P U S S. Snagglepuss is going to be your new seduction guide. <laughs> Exit, stage left. Those of you who are at my magic seminar, you can use Snagglepuss as one of your guide forms. So from the very beginning, I'm screaming. You understand? You never have to worry about whether it's going to work or not because you're just screaming anyway. And then I say, you know what else is interesting? You know what else I like to do in a place like this? I like to look for that moment when two people who are really going to feel that. And I want to see if she's going to jump in and invest. So I'm screening for playfulness and a willingness for her to invest. If she won't invest at something so innocuous and so innocent and so non-threatening, the other schools, the candy bar schools, 
we teach you show her some disinterest or turn away from her. So why bother? I don't want to do emotional dentistry, remember? Mm -hmm. The other thing I like to do at a place like this is to watch for that moment with two people who are going to really going to feel that. I want her to supply the word, not me. Because then she's priming her own pump. Oh, yeah. If she says the word, you can remember it and you get back to her. Yeah. Because that's the word that she is saying. Right. With or whatever. When she uses those words, those words are like little breadcrumbs back into these deeper levels of her mind. That word, connection or chemistry, that's reflecting whatever word she uses, that's a reflection of what's going on in one of those deep levels of her mind. That word is a code that opens up <laughs> one of these levels of her mind. Because she's drawing on those experiences and those feelings to give me that word. So guess what? She's just giving me part of the combination to the safe. You want to get her, through the questions you ask and the way you bring things up, you want to get her to start giving you some of the combinations to the safe. When you feed those words back to her, then the safe opens some more and she gives you those. And you feed those back until the safe door swings open. Do you get it? Yeah. Right. Yes. So, through the way you bring things up and the questions you ask, she gives you one combination. You then feed that number back to her, and that gives you another one, or two, or three. And pretty soon it reaches critical mass, so you no longer just get one number, you get ten. And the safe door swings open. And at each stage, I'm testing the safe door to see if the numbers have already turned, because I don't always necessarily know. It's gotten to the point where I can hear the tumblers clicking. Sometimes they're digital, there's no sound. <clears throat> so I have to watch and get it. But every stage I'm testing the door, because if it'll open after two numbers, I don't want to keep going. I tell this story where um, someone said, a girl said to one of my students who was sergeant, and she looks and she's going, if, you, if I had one more bearing me, I would take you home and give you a fucking new member for the next decade. And he said, you know, Ross, I started to do the Discovery Channel pattern and she walked away. I said, I have the pattern you should have used. It's bartender. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that supplicating? Isn't that begging and buying? Hey, she's ready and she really needs it. She looks you can really and says, one more beer and I'll fuck your brains out. She needs it. Buy her the beer. <laughs> All for fun, your money. <laughs> Absolute satisfaction, money back guarantee. I mean it. If I'm not 100% satisfied with your money, I'll send it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jewish money back guarantee. <laughs> you know what the Jewish child molester said to the little girl on the playground? You want to buy some candy, little girl? <laughs> By the way, Happy New Year to all my Jewish friends. It's Rosh Hashanah, it was yesterday. <clears throat> so I want her to supply, I'm screening, and I want her to start investing in the transaction by supplying the answers, right? I'll say, yeah, it's that moment when two people are really in it. And then I begin to describe the process of what I observe. And through describing the process, I involve her. I say, yeah, I was watching them, and I could see they started to feel that chemistry growing, Debbie. So I start to embed commands. How do I embed commands? I talk about the other people's experience in a way where I'm giving commands to her. Commands are things like feel this, feel that, experience this, do that. But I don't say directly to Debbie. Debbie, as I describe what other people experience, you're going to feel it. I use this form. I use the, the form two. I say they started to, or you can see they were starting to. So if I want to give Debbie the command, feel that, or feel that chemistry, I want to give her whatever word she used. Let's say she said chemistry, that's her word. I didn't supply it, right? When she supplies her word, 
she doesn't resist it when I use it back because she thinks it's her talking. That word that she supplies me is like one of the digits of the safe. So when I dial it in, it doesn't feel like someone's trying to crack the safe. It feels like someone knows the code is in their head. Right? This is why these other methods that say you should do 90% of the talking are bullshit. If you're going to do 90% of the talking, you should be using her words. I saw a question. Yes. Um. And? Yes. When you're, when we, we are talking with a woman and we're saying, you know that, and she goes, oh yeah, that feeling. <coughs> then five minutes later you go, you know, you feel that feeling. So you're, you've got the word, step out, and then coming back in. Right, exactly right. That's you've got it. it. Okay. You've got it. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> so I say to her, yeah. I could see they were starting to, or they were beginning to, feel that chemistry. I'm getting your command to feel that chemistry, right? So one way to construct patterns is to list the commands. Feel that chemistry. Feel that attraction. Realize it's on. Feel, realize, believe. These are the internal processes we want her to go through. Yes, question. Uh, what if the reason why she isn't supplying the word is that she's way too deep in the traps? Is that <clears throat> he said, what if the reason she's not supplying any words is she's way too deep in the trance? If she's that deep in the trance, at that point, calibrate it and, and bring her out. Bring her out. Because someone asked me about, in the game, in Neil Strauss's book, The Game, there's a thing where I have the way just completely in trance for me. They said, that was absolutely awesome. Well, I said it was a part of her trip, meaning she wasn't invested in it. So why I was there creating was real for her. The minute I walked away, or the next hour, I never fucked that waitress because she wasn't invested in it. She wasn't really participating in it. I was doing it to her. Now that makes a flashy demonstration for an author who's writing a book, but it's not a practical seduction. Practical, I would have been to bring her out and put her back in. And each time I bring her out, I'm along with that coming out and using some information she's given me and then feeding it back. That would have been fun. But I didn't have time in the context of someone saying, show me I'm right about it. So when I who mentioned it to me, I said it was a part of the trick, ignore it. I meant it. Not to say that elements of that wouldn't wouldn't actually result in you getting laid if you combine it with other elements. This element of having her participate, right? So I also want to, I use my conversations as, as delivery vehicles for suggestions and commands. Suggestions like feel that, feel that now, feel that ability. Those are commands. Or suggestions are like, that's what's happening right now. So it was amazing that as I watched, I could see that that's what's happening between two people. Look at me, you missed it. That's what's happening between two people. Now, do I mean it's happening between those two people or me and her? So I'm using suggestions and ambiguity. Commands use verbs. Commands are things like take the form of feel that, do that, believe that. Suggestions are more a statement about what's occurring. That's what's happening. And her unconscious says, oh, does he mean that's what's happening with them or that's what's happening with us? And it applies all meanings. So unconsciously, because it's vague, she applies it to you and her. So I say, you can see they were starting to feel that chemistry. Really feel that growing, Debbie. And you can see that that's what's happening. That this is on. It's going to happen. <laughs> are those suggestions or are those commands? This is on. It's happening. That's a suggestion. It's on. So I'm not telling her to do anything. I'm giving a description of what's going on. You understand? So, in addition to getting her invested and using her words, I'm giving commands. Feel that. You could see they were starting to feel that. Really feel it growing. 
And just by looking, you can tell it's on tonight. It's happening. You know, I'm pointing back and forth between me and her. So the unconscious mind goes, oh, it's happening between me and this guy. You say, you're going to get caught. They're going to see you doing it. I don't get it. Who here has used this and it's worked like a charm? Deck? Tony, do you use it? Do you, have you ever been caught? I've never been called that. No. I've done this with clinical psychologists, master NLP trainers. <laughs> so trust Uncle Ross. <laughs> I see that. They don't get it. Go out there and challenge yourself to get caught. Try to get caught. You won't get caught because they don't know what this stuff is. It right. goes, and not only that, they don't even remember what you said because it's all process language. If you tried the dating way, if you said, you know, well, you know, a week later, after she hung up on you for the tenth time, she said, you know, he told me that he was a doctor, that he made 50,000 pounds a year, that he drove a jag, you know. Doc, she'll remember all that because it's about facts, something you can put on a chart. This is process language. The process language goes deep to the unconscious and they don't remember what they said. You know, as you sit there looking at me and you begin to get really excited about all the things you imagine speed seduction really working for you, I'm not sure which ones really, really <laughs> create that growing sense of enthusiasm and curiosity. But as they continue to run through your mind as we're speaking together, I just want to let you know that the more you focus in on that, the more what it is I say allows you to realize that listening to me is something that's really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did I just say? Did I say anything to this? Can you put any of that on a chart, in a curriculum vitae, on a graph, in a prospectus, in a stock report? Could you? No. no. Do you remember what I said? No. <laughs> But were you imagining things? And did you get excited about how speech seduction could help you while I talk? Yes. I bet you all pictured different things, didn't you? Yes. I convinced all of you because I didn't say anything. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to this mind. It makes sense to the back of the mind. You have a story, Jack. You have a story? Uh, yeah, just the very, very first time I ever used this was with a lady who, uh, in my opinion at the time, was way out of the league. She was a lingerie model. <coughs> I uh, worked part-time in the comic shop, fantastic. Um, <laughs> and a really good friend, so I just told her, you won't believe this stuff, this guy called Ross Jeffries, and I told her how it worked, and I told her how I would do it, and it still worked. <laughs> I, early in my seduction career, I would get women into bed, and I'd tell them what i do. They'd say, I'm not, I, don't, I don't dig you because you use hypnosis, I dig you because you're a great guy, and you make me feel that X, Y, and Z, the very words I had fed on them. I go, no, this is exactly what I did. I said this and this and this. And they go, come on, you're I love you because you're the most amazing guy. Because I feel that chemistry and that destiny. And I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it feels so good to them. They want to convince themselves that it was natural, good, fun. They want to believe it. So, I bring it up in a way where I get her involvement. I'm going to get her involvement. I'm going to feed her words back to her. I'm going to embed suggestions and commands by talking about other people's experience. I don't say, Debbie, you will start to feel attracted to me. And as you feel attracted, you will realize that it's on tonight between the two of us. <laughs> I don't say it directly, but that's what I'm actually saying through this kind of communication. By talking about an experience I observed, I use that as a vehicle to get her to participate, to get her to invest in it, and to throw all sorts of suggestions and embedded commands at her about how I could see they were starting to feel that chemistry really feeling built to the point where you could see it's on tonight. This is happening. And you know, the thing is, what I saw is it wasn't just that they were starting to really feel that attraction, but you know, just because you feel an attraction for someone doesn't mean this is on. Yeah. But whatever that feeling is, you know the feeling when it's, you're going to make this happen? It's like that feeling of desire and that feeling of it's on. 
come together. <laughs> really come together. That's it. <laughs> right? Now what did I do? I put a feeling in one hand, right? I said, it's like, what, what I did here is I drew a contrast. When I said to her, see, here's, it, 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 this comes from truth. Just because a woman does feel attracted doesn't mean it will happen. Somewhere there also has to be that overlapping feeling of it's on. Remember I talked about how women fractionate among emotions and they overlap emotions? Yeah. For a woman to fuck you, it's not enough for her to feel arousal, desire, interest. She also has somewhere that she has to feel it's on too. Those feelings have to, have to mesh together, have to entangle or dance around with each other. <laughs> when, I, when I deliver something really heavy like that, <coughs> when I deliver something really heavy like that, when I say something like, yeah, is that amazing? Like, you feel like there's been something missing, something that you've always wanted, and you've got it, but what would it be like if suddenly it's like you were looking right at them? <laughs> anyway, when you were, I take it away. Why do I take it away like that? Fractionating. I'm fractionating her, and it's really heavy. When I fractionate her, what does that do? That means that those thoughts are going to be running in the back right now because I took it away consciously. It's like giving a, um, a suggestion. It's like, in a sense, it's like giving a post-hypnotic suggestion and then distracting the person so they don't remember it, immediately distracting them when they come out. You want to distract them. So you always want to have those little throwaway fractionations. So when you present something really tasty and really good, you take it away. Now, here's where amateur speed seducers fuck it up. They get this really, look up here, guys. They get this really great response, okay? So she's, you say to her, yeah, isn't that amazing? Like, there's something you've always wanted. Notice the gestures? It's not like you're calling in a <laughs> You're not waving in the Royal Navy. It's really subtle. It's like, okay, it's like there's something you've always wanted. Keep your hands close to your body. And you've doubted it, you thought maybe this is the one. And what would it be like if all of a sudden, it's like it's right in front of you, you're looking right at it. It feels so great. Anyway, so these two, I just move right off it. Why do I move off it? Because let's say I kept embellishing it. It's like you're looking right at it, and you realize that you've got to do something to get this. Because if you don't, you lose out forever. It's like my friend was saying, when you feel that, and you it's just too much. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. They start resisting. But if you present this juicy, it's like, let's say there's a, I'm going to use a bad metaphor. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's a hungry junkyard dog chained up by a rusty chain. And like, you take a big steak, you put it right under the dog's nose. The dog is drooling and salivating, and then you oh, pull it away. This is a little mean, but you see, the thing is, is it's fractionating. If you just throw it to her like that, she may resist it, but by pulling away a little bit and changing the subject, her natural response is going to be, wait a minute, what about the stuff you were talking about before? So she keeps reaching for it. Do you understand? Now, I know what's going to happen. The first few times you guys try this, and it actually works, the first two time, few times you try this, the first 20 times you try this stuff, I like that, that 10 who's 20 years younger than you is slobbering all over you. Your temptation is going to want to keep going and blow her head up. That won't work. You're going to have to back off that. Ross? Yeah. It's just really hit me right now. This fractionation thing is a little bit like in the military, where if you keep shooting at somebody, you slip behind a brick wall, they can't pop their head off. So you have to stop shooting at them until they pop their head off. That's a very <laughs> bad metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very violent bad metaphor. I don't like that metaphor. But it's accurate. <laughs> it's accurate, but I don't like that. Anymore. We're not shooting any. Remember, in this whole process, in this whole process, we're offering the kind of feelings that women want to feel. They want to feel this stuff. You understand? This is what they want to feel. You're thinking about the implications of this. I saw you go. I saw him go. Oh, and <laughs> that's why I fucked it up all these years. Is that what you were thinking? I, you were thinking that, right? Something along the lines of, damn, that's why I've, I've always fucked it up. But my writer is that exactly what you were thinking. Stand up so the cameras don't see you, but say, that's exactly right. Was that exactly right? I read his thought. How did I know exactly what he was thinking? Sit down. How do I know? Because 
I just know. <laughs> That's exactly legal. But the light just turned on for you, didn't it? Now what you can do is go back through all those experiences. Imagine if you had had this knowledge. Imagine if you had had this knowledge and then go back through all your old experiences applying this knowledge. How would you now feel about yourself sitting here today? It would seem a lot different, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what was wrong. All those years when you got your ass kicked in the dating game, all those years when women said, I just don't feel that way about you. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah. Raise your hand. Oh, you're like my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard that one? Yeah. Have you heard this one? Sorry, I just want to be friends. friends. Oh, God, does that hurt or what? <laughs> it's like a stake right to your heart. It's <laughs> painful. <laughs> Imagine how all those things would have been different had you had this knowledge and applied these principles. Hmm? Yep. Yep. It would have been so different. And it will be different. It already is different. You can never go back to the way you were. Sometimes just knowing how to do this is enough. You don't even have to actually have to do any of it because you're so bleeding fucking confident that they're attractive. See, this is how I, I'm not bluffing or kidding you, this is how I can, within a matter of 20 minutes, have an 18, 19, 20 year old girl want to fuck me. It's not because of this. Whereas before, I would have heard, you're old enough to be my dad. Occasionally, I still hear that. I hear, you're old enough to be my dad. My response is, tell me about your sick attraction to your father. <laughs> <laughs> Or I'll say, don't worry, I won't crush your cigarettes, Debbie. <laughs> That's an old joke. Uh, uh, uh. What did the southern, 14 year old southern girl say to her lover? Daddy, you're crushing my cigarettes. <laughs> I don't know what the British uh, equivalent would be of someone from the south in America. Like in America, it's the southerners, you know. What's the British equivalent? Irish. The Irish. Oh, <laughs> the 14 year old West girl. <laughs> the 14 year old West girl says, to her lover, Daddy, you're crushing my cigarettes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What about that woman, Ross, on the home study war course when the stripper came to you and she said, Oh, you're a Celeste, I don't even know, and lost alimony. Where's that, honey? You were ignored. You took our dad for a. Don't try to do American accents, it doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> This whole topic, this whole set of jokes, stories, poems, right? They're uh, quizzes. They're all designed, again, to get her responses from that fourth level of her mind, incorporate them back, embed suggestions, use ambiguity. We're going to use the same basic tools, it's just a different delivery vehicle. You know, you've got FedEx, you've got UPS, you've got Royal Mail, you've got Carrier Pigeon, you've got cell phone, but they're all used to deliver the same sort of thing, and they're all used in the same way. They're used through the right five, they're used through fractionation, they're used through paying attention and incorporating her responses, they're used by using ambiguity and embedded commands and embedded suggestions and fractionation. It keeps taking place the whole thing. Now, the next category I talked about is indulgence, escape. Remember, indulgence, escape, fantasy, when and it takes the form of asking a question. The question is, when you really want to cut loose, when you really want to escape, and completely indulge yourself, what kind of things do you like to do? Right? You can start out by asking the right question. Questions are a great way to start a seduction. So when you really want to escape, when you want to indulge yourself and just cut loose, what kind of things do you love to do? Now, in order to answer that question, what part of her mind must she access to answer it? She's got to go into that part of her mind when she thinks about fantasies, <coughs> desires, escape. That, now, look here. You need more time to write that question? When you really want to cut loose, indulge yourself, escape, what kind of things do you love to do? Now, that's not necessarily sexual, but it's right next door to the compartment in her mind where she thinks of sexual things. Hold on. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Imagine a, flat, a, a block of flats. Over here is the flat that contains her wildest sexual 
kinky fantasies, okay? Right next door, separated by the very thinnest wall, is the compartment where she thinks about what she does when she wants to indulge and escape. For all we know, she likes to masturbate watching porn. We don't know. <laughs> it could be that there's no door between, it could be that that wall has got a door that's always open. But at the very least, if you get things jumping in this room, it's going to wake up the person living in the flat next door. You get it? So you don't have, look up here, you don't have to go for this directly. You don't have to directly go for something sexual. If you get the room next door all agitated and awoken, you understand? It's going to stir this. Now, with a lot of women, that partition is mighty thin. When women hit their 30s, boy, howdy, if a truck goes by, they get horny. <laughs> or if a woman's ovulating, that wall gets really thin. You can punch through it like it's tissue paper. Yeah. But there's big overlap. They're like, there's a big door there, and it's open, wide open. So if you can introduce this whole thing, of indulgence, fantasy, escape, adventure, and it just goes, now here's what you don't do. You don't say, Debbie, in a moment I'm going to try to awaken the sexual fantasy part of by talking about something that's pretty closely related. <laughs> so get ready for this question that will open up the deepest parts of your mind, reveal information that I can use to leverage to get you really horny, and I'm leaving with me in the next hour. Ready, set, go. You don't want to do that. Yes. But wouldn't that be a, a real nice uh, pattern breaker or a, what's it called? Fractionary. Fractionary. No, 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 I mean the... Pattern, pattern interrupt. Pattern interrupt. Yes. What would be a pattern interrupt? What you just did. Yeah, well, if you're going to do a pattern interrupt, maybe here's the key. A pattern interrupt has to get attention in a positive way. You want to do something different that gets attention in a positive way. A pattern interrupt could be, could be me walking up and barfing all over her shoes. That's certainly a pattern interrupt, <laughs> but it's not going to lead us where we want to go, is it? So the rule for a pattern interrupt is to pat do something unexpected in a way that leads to her attention flowing to us in a positive direction. You understand? But if you do this as a put on? You're saying go directly up to and say, hi, Debbie. In a moment, I'm going, no, I wouldn't. That's really telegraphing the punch, mate. It's like you're in a boxing match, right? And you say to your opponent, in a moment, I'm going to wind up like this and throw a <laughs> right foot right to your jaw, and I'm going to knock your ass out. And you're counting on him laughing so hard that it's going to work. <laughs> now, don't do it. Where was I? That really distracted me again. Yeah, when you really want to cut loose, indulge, escape, what kind of things do you really like to do? Right? Right. Right. Now, with this horny little 22-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Jewish female college student who still calls me, calls me, calls me, calls me, calls me, calls me. She called me to wish me a happy Jewish New Year, but that's not what she wanted to talk about. Uh -huh. um, I use that one. I sit there and I said, when you really want to escape, indulge yourself, what is it that you really like to do? And she actually answered me different. She said, oh, I'd love to go back to the Mykonos Islands. I said, really? Well, tell me about the Mykonos Islands. She said, well, I went there. I said, wait a minute. Take me with you. <laughs> so we arrive at the Mykonos Islands. What time of day is it? She said, the sunset. I said, really? Describe the sun. I'm looking at the sun with you. What am I feeling as I feel along with you as we look at the sun? <laughs> she said, well, we feel this. She bought right into it. And as I had her progressively describe being there, we went on a vacation to the Mykonos Islands. <laughs> And we experienced all the feelings that she felt together. At one point, we went into this little grotto. We took all our clothes off and we slipped into the water. <laughs> and, and sometimes when I do this, I'm thinking, this is fucking great. <laughs> Life is really great, you know? So, um, I'm sorry, sometimes what I do just touches me right there. <laughs> So, that's a really good question, isn't it? We're going to do seduction questions later in the afternoon. But in the right context, these questions are great. Because to answer it, to make any sense of the question, she has to go inside, right? You get it? Yeah. So that's a really good thing. Another way we can bring up indulgence is to say, hey, Debbie, 
Do you like chocolate? You know where this is going, guys? Yeah. yeah. What's the famous pattern? I can't hear you. Louder, I can't hear you. That's right. For those of you watching this on Channel 4, it's the infamous blowjob pattern. <laughs> hey, Debbie, you really like chocolate. Well, I was watching this interesting show on the Discovery Channel, and they're talking about the difference between indulgence, indulgence, and anticipation. Strike that, compulsion and anticipation. They're talking about the difference between compulsion and anticipation. Compulsion, compulsion is when you just find yourself doing something. Like, you ever just find yourself reaching for the refrigerator, and before you even realize it, the door is open, and you don't, what, what am I doing? You ever find that happening, by the way, guys? Yes. Like, you ever just find yourself, well, who am I doing here? I didn't even know I was doing that. So that's compulsion, but indulgent, but anticipation is when you think about a pleasure before it actually arrives. Like, you ever come home from a really rough, hard day at work, maybe you've been on the tube all day, maybe you've been on the tube all day, <laughs> see that ambiguity? Been on the tube all day? <laughs> tube is American slang. Penis. Do they have is it slang here for that too? No. no. Sorry, you can't use that. <laughs> you could try it. And all you can think about is just stripping off those clothes and getting into the shower. You like baths or showers? Bad. And then there's that moment of sliding in where you just let the warm pleasure take you. Now, when I talk about that moment of sliding in, this is what we call sexual metaphor. This is what's known as an accelerator. In speed seduction, we have certain things called accelerators. Accelerators take that feeling and really ramp it up. And one of the accelerators is sexual metaphor, right? So when I talk about sliding in, what am I talking about? Am I talking about sliding into the water? Am I talking about the Don Johnson sliding into the Lindsay Lohan? <laughs> Not funny, man. That's the funny part of the podcast. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Both. So the unconscious mind goes, oh, it must be both. Then there's that moment of sliding in. Sometimes I have women say, oh my God, it sounds like sex. <laughs> oh, yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> or, or, have you ever been with someone? that moment, that first soft brush of the lips, and it's as if every moment of pleasure that's ever going to be experienced is enfolded in that first electric touch. Or, if you really like chocolate, what's your favorite kind of chocolate? Or whatever. Whatever she gives you, say, you know, I have this friend. She says, you take the chocolate, you don't eat it right away, you save it, you think about it on the ride home, and you take it, you slowly peel it, <laughs> and then you hold just the tip of it to your tongue, and then there's that moment where you just let it melt against your tongue, it's like an explosion of pleasure in your mouth. <laughs> You're thinking you can't possibly do this, but you can. And you say, you know, I used to think that the most important thoughts come from the conscious mind, but now I realize so much bubbles up from the unconscious. I used to think that all my most important thoughts come from above, but now I know. I really know that so many important thoughts come from below me, Debbie. <laughs> you the ambiguity? Now, the media likes to make fun of this, because they think, wait a minute, blow me. Out of context, it won't do. Remember I said that the proper theme gets her talking from the right place in the mind, gets her trance words, but what else does the proper theme do? Speak up, what does it do? It gives the context against which, the background against which, and something that's ambiguous is properly interpreted by the unconscious mind. Does that make sense? Yes. So out of context, if you say, you know, if you just walk up and say, hey Debbie, there are the thoughts that are above me and then some thoughts are below me, Debbie, that's ridiculous. It won't work, and I never claimed it would. 
these kind of ambiguities, those of you watching this at home, and I'm not supposed to talk to the camera, but I believe in where I will, because this is where the media deliberately, to get cheap laughs, misquotes me. These kind of ambiguities like below me and happiness and all that, I never claim they work out of context and isolation any more than a tire works if it's not connected to the rest of the car. But in the context of a discussion that provides the overall background or framework to interpret the ambiguity, they do work. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. All right, let's take a five minute break. She'll come up. Someone had a question. People always ask me questions on the breaks, and I always say, well, ask during seminars so I can give you a good answer that benefits everybody. Who had questions during the break? Or reminding me of something they wanted me to teach? Meditation. What's that? Meditation. Oh, you wanted me to get into the meditation part. Because remember I said, listen to me. This is really crucial. When you go through changes in a very emotionally charged area of life, in an area of life that's been very troubling, very difficult, and James was kind enough to share his story He's talking about how he was basically going to do himself in if he didn't find an answer to all this stuff, correct? Yeah. You're ready to kill yourself. In a very emotionally troubling area of life, how can you give yourself a chance to be clean from all of that and to move up a learning curve without carrying all the old stuff with you? Without having all that noise in your mind chattering so loudly that you can't even apply the new stuff. This, now, I don't care just for the sake of this discussion, whose field material you're applying, whether it's, you know, the M&M candy method or anybody else's, you still have this challenge of how do you move up that learning curve? How do you do that? How do you quiet the noise in your mind? And also, one of the things I said, I want to tell you a story. Look up here. There's no need to take notes. Look up here. I'll tell you a story. A couple of years back, I was doing a seminar. And usually when I teach a seminar, I have dreams the morning of the event. They give me an indication of what to teach. And uh, roll those over there. I had a dream that there was this little portable transistor radio playing. It was annoying me. So I went to switch it off. And I switched it off, but it was still running. And so I opened up the back, and I took the battery out. It was still running. So one of my nerdy students said, well, the reason it's still running is these solenoids are molded together, and it's creating an electric current. So I just cut the solenoids. So I cut the solenoids, and the radio was still playing. And I realized that the radio was playing because that's what radios do. And the point of this metaphor, this story, is that <clears throat> when you go to make changes in your life, stuff is going to come up. I guarantee you that from time to time, or in the beginning maybe even frequently, your stuff will come right back up in your face all the old beliefs, all the old patterns of thinking and feeling. And <clears throat> they're not coming up because you hate yourself. They're not coming up because you're out to sabotage yourself. Or you have low... I can't hear you. Not everyone's answering. Low... Like I said, there's no such fucking thing as self-esteem. It didn't exist before some author wrote about it in the 60s and 70s and got on a chat show. Where was it before someone wrote about it? There's no such thing as self-esteem. It's, it's a bugaboo. It's a lie. But there is, and people don't do things, I think, to deliver yourself. These things come up because they have a momentum. They have momentum. They have energy. So you have to know what to do with them. Now, I've been through a lot of healing work and talked to a lot of people, but actually, Shirlene, back there to her credit, was the first person to say to me that things are going to come up. And there are three, what are the three bad alternatives when, when old patterns come up? What are the three things that don't work? Somebody. What's that? Okay, if you suppress it, what happens if you suppress all those old ways of thinking, all those old emotions? Why is that not a very useful thing to do? It comes back with even more power. Remember I used the metaphor of kinking a garden hose? When you kink a garden hose, what happens? The pressure builds up and it explodes. Now, many of your hoses are already exploding with too much pressure, so we don't want to go there, right? <clears throat> True? So we can suppress, but that doesn't work very well. What else can we do? 
We can buy back into it and, and just keep running the stuff in our heads. Just for the purpose of the camera, Channel 4 guy, you should watch this. It's going to be very instructive. He can only see the back of your head, so don't worry. But how many people here run over scenarios over and over and over of how they failed with women? And they run it over and over in their mind, over and over and over again, and inadvertently just reinforce that same behavior. Raise your hands if you do that. It's pretty near a universal phenomena. Now, here's a very important principle of understanding human behavior in the human brain. Brains tend to do what you rehearse. If you rehearse 100,000 times, thank you, Doug. If you rehearse 100,000 times how you failed with Debbie or Sally, if you rehearse 100,000 times seeing what you did wrong, what are you telling your brain to do? What you rehearse, what you review, is what you rehearse. The brain has no way of telling what you review over and over, what you ruminate on, from what you're rehearsing. The brain can't tell to it. To the brain, it feels like, oh, you're rehearsing what you want me to do. So when you get out into the world and a similar situation pops up, what is your brain naturally going to do? It's going to do the same thing. And now you do the same thing, and that reinforces your belief that what? It reinforces your belief that you can't do it, that you're a loser, that women suck, etc., etc. So what does that do? It gets you started on the whole cycle of ruminating over and over again. True or false? So you have the cycle of rumination where you reinforce the old pattern of behavior and all the limiting beliefs that go with it. You go out in the world and even though you consciously want to change, you have all this stuff rehearsed and you do the wrong thing, which leads to shitty results, which leads to more rumination. Do we get, do we get the cycle? So you get all the rumination, you get ineffective behavior, which leads to shitty results, which leads to more rumination, and you're trapped. So what do most guys do? Well, they, most guys suppress it, or they buy back into it, or they try to push through the pain. Now, what's the challenge of pushing through pain? Anybody? Yes, tell me. You're bringing all the old shit with you as you're going forward. That's right. When you push through pain, you're also pushing the pain out in front of you. When you push through pain, you're pushing the pain out in front of you. Now, look here. Get the understanding. If it's true, if what I'm telling you is true, if it is true, that your vibe is the fundamental thing that attracts or repulses people, and you're walking around with a painful vibe, what is likely to happen? You'll attract pain. You will either attract pain and push away people who are at a different level. True? And here's the other thing. That pain constitutes a tremendous field of noise. It's a tremendous field of noise. So when a woman is trying to communicate to you, that communication has got to push its way through all that pain. So you're very likely to distort what she says. You're very likely to, dis to distort the meaning of what she says. You're likely to misinterpret her behavior. Do you understand? <clears throat> pain tends to distort our perception and drive behavior. Do you understand? If, when it becomes excessive. Yes, Charlene. Of course you can. Boom it out so they can hear you, sweetie. She's talking about the pain distorting how you're perceiving life, too. But on the other side of that coin, that pain is very real. You can't just be uncomfortable. And she'll feel that. Right. And she'll probably not like it. Right. That's what I was, I was getting to that. That also, no matter what technique you use, if you're pushing it through pain, it's going to be colored by that. Do you understand? If you're pushing your words through pain, your words are going to be colored by that. My mother used to say, if you dip your sunglasses in dog shit, even the roses will look brown. <laughs> God bless my mother. We lost my mother's physical form. Her physical form left us April 29th of this year. But my mother is still with me in all the ways I teach and my own sarcastic expressions. My mom is always with me. Uh, so. And the other big problem is, and here's the really big challenge. As I said to you, I believe, and Channel 4 guy, this is really important, so you should get me when you, is it on me? 
well, okay, this is crucial. The biggest challenge facing men when it comes to applying any of this material, any other camp's material, is not fear, it's not approach anxiety, it's not anger, it's not sadness. The biggest single problem is confusion. Confusion. That's the biggest cause of suffering. When you can't figure out whether it's working or not working. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. Is it working or not working? I'll tell you a story. I've told this story many times, but it's so instructive, I have to tell it because it's crucial. One of my students a few years back, this is a guy who couldn't even talk to women. He used my material faithfully. I mean, he was very rigorous about it. <clears throat> And so he goes to this bar. I really don't remember if it was a bar or, or a club, but it doesn't really matter for the sake of this discussion. It was something similar, bar or club, right? You don't really care. There is a super hot girl, like a 10 plus. Now, to me, there are no 10s. There are only 9s. They become 10s when they fall all over me. That's when they become 10s. <laughs> so there are no 10s unless they behave and treat me a certain way. But that's a very important point. You need to learn to screen for how the woman treats you. If she treats you poorly, then I don't care what she looks like. She's a two or a one. When you guys genuinely get this point about screening, when it no longer, at first you have to fake it till you make it. You have to act like a screener. But eventually you really get to the point where you <coughs> genuinely really screen people based on how they treat you. And something else, how they treat other people. Here's a good clue to know who to approach in a public place where there's a lot of women. Watch for the woman who's paying really careful, genuine attention to her friends when they're talking. Look here. Look here. Watch for the woman who's paying genuine, real attention to her friends when they're talking. Because that's someone who's showing that she has some empathy. But let me tell you this story. So he uses my stuff. There's this 10. And she's blowing all the guys off. She's shooting them down. It gets to the point where guys are, are approaching her, and then they're doing the U-turn. <laughs> it's like the emergency pickup bat turn. <laughs> right? So he's like, all that shows me, uh, he's thinking, all that shows me is these guys haven't touched her in the way she needs to be touched. I can't let that girl's evening, by, evening be ruined by not giving her the chance to meet someone who's truly different. So he went up and he approached her. I forget what he said. I, something along the lines, he said something like, you know, isn't it interesting you go through a whole evening of the same old tired, boring things, but every once in a while, an opportunity for something different presents itself. I'm so-and-so, right? Anyway, he used my stuff, and within like 30 minutes, he was making out with this chick. And out of the corner of his eye, he, he was looking, all these guys are going like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, how is he doing this? He must have an 18-inch, I don't know. He... <laughs> anyway, he was very excited about this. He figures, I'm going to play it cool. I'm going to get this lady's phone number, and I'll wait a couple of days, and I'll call her. So that's what he does. <clears throat> so two days go by, and he's thinking about it and thinking about it. He goes to reach for the number, and... I think you know where the story is going. It's not there on the desk. It's not there. Now, you ever had that feeling that you've been late for an appointment, and you go to reach for your car keys, and you can't find them? You ever have that happen? Yeah. Well, he's tossing the apartment, looking everywhere. And then he goes, oh my god, oh my god, the trash goes out tonight. Holy shit. So he goes to the big, I don't know, what's the English word for these big dumpsters? Is it a dumpster? They call it a dumpster, dumpster, or, uh, anyway. He goes diving through the dumpster for the whole apartment complex. And he told me he's down there digging deeper. He's digging deeper and deeper, looking at the sink. And he's going through progressively thicker sedimentary layers of <laughs> dirty diapers and disposed tampons and rotting food and, and cat shit and just <laughs> going deeper and deeper through all this stuff. And it's floating on his face and he's like... You know, and finally he said, after 90 minutes, he comes <gasps> up for air, and he can't, he doesn't have the number. And he said, my old self came back. He said, it's been six weeks, I've been so depressed, I can't even talk to a girl. Because my old self came back. 
And now when people talk, I've learned that their surface language is really an opportunity to peer deeper into the code of how they're processing, to peer much deeper into the code of how they're really processing it, right? And so I thought, his old self, well, first of all, when he was talking, guys, I want to quiz you. When he was talking, chatting up that lovely lady in the pub or the bar or whatever it was, where was his old self then? Hiding. Where was it hiding? He said hiding. Where was it hiding? Uh, in, the in the bathroom? In the deeper, uh, upper, unconscious. Hiding deep in the unconscious? Someone else give me an explanation. Where was his old self then? He wasn't aware of it? Somebody else. Where was his old self, James? He wasn't focused on the old self. He was focused on the new self. Somebody else. Where was his old self? That camera stays on me. Be very careful with the angles. Okay? All right. Where, where was his old self? Where did it go? What? It was suppressed. I think it went to Pismo Beach to play in the Bugs Bunny golf open. Where was it? There is no old self or new self. The Indian man, the man of Indian extraction got the right answer. There is no old self and there is no new self. There's only the ongoing flow of where you choose to put your attention and the beliefs and the energetics that are behind it. Now here's what I found the most interesting. This guy was so focused on the fact that he couldn't find the phone number that he completely hypnotically hallucinated away all the stuff he did right. Isn't it interesting that he did 95% of it correctly? Far and away better than anything that anyone in that club or pub did and better than anything he had ever done before. But because the last little piece was missing, he concluded that the whole thing was a failure that he was hopeless, and he forgot all the skills that he had beautifully developed. It, to me, as someone who studied trance and studied meditation and studied the mind, that's the most fascinating thing. How is that possible that he forgot everything he did right and just decided the whole thing was a failure and he chucked the whole thing? Now, by the way, do you think, who here thinks that that's uncommon? that that's not a typical thing that happens to guys when they're learning this. How many think that, think that that kind of thing is common, that you do a lot of things right, but if you don't get it all right, you conclude you're a failure, and you slide back down the learning curve? Exactly right. Now, no one else, you're, what are you doing filming out the window? This is crucial stuff, cameraman. <laughs> I'm serious. You're filming out the window. I'm revealing the secrets of deep personal change. I'm serious, because no one else in the seduction community even understands this. They don't even see it, let alone have an answer for it. When you are engaging in real growth in an area of life that's been deep, deeply emotionally challenging, that's surrounded by limiting beliefs and old experiences, if you're not very disciplined, the minute things don't go exactly right, you're going to interpret the whole thing as failure. And what happens? You slide back down the learning curve, and then you've got to work through weeks of depression and talking yourself into it and trying to pump yourself back up. Am I wrong or am I right? right. I'm absolutely right. So this takes something that should be a joy, that should be easy, and it turns it into an exhausting task. Now, let's be honest. Here we're brothers. We're not here to compete. If we, how many have found that this can be an emotionally, utterly exhausting task exactly because of this phenomenon? Yes. Now, how many times can men come together in a room and admit that things have emotionally exhausted them? That we share a pain. Now, are you doing, did this guy do this because he wanted to sabotage himself? No. Nope. Did he do this because he had low self-esteem? Did he? He did this because he never trained himself how to separate from those emotions, how to have an experience of them without the beliefs, how to transmute that emotional energy into pure motivation for his peace of mind, his balance, his centering, his happiness independent of conditions, his vision of who he's already every day more and more becoming. He had no way of separating out the raw emotion from the story 
He had no beliefs for looking at the experience through which he could actually see what works. What if he had, I said, you know how I, I solved this problem for him? Would you like to know the answer I gave him? Yes, sir, yes. sir, can I ask you just to stop fussing about with that? We can wait till later. It's very distracting to me as a teacher. Thank you. Do you know what I said to him? I said, wait a minute. Here's the problem. You're viewing what you did with that woman as an accident rather than as a result of the skills that you exercised. You're looking at it as a fluke. What if you were to stop, remember all the skills that you used, and view being able to attract women as a common, everyday part of your life wherever you went? Now, looking at the event through that, how do you feel? I went, oh, my new self is back. <laughs> I said, Eureka, that'll be 5,000 pounds. No, no, it's my joy to help people simply hold on by simply redirecting them. You see, because he had assumed that what happened was a fluke. I had to refocus him on the fact that, no, it wasn't a fluke. It was a result of your skill. And what if it was just common, the way you walk through life all the time? Now, the technical part about what he should have done differently is not the subject of this discussion. We could have that discussion. We could have said technically he could have tried to take her home that night or technically he could have put the number in a special place where he knows not to forget it. That doesn't really matter. The technical solution to the story is not what the story is about. The story is about this phenomena where in an emotionally charged area of life you need a disciplined way to quiet down your mind. Yes? You need to be able to take on some very empowering beliefs for learning. You need to be able, and here's the difference. I didn't give you the alternative. Here's the answer. There's a beautiful alternative to suppressing the emotion, to buying back into the story, or pushing through the pain. The beautiful alternative that's so profoundly powerful, I can't tell you how powerful this is. This is life. I want you guys to really look up here, because sometimes I have such important points to make that my passion as a teacher I fear that I'm not getting the point across. So I really want you to pay attention with full rigor to me. The ability to experience something without fighting it, with equanimity. Equanimity means you don't fight it or try to change it in any way. With equanimity and with clarity. So you have a complete experience separated out from the story. If you can have an experience of the raw emotional energy without any of the verbal dialogue or the visual imagery, if you can have an experience through equanimity, which means you don't buy into it, but you don't suppress it either, the beautiful alternative is to have the experience with full clarity without buying into it, without trying to change it. That emotional energy transmutes itself into raw power that you can then give back to yourself for peace of mind, for clarity, for grounding, for your belief in your ability to learn anything, for your vision of who you every day are already more and more becoming. Because if you can develop a vision for who you're already becoming that's not dependent on support from the external environment, in other words, you don't need people to support you in that vision. You don't need women to say, oh yes, you're attractive, Doug, or Bob. At the same time, you're open to feedback from the environment. That's extraordinarily powerful. When you can walk through the world like that, then you lose the fear of uncertainty. See, I know how guys are trapped because I used to be deeply trapped. Many of you are trapped in the following loop. Am I not right about this kind of stuff? Yes. I'm willing to bet that 80% of you are trapped in the following loop. You're not willing to actually try this material until you're 100% certain it will work. And there's no way to be certain it will work until you try it. So you wind up never being certain and never trying it. True or false? Mm -hmm. How many people go through that loop? The rest of you are fucking liars. <laughs> Look at this. Raise your hand again. How many people go through that loop? How do you break the loop? You break the loop by having absolute equanimity with uncertainty. You don't try to fight the uncertainty. I'm going to show you how. If all I do is give you the principle, but I don't give you the process, I'm a cheat and a liar, and I'm not. So I'm going to give you the process. But if you can have the experience with equanimity, then look here. Here's what I'm drawing. Here's what I'm aiming at. Here's what I'm moving towards. If you can, have, if you can experience with equanimity what most people fear, 
If you're totally okay with walking through uncertainty because it just becomes energy that you can utilize, then that's what I call stealth charisma. That's really sexy. Because very few people in this world will take a risk. They want to be certain before they take a step. If you're okay with uncertainty and are perfectly fine with it, that's the kind of confidence that no one can take away from you because it's a totally an internal locus of control. You are the person completely in control. No one can ever take it away from you. It's not dependent on have any, having any social skill at all. You can go out that door right now and have this kind of confidence because it's not dependent on being slick or smooth or good at what you do. It's incredibly stealthy. No one will ever be able to somehow detect it because it's coming organically from who you really are. It, it, they, they can't detect it as an act because it's not an act. It's real. And here's the fourth thing. You don't have to be the life of the party. You don't have to be the person who commands the whole room, the alpha dog who's telling all the stories, demonstrating his higher value. I think sometimes those guys are just demonstrating that they've got to be high to talk that way. Um, you don't have to do any of that. Because by virtue of how you're stepping through your world, you're attractive. Because you're no longer afraid. You're no longer tightening up and tensing against all those things everyone else is tense about. You're relaxed. And I'll show you. Here's, and here's the thing. You don't even have to be comfortable with yourself. You just have to have equanimity with your discomfort. You just have to be able to experience the discomfort without buying into the story surrounding it and not fighting it. And that will translate into a different kind of comfort. See, there's different kinds of confidence. This is really crucial you get this. Get the understanding, and then you can write it down. There's performance confidence. You've done something right a thousand times. So 1,001 makes sense that you'd be sure you can do it right, right? Mm -hmm. There's performance confidence. There's rehearsal confidence. Now, I teach rehearsal confidence. And rehearsal confidence is good once you've shut off all that rumination. If you do all this rehearsal confidence, imagining yourself 40 feet tall, imagining how you want to sound and how you look, it's great. I believe in it. I teach it. I will teach it to you. However, if you do that while all this other stuff is still running, you're going to create an internal civil war. How many here who do that rumination also do some positive programming? And how many still feel like you're being pulled apart? Because sometimes, Occasionally, you go with a positive program. Most of the time, you go with the, what you've been ruminating on. Raise your hand. So again, the process of personal change becomes exhausting. And you figure, I'll just go to someone else's seminar, or I'll buy some more tapes. God knows I want you to buy more tapes, but not for that reason. I want you to buy more of my stuff because you see, wait a minute, this is revolutionary. He's seen much deeper into the fundamentals of this. I want to learn more, not because of that reason. You get it? So there's rehearsal confidence. Rehearsal confidence is you go into an altered state where you do this magic stuff, which I'll show you, and you imagine the way you would like to feel, act, think, and talk. You imagine the qualities you'd like to bring into it. That, I love that stuff. I teach it. I'll teach it to the day I die. It works, but it only works at the right part in the sequence. You, should, you only do that after you've handled all the rumination, so that way you're not fighting yourself. Does that make sense? So there's rehearsal confidence, there's performance confidence, there's acceptance confidence. Acceptance confidence, and I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm not just going to explain it. I'm going to give you drills so you can learn to actually take this on and walk the world like this. Acceptance confidence is you have complete equanimity with all these emotions that have been troubling you. You don't buy into the story, and you don't tense up or turn away. And they, turn into, they just turn into a flow of energy. They turn into like effervescent bubbles, and you can just surf right across it. What if your former worst fears and anxiety could just turn into pure energy that you could surf across to do all the attracting you wanted to do? Would that be great? Yes or no? Who would like that? I can't hear you. Do you believe that they want that, Charlene? Yeah, I believe that too. Right? So that's acceptance confidence. But guess what? There's a fourth kind of confidence. Now, if you think I've been stretching your ability to follow and believe me up until now, now I'm really going to stretch your ability to believe me. I'm going to sound, at first, when you don't listen, I may sound like one of those new age tree-hugging granola guys in the woods who's been there. 
Believe me, I'm far from a new ager. I think the people who teach the secret should be boiled alive in their own excrement. <laughs> After their shriveled little testes are slid open and they're fed their own sperm. I hate that shit. Because it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> it's just, it is, it's fucking stupid. The secret teaches you that the universe is your wishing well. It's all here, everything that's here, all the time that existed before you were born, that eternity of time that existed before you were born, and the eternity of time that, that will exist after you're taken out. All of it is there, and everything, all the globular clusters, bl the black holes, the galaxies, the whole thing was created just so you could get the lard off your ass, get that jaguar you've always wanted, get that raise, have that perfect lover. It's all put here for you. It's all your wishing well. And you know, those kids who are starving to death in Zimbabwe and those pesky Indians who are dying on the streets and the next war that George Bush is about to launch on who knows what fucking pretext. Some Iranian farted on the border and disturbed our, <laughs> our surge. All that doesn't matter because it's all put here so you could have whatever you want. The universe is your wishing well. I don't think it works that way. I don't think everything was put here so humans could be happy the way humans define it. Humans define happiness as the body is comfortable or, and or feeling pleasure, the mind has answers, and you're getting what you want. That's the human definition of happiness. Now, I'm not saying that do that doesn't happen and that you can't arrange things so that more of that happens. But ultimately, that is not why everything is here. Any more than it's true that the Earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. I don't think the human definition of happiness is why we're here. But I think there is another definition of happiness that has nothing to do with those things. So anyway, here it comes. So we've gone through performance confidence. Do we understand that? Yeah. We've gone through acceptance confidence. We've gone through rehearsal confidence. Does that make sense? By the way, you're seeing a big piece of speed seduction here, Channel 4, is how we learn to manage our own emotions, how we learn to teach ourselves to learn. This is a huge piece of it. More and more, this is what it's about. The final find of form of confidence, which it's subtle but it's extraordinarily powerful. It's the confidence I was able to show when those women, that woman screamed at me. Right. Remember I told the story about coming out of the, the restaurant and the, and the women were waiting for the cat, taxi and that woman was just lambasting me and I was okay with it? I had another experience about six weeks ago. I was at a Starbucks and there was this drop dead beautiful black woman throwing things into the dumpster. And I said, it looks like you're, you're moving house. And she got really, she, she said to me, fuck you, motherfucker. I don't fucking need your comments. I don't fucking want to talk to you. Fuck off. And she was really angry to the point where I thought, and it wasn't like I felt upset that I had to like ground or anything. I was, okay. I instantly knew that per you know what my thought was? I thought, that person's in pain. She's hurting. I thought for someone to have that much anger at me, for something so innocuous, underneath the anger was enormous suffering. Something must have happened to her to put her through tremendous pain. Either she had very bad experiences with men or she was in a... And my response to her was, I, I said, you know, nothing I said to you merited that kind of response. So whoever you're angry at, it's not me. But I'm sorry that you're going through that because it doesn't make me happy to see someone else hurt. Now, what was her response? Fuck you, I don't fucking need your sympathy. Get the fuck out of my face. I went, okay. And I watched. She didn't take it. She couldn't hear it, but that's okay. The fourth kind of confidence is what I call compassion confidence. You can write that down, compassion confidence. Now, believe it or not, this is the true key to everything I do. Even though you've heard me teach you some language patterns and you've seen in how I talk to you, I have very slick communication with you and I can do 15 million triple uh, verbal somersaults. The real key to what I've been doing lately is this one. And I owe my teacher Shinzen Young. By the way, Shinzen is doing a retreat in California, in Southern California, October 29th through November 4th. He's doing a week-long silent meditation retreat. I will be there for that week. 
uh, his teachings have profoundly transformed how I experience my life. I don't mean a peak experience. A peak experience, you go to a seminar, you're high for a month or, or a few weeks, and then you go back to normal. This has transformed how I process and do my life. Compassion confidence is simply a realization. Look here, and then you can write it. It's a realization that fundamentally we're all in the same boat. That fundamentally we all came in the same way. What were you wearing when you were born? I can't hear you. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. What were you wearing when you were born? Nothing. Nothing. What was Charlene wearing when she was born? <laughs> A nice bikini? <laughs> Liar. Nothing. What's going to, I guarantee you, think of, what's a lot, has anyone recently seen a really hot woman who they'd like to approach, but they either didn't or they approached and go where they wanted? Anybody? I want you to picture that really hot woman in your mind. What was she wearing the day she was born? Not much. Nothing. Now, what's going to happen, I guarantee you something's going to happen to all of us one day. I don't make too many guarantees, but I, guarantee, I can absolutely guarantee that every person here today will undergo something. Something's going to happen to them. Can someone tell me? What's that? I can't hear you. You're going to die. So we all share the fundamental reality of being born naked, and we're all going to die. True or false? Now, some of you can tell me that Jesus will come back and lift you. <laughs> Setting that aside, we're all going to die, correct? That woman who screamed at me in front of the Starbucks, she came in the same way I did, bookie butt naked. Now, I wanted to share that condition with her again, but it didn't happen, okay? <laughs> and she's going to go out one day when she stops doing this. End of story. Not only is that true, but I know that at every moment, the same four fundamental forces are shaping me and her. We are all in the hands of the same fundamental set of forces. Whether you want to view it as God or nature or the Tao, the same four fundamental forces, the same artist is shaping the clay of time, space, world, matter, energy, and all of us constantly. Those four forces are craving. All of us experience pleasure and we want more of it. We crave that pleasure. Yes? You see the hot babe, you get a little jolt of pleasure from looking at her, and you want more. True or false? Every human, old, young, black, white, yellow, green, male, female, or any transitory species in between the two sexes, or combination thereof, experiences craving. And it's hardwired deep in the neurology of who we are. Very few people ever experience pure pleasure. They experience pleasure entangled with the craving, the grasping around it. And it's hardwired in. So the craving arises even before you're consciously aware of the pleasure. That craving arrives right along with it. All human beings experience craving. All of us. The second force that's always tugging and pulling and constantly shaping our, our, who we are is aversion. Aversion. We, we suffer and we don't want to suffer. We have pain and we tighten up or we turn away from it. We do everything we can to avoid fear, to avoid uncertainty, to avoid physical discomfort. We're hungry and we don't want to be hungry. We're hot. Excuse me, we don't want to be hot. Aversion. Yes? Do you think that super hot woman who you would like to sleep with, or who you're in love with, or who you want to marry, I don't care, do you think she doesn't experience craving and aversion? She does. I guarantee it. The third one is unconsciousness. Every human being, look at me. Get the transmission and please stop writing. Every human being suffers because of unconsciousness. All this ruminating you were doing about all the times you failed with women, were you consciously aware of what the result would be of doing that? I'm willing to bet that rumination was even going on in the background as a background buzz without, throughout your day, whether you were aware of it or not. Do you realize how much of your tension and anxiety and pain around women you've been carrying into every situation, even the ones that have nothing to do with women? How many of you have found that rumination going on when you're doing something that has nothing to do with women? When you're at a party and supposedly enjoying yourself with people, or you're sitting at your desk at work, raise your hand. Raise your hand. That rumination is always going on unconsciously, causing suffering. So there's unconsciousness. We want to change. 
We want to be different, but just desires, unconscious aversions, they drive us and they tear us apart. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? But guess what? That woman who you want something from, who you, who you thought you had to impress, she's suffering in the same way. She's suffering in the same way. Her emotions are entangled and consciousness is driving her. It's happening to all of us. We have craving, we have aversion, we have unconsciousness, and finally we have clarity. From time to time we all experience some clarity. Yes? And the point I'm trying to make to you is at any moment, these four forces are constantly shaping and reshaping who we are. The story I told you about that guy, his old self came back, bullshit. There never was a self to begin with. There was just these different forces pulling at him in different proportions, in different sequence, in different degrees of intensity, producing his ongoing sense of a self but there really was no self there. It's just the ongoing flow of these forces, constantly tugging and changing how we define and how we experience life. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, here's what I want you to get. Every human being goes through it. Every human, old, young, from the moment we're born to the moment we draw our last breath, these four forces are constantly shaping and reshaping who we are. And I'll tell you something else. The same source that is constantly tugging at all of reality reshaping it. My belief is not only is, is that there is no self, but there is no steady constant reality. My belief is that we are constantly being taken in and putting back, we are constantly being taken out and being put back in, in increments of speed that are too fast for us to observe and in increments of time that are too short for us to perceive. So the perception is that it's steady and constant. The perception is that we have a self we wake up, we go through our day with this constant steady self that has a series of experiences, but I believe it's an illusion. So if you can really get this sort of idea that we're all constantly in the same condition, we all came in the same way, we're all going to go out, and at every moment we're constantly being taken out and put back into reality by these four forces, you begin to get compassion for people. Now here's what I don't mean. Look up here. By, look up here. By compassion, I don't mean a Hallmark greeting card, right? I don't mean some syrupy, corny, the beautiful flowing white light of Jesus is gushing, gushing from your heart, <laughs> enveloping everyone in love, 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 new age, tofu sucking, steak <laughs> avoiding, don't eat meat, love. I don't mean that. To me, compassion is a simple perception. It's a very simple, non-emotional very subtle perception that somewhere in the back of your mind you hold that we are all sharing the same fundamental condition. Anymore when I walk into a group setting, any kind of group venue, before I walk in I take a breath and I imagine every person in that room, male, female, attractive, unattractive, I imagine their hearts are all beating and I imagine a pair of hands that's constantly tugging and pulling them in four different ways. I'm, and I say to myself, they're being, not only are they in the same condition as I am, the same hands, the same hands are constantly shaping the clay of their reality and my reality. And that separateness, when you look at people that way, separateness is an illusion. Now here's the thing you have to get. When it comes to being effective with people, you have to sort of wear bifocals. You have to be able to, be able to look at people from that perspective from the compassionate perspective that says, yes, we're all in the same condition. And then you also have to be able to look at yourself as being separate. The name of the game is not looking at everything as being in union or as looking at everything being separate. The name of the game is freedom and choice. So if somewhere humming in the background of your mind when you're going to attract, when you're going to seduce, if somewhere in the very background in a very subtle level level, you can just hold the thought that we're all in the same condition, then how can you be afraid of someone who's being created by the same thing as you are every moment? How can you feel separate or afraid of someone who's being produced by the same fundamental forces, who's being upheld at every moment by the same thing that's upholding you? How can you be afraid or feel separate from someone when you see them as fundamentally 
being produced by the same thing as you are. I challenge you to feel afraid if that's how you view people. It becomes impossible. You can't because you get that fundamentally we really are not separate from each other. I believe there's two ways to look at human beings. Each can be valid from its own framework. By the way, who knows something at all about physics? I don't mean like uh, quantum psychology physics that you read in the back of your weekly throwaway newspaper. I mean the real thing. Who, hears, who here knows anything about Newton's laws of motion? Anybody, right? You can use Newton law, Newton's laws of motion to predict the path of an artillery shell, correct? Yes. Even though Einstein came along, Newton's laws of motion, do they work at speeds approaching the speed of light? No, they don't. Do they work at subatomic levels to predict quantum events? Can you predict quantum events or describe them using Newton's laws of motion? I can't hear you. No. Does that mean they don't, that they're completely invalid? From a certain frame of reference, they work. Even though Einstein came along, you can still use Newton's laws to accurately predict the path of a bullet, true or false. So depending on your frame of reference, they're true or not true. They're usable or not truthful. I believe there's two ways to look at human beings. You can look at humans as basically bags of chemicals. We're basically chemical biological machines. We're moving through a cause and effect world. Time flows in a linear fashion, past, present, and future. Yes? We're all separate from each other. That can be a useful perspective. When you go to do your taxes, you have to view yourself as a separate thing, and you better view yourself that way. Yeah? God forbid if any of you ever gets into a car accident, cracks up on the M5 motorway, you don't want them to rush you to a Chinese herbalist, <laughs> right? Or an acupuncturist. I want to be taken to the best Western trauma clinic to have them pump me full of blood and, and reset my bones and do whatever they need to do. However, there's another view of humans that says, fundamentally, you can view humans as patterns of information. Yes? That, in fact, the future can influence the past, that time can flow in a lot of different directions, that we're always connected with each other anyway, that information can travel, information located without ever actually having to travel. You understand? You can look at humans in either of those two ways. So the language patterns that I'm giving you, that's sort of like the more cause and effect level. But this energetic stuff I'm giving you is looking at people from a totally different perspective. Which one is right? Which one works? They both do according to how you view people. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. This stuff I'm giving you trumps all the language patterns. If you can get the vibe down right, if you can learn to walk through uncertainty without fearing that uncertainty, if you can learn to have equanimity for the things that trouble other people and stop them, if you can learn to have a good learning strategy so all that rumination shuts down. By the way, how many guys here think that that beautiful girl ruminates in her head about something? Raise your hand. I can guarantee you that that super hot woman is ruminating about something. It could be about some guy she was involved with five years ago. When you walk through the world quiet, where other people are noisy, when you walk through the world unafraid to step into the unknown and you give other people radical permission to have their first response to you, that is so, that is so unusually sexy that women can't even put their finger on the source of their excitement as to why they're excited. Do you understand? There's no, no one can ever amog you out of that. No one can ever, they can't. No one can ever blow you out of the set because your whole world is your set. Do you understand? It's undetectable. I'll tell you something else. It's actually more acceptable to women. Because when you're super cocky and super smooth and super slick, women don't trust it. That kind of alpha, sure, it may be sexy, but on the other hand, it's a little scary. Like, what is this guy, a professional seducer? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> you understand? It's frightening, but the kind of stealth charisma I'm teaching you, it's not frightening because it has nothing to do with being slick. Does that make sense? Yes, James. My champion seducer, James. That's what I'm actually learning at the moment, is just to go in with the attitude, let's go and see. Like, I've got the most amazing responses that I've had to just having that attitude. 
the attitude of, I want you guys to join the Let's See What Happens Club instead of the What the Fuck Just Happened Club. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is like the differentiation between like approval seeking and actually I'm, I'm comfortable with myself. I beautiful, think. beautiful. James just said it's this distinction between seeking approval or validation and just being comfortable with the process. Here's the thing I want you guys to get. People entangle. So let's say this is your raw lust for a woman, raw lust. Very few guys experience pure, 100% raw desire for a woman. They entangle it with a need for validation. Yes? How many people feel they need to be validated by beautiful women accepting them? Raise your hand, you fucking liars. <laughs> okay, anyone who's not raising their hand is either a liar or a delusional, or they should teach this class. Or they're gay. <laughs> right. Or a combination of all of these options, okay? So most guys entangle their raw lust with the need for validation, and they entangle it with anxiety. A lot of guys are carrying a lot of resentment. Am I right or am I wrong? You're right. Am I right? Yes. I'm willing to bet part of your problem is that you've never experienced pure desire for women. Mm -hmm. Part of your problem is you've never approached a woman out of pure, raw, unadulterated lust. That entangled with it is the need to be validated, anxiety, resentment. Actually, if you really want to know a secret, nothing is more exciting to a woman than pure, raw, unadulterated male lust male desire, when it's not entangled with all this stuff. When it's not entangled with ego, God, that's not, like, that's not difficult to do. When it's not entangled with the need for validation, when it's not entangled with resentment or the need for, uh, or ego-driven, it's actually really sexy. Now, I want to get into it. This is a real fun little module that I do. It's effortless. It's fun. It's easy for you guys since it's towards the end of the day. Um, it's 5.30 now. I would like to go to 7 or even 7.30. Is that going to fuck up anybody's plans? No. Because I have a lot to teach, and I've been re-energized by a nice, vigorous Chinese massage. <laughs> but I thought we'd change the pace and make it a bit easier for the next 40, half hour to 45 minutes and talk about autopilot responses. <clears throat> because remember I talked about there's that third level of the mind where she responds with the illusion of choice when it's really just her, her fixed ways of perceiving? Many times when we deal with women, from the initial approach all the way to going to bed with them, we'll get autopilot responses. So I have a belief. Look up here. All of my verbal responses and behaviors flow out of my beliefs. If you understand my beliefs and take them on for yourself, then the verbal responses become easy. You can come up with your own. My core belief, I have two core beliefs for dealing with women. Two of them. I'm going to tell you the beliefs, we'll discuss them, get the meaning, and then I'll let you take it word for word, okay? But first, look up here. My core beliefs for dealing with women are, first of all, before I even open my mouth, women will already give me everything I need, show me everything I need, and tell me everything I need to seduce them. But my second belief that enables me to deal with autopilot is I seldom take a woman's first response to me as written in stone. It's almost always a reflection of what she's thinking, feeling, believing in that moment, in that context, and it's almost always subject to change. This is a strong belief I hold. And the beliefs that flow out of that are anything she offers me is just a toy for me to play with. Anything she offers me is just information I can use, and anything she offers me is just energy that I can redirect. Another belief I have is they can do whatever they want. I control where my energy flows. Right? So, some of the typical things you'll hear are, I have a boyfriend. Have you ever heard that? Yes. I have a full range of responses for that. Are you ready? <laughs> I have a boyfriend. Here's response number one. You don't need to convince me someone else finds you attractive. That's not how I'll make up my mind. So write that one down. <clears throat> you don't need to convince me someone else finds me attractive. Someone else finds you attractive. That's not how I'll make up my mind.
Now, what's the presupposition of that belief? The presupposition of that belief is telling me she has a boyfriend is not a way of shutting me down. She's telling me she has a boyfriend because she wants me to like her more. I'm deliberately misinterpreting the meaning of her objection and switching the frame around to say to her, hey, quit trying to convince me that I should like you. You understand? We're switching the frame on her. Enough. It's very distracting. Enough. Do you understand? Her comment, I have a boyfriend, is designed to put me off, to say I'm not interested. I'm deliberately misinterpreting it and saying, hey, wait a minute. Stop trying to give you, convince me that I should like you because another guy likes you. It's really good. I have a boyfriend. Here's another one. Check out this one. Watch this, guys. I have a boyfriend. Well, anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. <laughs> so by that math, you should be with five people. No, four and a half. Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. Now, what am I implying there when I say someone? Oh, Speak up. Yeah, someone. Anyone even halfway good looking could be with someone. Now, <laughs> she can't tell if I'm insulting her or what. <laughs> so by that math, you should be with five people. Here's a compliment. And they say, eh, make it four and a half. <laughs> halfway good looking can be with someone. I didn't say good. Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. So by that math, you should be with five people. That's saying she's really good looking, right? Nah, make it four and a half. <laughs> and then they always like punch me in the arm and say, you punk or you're cheeky. The equivalent of you're cheeky. You get it? Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. So by that math, you should be with five people. Now, nah, make it four and a half. So I'm just blowing it off with humor and saying it really doesn't matter. Here's another one. You ready? Anyone even halfway, do you want me to repeat it again? Do you still not get it? Anyone even halfway good looking could be with someone. I have that. I tell you already. Yeah. By that math, you should be with five people. Nah, make that four and a half. It's a clever way of saying, hey, come on. What am I really saying? Hey, come on, you can do a lot better than him. But I'm not saying it, I'm implying it. Yes? Here's another one. <clears throat> you ready? I have a boyfriend. Boyfriends are like colds. You can catch one at any time. It doesn't mean you can't shake it off. <laughs> <laughs> Boyfriends are like colds. You can catch one at any time. It doesn't mean you can't shake it off. You like that? Will you give me three minutes? I really have to pee. Take three minutes. Talk amongst yourselves about this, would you? Twitching into a metaphor to change how she thinks about it. So are you telling me the bridge is out or there's just a little bump in the road? You'd be surprised how often you hear, it's just a bump in the road. I have a boyfriend. I know you two minutes. You're already telling me your problems. <laughs> What, James? I was just thinking, couldn't it be used as boyfriends or they would just take it serious and then start on this different states? Like, even if they're just making up, even if they're like. Hold on, yeah. <clears throat> I only know you two minutes, you're already telling me your problems. You like those? Yes, yes. <clears throat> now, I should say, when a woman says she has a boyfriend, oftentimes it's just a bullshit autopilot response. 
And for a lot of women are what I call monkey branchers. You know what a monkey brancher is? You ever watch a monkey swing from branch to branch in the zoo? It doesn't fully let go of one branch until it's got its arm on the other one. It doesn't really jump from branch to branch. Some monkeys do. But most monkeys, they've got to grab hold of the next branch before they'll fully let go of the other one. Right? Most women are monkey branchers. The boyfriend is just filling time. And, and it doesn't mean anything. I had this, like five years back, I had a fling with this 22-year-old waitress from California Pizza Kitchen. She'd come over to my house, we'd fuck, and then she'd say things like, can you, can you drive me back to my place? My boyfriend is taking me to the movies in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't be seen with me in public. She wouldn't go to the movies with me or go to dinner with me, but she'd come over and fuck. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. It really doesn't conventionally make sense, but in reality, it makes sense. The other problem with boyfriends is a lot of boyfriends are stuck up sicky bits and they're not willing to experiment with wild, crazy, kinky, sexual shit. Or the boyfriend may be fulfilling her very nicely when it comes to that social level of the mind, but he's not really pushing the other buttons. So, so what? I used to have a student named Doc Dave. He sort of looked like you, but 60 more pounds glued to his belly. And his specialty was fucking chicks he picked up in the gym, but they would never be seen with him in public. They wouldn't go out with him. They wouldn't introduce him to their friends. They would just fuck him. Poor bastard. <laughs> so the other thing is sometimes I've had situations where I've met women and they said, you know, I, no, I'm, I, I'm really with someone right now. And I'll look them in the eye and say this. <clears throat> look here. And then I'll go through it word for word. I'll say, well, if you, sh if you should discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Listen to that. I say, if you discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, this is an example where I want you to write it down word for word, all right? If they say, no, seriously, I'm really seeing someone. I, I really am, uh, I've just started to date someone. I want to see if it works out. <coughs> This is an instant where I want you to write word for word, guys. You say the following. Well, if you should discover that he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, Maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. <clears throat> all right. Picking up all those sounds of me swallowing and chewing. <clears throat> Did we get that down word for word? This is an instant where I want you to take notes. And you need to get this word for word. Did you get it? Yes. Who needs the wording? Because uh, this is one where I want to make sure you have it word for word, okay? <clears throat> if you discover that he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, make sure you put in that word truly. It's crucial. In the way you truly want him to be. Did you get that? Yes. You have that much? Maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. And then you give her your number. I want you, this is when I, it's crucial that you do take notes and you write it word for word. <clears throat> Did you get that word for word? Do we all have it word for word? Yes. Now look up here and let's get, yes. Yes. Yeah, I know which one you're thinking. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, <clears throat> let's parse this out. If you should discover, I don't say how she should discover it or when she should discover it 
or in what manner the discovery should come to her mind. Do I? <clears throat> Did I say this is an example of being what? Vague. <clears throat> I didn't say if as you're laying there one day after making love to him, it pops into your mind that he's a lousy lover and you think about the kind of fucking you'd really like. I didn't say that, did I? No. Why? Too specific. Too specific. If you should discover, <clears throat> discover is very vague, leaves it broadly wide open. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you should discover, did I say he's a bastard or he's a rotten guy or he's a poor lover or he doesn't listen to you or he's bad among your friends? Did I say any of those things? Did I? Look up here. It's crucial that you get this. Knowing when to be specific and when to be vague and how to fractionate back and forth is extraordinarily powerful in persuading people. Because it may not match her experience. What if she doesn't think he's a bastard? What if the reason she doesn't, what if the reason she finds he's not with her in the way she truly wants him to be is he doesn't make enough money or he's a poor lover? I don't want to fill, I want her to fill in the gap. You understand? <clears throat> if you should discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be. Now, in order to think about that question, what part of her mind does she have to go into? What does she have to think about? She has to think about the way she truly wants a man to be. There's a big distinction here. If I said, if you discover he's not with you in the way you want him to be, eh. But by saying truly want him to be, the implication of that adjective is that there's another level of satisfaction that she hasn't been thinking about, isn't there? Well, we already have a supplier for our coffee machines. Well, if you should discover they're not meeting your needs in the way you truly want them to, maybe we owe it to each other to talk. Understand? If he's not winning the way you truly want him to be, where does she have to go in her mind to even contemplate that? She has to go into the part of her mind where she thinks about the things that would most deeply really fulfill her. Yes? Maybe... Maybe, so it's a softener, we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, what does that mean, owe it to ourselves to talk? <clears throat> First of all, saying ourselves implies that we have a relationship, doesn't it? I didn't say maybe you owe it to yourself to call me. Why? Because that would come off as arrogant, right? I say maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, in what way do we owe it to ourselves? According to who do we owe it to ourselves? How should it occur to her that we owe it to ourselves? What do you mean, ourselves? And talk in which way? Talk about what? Talk when? Talk how? Talk where? It's so fucking vague. It's like taking a jellyfish, coating it with grease, and sliding it down a tube slicked with sex lube. There's, there's no resistance to push back against. She can't push against any of this because there's, I'm not saying anything specific. And yet, at the same time, <clears throat> another reason it's powerful, look here, it's not just powerful because it's vague. It's powerful because it demonstrates understanding in a woman's world. It demonstrates the fact that women are always, look here, women are always reevaluating the relationship. They're all, even if they're happy with a guy, some part of them is always thinking, is he really the one? Do I really want to be with him? They're constantly discussing you with their girlfriends. So I'm actually pacing her reality. I'm demonstrating that I understand her deeper processes because women do that. They'll be with a guy and they'll think, is he really the one I want to be with? Women love playing this game with themselves. It's part of how they fractionate their interest in a guy. They love him, they love him, and then they pop out of it and go, do I really love him? Then they pop back into it. Every time they put, you understand? But oftentimes, what happens is they go, you know, I really don't. Now, by making, what am I really doing? This is setting off a time bomb in her mind. It really is. She's going to go home and look at him with a much more critical eye. Because now she's not looking at him with the eye of, he's my boyfriend. She's looking at him with the eye going, is he who I really want to be with? 
And then she's going to start doubting everything he does. And pretty soon, she's going to go, I need to give that guy a call. Is that fair? I can't hear you. <clears throat> this is a ticking little time-release capsule. And now guess what? If he's a great guy and doesn't fuck it up, she may go, you know what? He really is someone I want to be with. But chances are, he's an AFC in some way, an average frustrated chump some way. He just got lucky and asked her out when she was lonely and punched the right button a couple of times. Now, what would most guys do? Well, yeah, you have a boyfriend, but I bet he's not really. Tell me, give me five reasons why you love him. <laughs> or so what? I'm better. Or never mind, thank you. Yes, you had a comment, James? I was just going to say the likelihood is that the relationship's been split at some point. So not, right. You're always going to be forsaking that relationship. You're enjoying this, aren't you? You're liking this one. I've used this, the first time I used this. <clears throat> She called me two weeks later and said, you know, I realized he really wasn't with me the way I truly wanted him to be. Can I see you? I said, sure. Would you give them your number? Yeah, us? yeah, sure, right. sure. Because sure. Sure. I said that, I got that off your home study work course. There was five girls bobbing in a nightclub. And there was one that I said, because I read something from your old book about the sea, the sky, and the feel of the sand. And she says, okay, hypnotize me then. All right, well, let's sit on the stool. But I took her a little bit away from where the music was pumping. And then I used a little ice cube on her head. And she thought, oh, that was really nice. But the first thing that she said was that if I was magical and hypnosis, I'd be able to bring her boyfriend in here. And after the ice cube, I said, I said, you know, if you're not with somebody who's with you in a way you truly want them to be, then maybe we should talk. And then she looked at me like that, and the head went. <laughs> but I didn't have any more firepower or material, so she kind of. You didn't off. need any more firepower. <laughs> well, I dropped the H bomb on her. She vaporized, and I need more firepower. The only firepower you need to say is you need to say something like, you know what? Why don't we go somewhere a little more quiet where we can really relax and focus in? <laughs> That's, what? Well, here's a good question. Why don't we go somewhere? Why don't we go somewhere a little more quiet where we can relax and focus in? Why don't we go somewhere a little quiet where we can relax and focus in? You're not going to get buyer's remorse if every step of the way she's reaching for more. It can be a lot longer. You won't get buyer's remorse if you're fractionating, challenging her, feeding back her own language, and making her reach for it at every moment. Sometimes I'll say to a woman, on a scale of 1 to 10, how good does this feel? And she'll say, 10. I'll say, if and only if you want better feelings, say more, please. I'll make her say more, please. Flat out, say more, please. Now, if a woman is reaching for something, and she's actually verbally saying more, how can she resist it? Because she's convincing herself at every step of the way. She's investing in it, remember? So you won't get buyer's remorse. You may get token resistance, but that's not the same. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you see, it's the same principles operating, demonstrating authority in her world, being vague, getting her to think from a certain level of the mind. They're the same principles no matter what part of the Sarge you're in. Yes? Demonstrating authority in her world? Well, there's different ways you can demonstrate authority. 
Now I want to get into it. This is a real fun little module that I do. It's effortless. It's fun. It's easy for you guys since it's towards the end of the day. Um, it's 5.30 now. I would like to go to 7 or even 7.30. Is that going to fuck up anybody's plans? No. Because I have a lot to teach and I've been re-energized by a nice vigorous Chinese massage. <laughs> but I thought we'd change the pace and make it a bit easier for the next 40, half hour to 45 minutes and talk about autopilot responses. <clears throat> because remember I talked about there's that third level of the mind where she responds with the illusion of choice when it's really just her, her fixed ways of perceiving. Many times when we deal with women, from the initial approach all the way to going to bed with them, we'll get autopilot responses. So I have a belief. Look up here. All of my verbal responses and behaviors flow out of my beliefs. If you understand my beliefs and take them on for yourself, then the verbal responses become easy. You can come up with your own. My core belief, I have two core beliefs for dealing with women. Two of them. I'm going to tell you the beliefs, we'll discuss them, get the meaning, and then I'll let you take it word for word, okay? But first, look up here. My core beliefs for dealing with women are, first of all, before I even open my mouth, women will already give me everything I need, show me everything I need, and tell me everything I need to seduce them. But my second belief that enables me to deal with autopilot is I seldom take a woman's first response to me as written in stone. It's almost always a reflection of what she's thinking, feeling, believing in that moment and that context, and it's almost always subject to change. This is a strong belief I hold. And the beliefs that flow out of that are anything she offers me is just a toy for me to play with. Anything she offers me is just information I can use. And anything she offers me is just energy that I can redirect. Another belief I have is they can do whatever they want. I control where my energy flows. Right? So some of the typical things you'll hear are, I have a boyfriend. Have you ever heard that? Yes. I have a full range of responses for that. Are you ready? <laughs> I have a boyfriend. Here's response number one. You don't need to convince me someone else finds you attractive. That's not how I make up my mind. So write that one down. <clears throat> you don't need to convince me someone else finds me attractive. Someone else finds you attractive. That's not how I'll make up my mind. Now, what's the presupposition of that belief? The presupposition of that belief is telling me she has a boyfriend is not a way of shutting me down. She's telling me she has a boyfriend because she wants me to like her more. I'm deliberately misinterpreting the meaning of her objection and switching the frame around to say to her, hey, quit trying to convince me that I should like you. You understand? We're switching the frame on her. Enough. It's very distracting. Enough. Do you understand? Her comment, I have a boyfriend, is designed to put me off, to say I'm not interested. I'm deliberately misinterpreting it and saying, hey, wait a minute. Stop trying to give you, convince me that I should like you because another guy likes you. It's really good. I have a boyfriend. Here's another one. Check out this one. Watch this, guys. I have a boyfriend. Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. <laughs> so by that math, you should be with five people. No, four and a half. <laughs> Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. Now, what am I implying there when I say someone? Oh, Speak up. Yeah, someone. Anyone even halfway good looking could be with someone. Now, <laughs> she can't tell if I'm insulting her or what. <laughs> so by that math, you should be with five people. Here's a compliment. And they say, eh, make it four and a half. <laughs> halfway good looking can be with someone. I didn't say good. Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. No. So by that math, you should be with five people. 
That's saying she's really good looking, right? Nah, make it four and a half. <laughs> and then they always like punch me in the armor and say, you punk or you're cheeky. The equivalent of you're cheeky. You get it? Anyone even halfway good looking can be with someone. So by that math, you should be with five people. Now, make it four and a half. So I'm just blowing it off with humor and saying it really doesn't matter. Here's another one. You ready? Anyone even halfway, do you want me to repeat it again? Do you still not get it? Anyone even halfway good looking could be with someone. I have that. I tell you what Yeah. By that math, you should be with five people. Nah, make that four and a half. It's a clever way of saying, hey, come on. What am I really saying? Hey, come on, you can do a lot better than him. But I'm not saying it. I'm implying it. Yes? Here's another one. <clears throat> you ready? I have a boyfriend. Boyfriends are like colds. You can catch one at any time. It doesn't mean you can't shake it off. <laughs> <laughs> Boyfriends are like colds. You can catch one at any time. It doesn't mean you can't shake it off. You like that? Will you give me three minutes? I really have to pee. Take three minutes. Talk amongst yourselves about this, would you? Twitching into a metaphor to change how she thinks about it. So are you telling me the bridge is out or there's just a little bump in the road? You'd be surprised how often you hear it's just a bump in the road. I have a boyfriend. I know you two minutes. You're already telling me your problems. What, James? Hold on, yes. <clears throat> I only know you two minutes, you're already telling me your problems. You like those? Yes. <clears throat> now, I should say, when a woman says she has a boyfriend, oftentimes it's just a bullshit autopilot response. And for a lot of women are what I call monkey branchers. You know what a monkey brancher is? You ever watch a monkey swing from branch to branch in the zoo? It doesn't fully let go of one branch until it's got its arm on the other one. It doesn't really jump from branch to branch. Some monkeys do. But most monkeys, they got to grab hold of the next branch before they'll fully let go of the other one. Right? Most women are monkey branchers. The boyfriend is just filling time. And, and it doesn't mean anything. I had this, like five years back, I had a fling with this 22-year-old waitress from California Pizza Kitchen. She'd come over to my house. We'd fuck. And then she'd say things like, can you, can you drive me back to my place? My boyfriend is taking me to the movies in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't be seen with me in public. She wouldn't go to the movies with me or go to dinner with me, but she'd come over and fuck. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. It really doesn't conventionally make sense, but in reality, it makes sense. The other problem with boyfriends is a lot of boyfriends are stuck up sicky bits and they're not willing to experiment with wild, crazy, kinky sexual shit. Or the boyfriend may be fulfilling her very nicely when it comes to that social level of the mind, but he's not really pushing the other buttons. So, so what? I used to have a student named Doc Dave. He sort of looked like you, but 60 more pounds glued to his belly. And his specialty was fucking chicks he picked up in the gym, but they would never be seen with him in public. They wouldn't go out with him. They wouldn't introduce him to their friends. They would just fuck him. Poor bastard. Poor bastard. <laughs> so the other thing is sometimes I've had situations where I've met women and they said you know I, no, I'm, I, I'm really with someone right now and I'll look them in the eye and say this <clears throat> look here and then I'll go through it word for word I'll say well if you, sh if you should discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be Maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Listen to that. I say, if you discover 
he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, this is an example where I want you to write it down word for word, all right? If they say, no, seriously, I'm really seeing someone. Or, I really am, uh, I just started to date someone. I want to see if it works out. <clears throat> This is an instant where I want you to write word for word, guys. You say the following. Well, if you should discover that he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, Maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. <clears throat> all right. Picking up all those sounds of me swallowing and chewing. <clears throat> Did we get that down word for word? This is an instant where I want you to take notes. And you need to get this word for word. Did you get it? Yes. Who needs the wording? Because uh, this is one where I want to make sure you have it word for word, okay? <clears throat> if you discover that he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, make sure you put in that word truly. It's crucial. In the way you truly want him to be. Did you get that? Yeah. You have that much? Maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. And then you give her your number. I want you, this is when I, it's crucial that you do take notes and you write it word for word. <clears throat> Did you get that word for word? Do we all have it word for word? Yes. Now look up here and let's get, yes. Yes. Yeah, I know which one you're thinking. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, <clears throat> let's parse this out. If you should discover, I don't say how she should discover it, or when she should discover it, or in what manner the discovery should come to her mind, do I? <clears throat> Did I say, this is an example of being what? Vague. I didn't say, if as you're laying there one day after making love to him, it pops into your mind that he's a lousy lover, and you think about the kind of fucking you'd really like. I didn't say that, did I? No. Why? Specific. Too specific. If you should discover, <clears throat> discover is very vague, leaves it broadly wide open. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you should discover... Did I say he's a bastard, or he's a rotten guy, or he's a poor lover, or he doesn't listen to you, or he's bad among your friends? Did I say any of those things? Did I? Look up here. It's crucial that you get this. Knowing when to be specific and when to be vague and how to fractionate back and forth is extraordinarily powerful in persuading people. Because it may not match her experience. What if she doesn't think he's a bastard? What if the reason she doesn't, what if the reason she finds he's not with her in the way she truly wants him to be is he doesn't make enough money or he's a poor lover? I don't want to fill, I want her to fill in the gap. You understand? <clears throat> if you should discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be. Now, in order to think about that question, what part of her mind does she have to go into? What does she have to think about? She has to think about the way she truly wants a man to be. There's a big distinction here. If I said, if you discover he's not with you in the way you want him to be, eh. But by saying truly want him to be, the implication of that adjective is that there's another level of satisfaction that she hasn't been thinking about, isn't there? Well, we already have a supplier for our coffee machine. 
What if you should discover they're not meeting your needs in the way you truly want them to? Maybe we owe it to each other to talk. Understand? If he's not winning the way you truly want him to be, where does she have to go in her mind to even contemplate that? She has to go into the part of her mind where she thinks about the things that would most deeply, really fulfill her. Yes? Maybe, maybe, so it's a softener, we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, what does that mean? Owe it to ourselves to talk. First of all, saying ourselves implies that we have a relationship, doesn't it? I didn't say maybe you owe it to yourself to call me. Why? Because that would come off as arrogant, right? I say maybe we owe it to ourselves to talk. Now, in what way do we owe it to ourselves? According to who do we owe it to ourselves? How should it occur to her that we owe it to ourselves? What do you mean ourselves? And talk in which way? Talk about what? Talk when, talk how, talk where. It's so fucking vague. It's like taking a jellyfish, coating it with grease, and sliding it down a tube slicked with sex lube. There's, there's no resistance to push back against. She can't push against any of this because there's, I'm not saying anything specific. And yet, at the same time, <clears throat> another reason it's powerful Look here. It's not just powerful because it's vague. It's powerful because it demonstrates understanding in a woman's world. It demonstrates the fact that women are always, look here, women are always reevaluating the relationship. They're oh, even if they're happy with a guy, some part of them is always thinking, is he really the one? Do I really want to be with him? They're constantly discussing you with their girlfriends. So I'm actually pacing her reality. I'm demonstrating that I understand her deeper processes because women do that. They'll be with a guy and they'll think, is he really the one I want to be with? Women love playing this game with themselves. It's part of how they fractionate their interest in a guy. They love him, they love him, and then they pop out of it and go, do I really love him? Then they pop back into it. Every time they, po you understand? But oftentimes, what happens is they go, you know, I really don't. Now, by making, what am I really doing? This is setting off a time bomb in her mind. It really is. She's going to go home and look at him with a much more critical eye. Because now she's not looking at him with the eye of, he's my boyfriend. She's looking at him with the eye going, is he who I really want to be with? And then she's going to start doubting everything he does. And pretty soon, she's going to go, I need to give that guy a call. Is that fair? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yes. This is a ticking little time-release capsule. And now guess what? If he's a great guy and doesn't fuck it up, she may go, you know what? He really is someone I want to be with. But chances are he's an AFC in some way, an average frustrated chump some way. He just got lucky and asked her out when she was lonely and punched the right button a couple of times. Now, what would most guys do? Well, yeah, you have a boyfriend, but I bet he's not really. Tell me, give me five reasons why you love him. <laughs> or so what? I'm better. Or never mind, thank you. Yes, you had a comment, James? No, I was just going to say the likelihood is that the relationship's been split up in some place. And not, right. You're always going to be the safety net, really. You're enjoying this, aren't you? You're liking this one. I'd use this, the first time I used this. <clears throat> She called me two weeks later and said, you know, I realized he really wasn't with me in the way I truly wanted him to be. Can I see you? I said, sure. Would you give them your number? Yeah, us? yeah, sure, right. sure. Because sure. Sure. I said that, I got that off your home study work course. There was five girls bobbing in a nightclub. And there was one of them I said, because oh, I read something from your old book about the sea, the sky, and the feel of the sand. And she says, okay, hypnotize me then. All right, well, let's sit on the stool. But I took her a little bit away from where the music was pumping. And then I used a little ice cube on her head. And she thought, oh, that was really nice. But the first thing that she said was that if I was magical in hypnosis, I'd be able to bring her boyfriend in here. And after the ice cube, I said, I said, you know, if you're not with somebody who's with you in a way you truly want them to be, 
then maybe we should talk. And then she looked at me like that, and the head went. <laughs> but I didn't have any more firepower or material, so she kind of. You didn't need me. any more firepower. <laughs> Well, I dropped the H-bomb on her. She vaporized, and I need more firepower. <laughs> the only firepower you need to say is, you need to say something like, you know what? Why don't we go somewhere a little more quiet where we can really relax and focus in? <laughs> That's, what? Here's a good question. Why don't we go somewhere... Why don't we go somewhere a little more quiet where we can relax and focus in? Why don't we go somewhere a little quiet where we can relax and focus in? You're not going to get buyer's remorse if every step of the way she's reaching for more. It can be a lot longer. <clears throat> you won't get buyer's remorse if you're fractionating, challenging her, feeding back her own language, and making her reach for it at every moment. Sometimes I'll say to a woman, on a scale of 1 to 10, how good does this feel? And she'll say, can. I'll say, if and only if you want better feelings, say more, please. I'll make her say more, please. Flat out, say more, please. Now, if a woman is reaching for something, and she's actually verbally saying more, how can she resist it? Because she's convincing herself at every step of the way, she's investing in it, remember? So you won't get buyer's remorse. You may get token resistance, but that's not the same. Does that make sense? Yes. Hmm? But you see, it's the same principles operating, demonstrating authority in her world, being vague, getting her to think from a certain level of the mind. They're the same principles no matter what part of the Sarge you're in. Yes? Demonstrating authority in her world? Well, there's different ways you can demonstrate authority. You can demonstrate that you understand her ongoing processes by observing what she's doing inside energetically. When our, our friend was up in front of the room and I noticed what he was thinking as he was thinking that, that established real expertise, authority in his world, didn't it? Because I was able to observe. You can demonstrate that you understand how women think overall. That statement, if he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be, it's not only vague, it not only requires her to go into the deepest level of her mind to answer it, but it also demonstrates without saying it that you understand how women think, that women are constantly questioning their relationships. The best techniques employ two or three things simultaneously. So this one is really a good example because you're being vague, so she fills in the blanks and can't resist. You're demonstrating authority in her world because, in fact, women do question their relationships, aren't, aren't you? And you're requiring a response from the deepest level of her mind. That's pretty powerful for just, how many words are in that? Maybe 20 words. It's pretty powerful. And it shows you what you can do when you know where to direct this communication instead of willy-nilly tossing things about. Yes? That makes sense? Yeah. Wake up. Yeah. You all right, Doc? Yeah. Yes. I was walking through. Uh, Where are you from? Irish, but I live here in London. You're Irish, oi. Right? I got some jokes for you. <laughs> I've heard them. I've heard them. Huh? I've heard them. I don't laugh at them anyway, because my brain don't pick up on them, you know? Right. But, <laughs> Yellow got... clovers, green stars. You don't get lucky charms here, do you? UK. You know what lucky charms are? Oh yeah. Go ahead. I was going through Brighton Shopping Centre. It's something that I do quite a bit. And I'll scan for the eye contact. And if I get a bit of eye contact, I'll drop a smile. And if she does, I'll hold her there and then. 
this girl, you could see that 60, 70, nearly 80 percent of her wanted a side with me, but then another part of her is saying, hang on. The sensible part of her. <laughs> <laughs> this fella in the shopping center. These two fat black lesbian Irish women. <laughs> no, go ahead. You could see that 80 percent of her wanted a side with me. I was saying, okay, look. I'm a stranger, I've stopped you in the, the shopping center, you're smiling. I can see she was smiling and energetic, she just didn't have any words. And I was saying, but yeah, if you were in a nightclub and I came over and said hello... Do you mind being on see. camera? No. Come and get up here. <clears throat> Turn around and face the camera, stand over there, stand over there. Stand over there. All right, relax. Just relax. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, just shut up. Can you point your feet like this? Yeah. Point your feet straight. Look up. All right, I want you to do something for me. I want you to hold your attention on your feet. Relax. Relax your body. Smile. Hold, no, hold, <laughs> hold your attention on your feet. All right. Hold your attention on your feet. Relax everything. You don't have to go into trance. You can look normally at people. Look around the room. But put a little bit of your attention on your feet. Relax your shoulders. You can change. You don't have to stand there. Just put a little bit of attention on your feet. Keep 10% of your attention on your feet and talk to me. With 10% of your attention on your feet. Keep talking. Well, like I said, you could see that 80% of her. Yeah. Yeah, you could see that 80% of her was thinking... Yeah, I like this fella, he's interested. And I said to her, I said, if I was in a nightclub and you Keep were... Keep 10% of your attention on your feet as you talk to me. Keep I going. said to her, if I was in a nightclub and I came and approached you, it would be considered normal because you're used to people that approaching you, strangers in a nightclub. But just because I've stopped you in the shopping centre and people are shopping and walking by and stuff like that, and you don't know me, you're thinking, ooh, it's a bit too weird to just come over to Starbucks and sit down. Now, the reason why I popped the question up is because if it was you, what would you say differently to her? Because you probably have better words than I do. It's not my words. <laughs> okay. Talk to me again, but now put 20% of your attention on the feeling of your, in your feet. Tell me the story again, but put 20% of the attention in your feet. She was walking through the shop center. Right. And I was walking. And I looked, and I seen her eyes, and I kind of smiled a little, and so did she. So I caught across, and I halted her, and she stopped. And I said to her, I like you. I want to get to know you. And she smiled and said, well, this is a bit random. So what I did was I stepped out of the way. So if she wants to keep walking. Stop right there. Don't say a word. Turn around and look at the camera. Did any of you see the difference in how you presented? Yep. What did you notice different? That when he put 20 percent, uh, when he put 20 percent of his focus on his feet, what did you see was different? Say again. Slower. What else? Less absolutely terrifying because he's not looking like he's a a bumblebee on cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you need to change tape. Um, you can leave it for the day. Your issue, sir, is not what you're saying. Your issue is you're like that junkyard dog with a huge boner ready to hump the world. You're coming at people so with so much voltage. That now, I always like the last day because the last day you aren't all in such a muddle and you're up to speed. And Are you beginning to see what I talked about on the first evening about fractionation and capturing and leading the imagination? and getting her to invest and, and uh, all this other good stuff. Yes? Yes. Yes. yes? yes? Now, how many here want more of the mechanics, more of those saucy language patterns to get her dripping wet yes. and, and basically a camel's yawn? <laughs> I love these British expressions, camel's yawn, fucking the night. It's brilliant. I'm going to bring it back to Southern California and see if I can introduce it to the lexicon. So how many want more of the actual mechanics of the approach and the... How many want some more of the uh, energetic stuff and the uh, learning stuff we did yet? Okay, it's about half. So 
we're going to jump into some language patterns since the reporters like to hear that stuff and since you guys want it, right? So, we've been talking about themes, right? So let's show you how we can spin language patterns. Oh, I'll give you a language pattern that's knocking women out left and right. I mean, this is like, I don't like that expression. So what I mean is it's having a great impact. And it's based absolutely on truth. A and um, I don't even know why it's working, because it's violating pretty much all the traditional rules of, of, of language patterns. There's no actual embedded commands in it, but it's working. <laughs> So you want me to share with you my latest that I'm actually using with devastating effects? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. All right, ladies. <laughs> now, it's interesting because this doesn't follow any of the rules, but, and it's based on truth. The fact of the matter is, and I'm not making this up, this is absolutely true. On and off for the past two years, I've been having, and I'm not, this is true, on and off for the past two years, I've been having dreams about this really awesome woman. I think, God forbid, it could be a dream about me one day getting. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and in every dream, she looks different, but the energetic pattern is absolutely the same. So I had this dream about two years ago, and this is a story, by the way, that I tell the women, right? I had this dream about two years ago where I'm looking for a place to live, and I see this beautiful cottage. And it, it has a for lease sign on the window and a number to call. And I know I shouldn't go in because there's no one home, but it's just so inviting I have to go in. And I go in, and very clearly, this is a woman's place. The imprint of her personality and her creativity is all over this place. And you can see that she's a photographer. She's got photo, her photographs are all over the walls, and there's a book on the coffee table. It says Bali. It's a picture book of this island, Bali, picture she's taken. And clearly, you can see that this is a person with great passion for their career, great passion for their life, uh, that they have something that they really, really love to do. So I'm looking around. Uh, all of a sudden, she walks in. She walks in, and she's towing a little, um, a little bag, a little bag, flight bag that you use to pack things for a quick trip to the airport. And rather than being angry or upset or shocked or scared that I'm there, she says, oh, hello, can I help you? And I say, well, yeah, you know, um, I know I shouldn't have come in. I know I didn't ask for an appointment, but it just looked so inviting I had to come in. And rather than getting mad at me, she said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't I fix you a cup of tea? I'm on my way to the airport. I don't have a lot of time. Why don't I fix you a cup of tea, and I'll show you around? So she shows me around the place, and I'm looking, and I can see her passion for her work and her talent. She's really talented and really passionate about it. And then. She says, I'll tell you what, I've got to get to the airport. Here's the card with my number on it. Take all the time you want. Make yourself at home. And when you're ready, give me a call. And I remember waking up from the dream thinking, wow, that is an incredible energy. How attractive. That first of all, she's grounded. That rather than being thrown by the unexpected, she's fine with it. Not only is she not upset that I'm there, even though she's in a hurry, and even though I don't belong there, she wants to make me feel comfortable. She has the presence of mind to make me feel comfortable. She doesn't view making a man feel comfortable as a bad thing. It just comes naturally to her. And then also she's got a passion for her life. She's doing something that she really loves. She's got something that she enjoys doing that makes her life worthwhile. I remember waking up from the dream and thinking, wow, if I ever meet that energy, that's the energy of the woman that I'm really, really going to love. Now, stop right there, guys. I used to just tell that part of the story, and even that would get women like, but I added in a part because it's true. <clears throat> and then I'll tell them, I said, you know, about a month ago, I decided to have the dream from the woman's perspective. I decided, let's imagine I'm the woman dreaming about this. So in the dream, I have this place to lease. And I'm in a hurry. I've got to go to another job. I'm going to the airport. I come home, and there's this guy there. And rather than being upset that this guy is there, the first thing I notice is I notice his innocence. As I come in, he's looking at my work. And I go, wait a minute. This person means no harm. I instantly felt comfortable with him, and I instantly could see his innocence. He was looking at my work, and he was in love with my work. He could see the world. He could see my passion the same way I saw it. And then as I led him about you know, showing him the place, he wasn't hitting on me at all. 
I didn't feel any of that. He was really naturally just totally in love with my work, actually really expressing it. And not only that, he was seeing my passion through the same eyes I was. I remember I, left, I felt so comfortable with him, I let him stay there. I said, take all the time you want and just call me. But as I was going to the airport, I remember missing him. As soon as I left him, I thought, oh, my God, I, I, I miss this man. I want to see him. This man is going to be so special in my life. Now, guys, I finished telling the story, and these girls are... <laughs> now, see, the thing is, is I, I guess that is got some... We, you want to go through it and see where it's a pattern? Because it works. I mean, I'm not traditionally giving her any commands or anything, but I guess it's in there. Because it's really working. I mean, this is working almost better than anything I've ever done since 1988. Okay? So there's something going on here that we should look at together, don't you think? Yes. Now, the first thing I should say is this pattern is true. I really did have that dream. And the ma fact of the matter is that woman has appeared in my many different dreams. She always looks different. She o really always looks different, but it's the same energy. The same energetic pattern is there. So let me wheel this closer. I think we can move this closer, huh? Way close. I honestly don't know. I haven't really stopped to sit down and, and analyze why this works. If you want to steal my dream, you can. You can say, you know what? I was talking to this guy, and he told me this dream, if you want to. I don't know why this is working so well. I haven't stopped to think about it, but let's see. So the first part of it is I tell her, well, I had this dream. I think that works because it's like, it's equivalent to telling a story. It's like saying once upon a time. So it's not like directed directly at her. It's a way of putting the whole thing in quotes. Who thinks that's a possibility? Anybody? Yes. Anybody have another idea and disagree with that? I, uh, this is my, I haven't really even analyzed it. I've just been enjoying the results. <laughs> Anybody? When you're saying you've got a dream, is it they, you're willing to share something quite personal? That's good. That's good, too. He said, when you say, I, I had a dream, it's like you're sharing something really personal. So maybe it's creating a bond that way. Yes. By saying, well, yeah, it's putting it in quotes. It's taking a step back. It's like saying, once upon a time. I think these are really good. Uh, uh, so the first aspect is by saying it's a dream, which it was, it's putting the whole thing in quotes. Creates intrigue, because dreams are intriguing in and of itself. I guess the topic of dreams is a great topic. Because dreams deal with that part of the mind that fantasizes, right? <coughs> dreams are, I think, a part of that topic of fantasy, escape. Because dreams are escape fantasies, in, in a sense. So, you could also demonstrate the expertise by saying that uh, you are into uh, dream interpret interpretation. This is good, too. It, it presents me sort of as an expert, because I'm going to, uh, uh, it implies that I, I pay attention to my dreams. So it sort of shows that I have some depth. So, you know, it, it's interesting. It puts me in a good light. It's quotes. It's intrigue. Yes, back there. Right, it's, getting, it's touching that deeper place in her mind. For the reporter who wasn't here, I have this model of women that they have four levels of the mind. Remember, guys, we can review that. There's the get it done level where she keeps all her tasking, the things she's got to get done, balance her checkbook, etc. There's the social approval level of the mind where she's concerned about what her friends would think. There's the illusion of choice where she has her typical responses like, you're not my type, I don't do that kinky shit, etc., etc. And then there's like this place of fantasy exploration, the fourth level of the mind. And I guess dreams, really, in order to even begin to understand dreams, it awakens a little bit of this. Yes? yes. It's a way of putting things in quotes so it's safer to explore. It creates intrigue. It's an intriguing topic. Trust yes? Trust, trust say, say again? That's not a full sentence. You just said word, two words. Put it in a full trust. sentence. Yes, trust and acceptance is not a full sentence. Give me a sentence with a, I'm not making fun of you, but what are you saying? That this creates trust and acceptance? Huh? Oh, 
it's, I'm saying, it's, I'm saying, I'm being, it's demonstrating vulnerability, isn't it? I'm sharing something that's deeply vulnerable. I'm sharing a dream. And the dream is about a woman who I'm going to love, right? I, uh, this is, I've been dreaming about this woman who I'm really going to fall deeply in love with, right? So it's demonstrating vulnerability, right? Remember one of the vibes? And I think it creates a challenge. Wait a minute. He's talking about the energy of a woman he's going to love. May, do I fit into that? Do I not fit into that? So it's also throwing out a challenge, isn't it? Yeah? Oh, there's a sense of participation, too, because there's a sense of which I'm telling her this to try to get her opinion, right? So there's a little element of participation. I, I really have not stopped to analyze this at all. This is, a, this is sort of a learning on the fly. Yes. Yeah, that's true. It's sort of like creating a connection in the sense that I'm sure she's dreamed of at some point, either dreamed of the man she's wanted to meet or dreamed of dreaming of the man she's wanted to meet. So that's good, too. It's loaded with stuff, isn't it? So it starts out by me telling her that I had this, that I've been having these dreams about a woman. She's the same energy, but she looks different in every dream. But here's how it started. I had this dream where I'm looking for a place to live. I know you don't have to write it down word for word. I, I want to get your understanding about why you think it's working. I have this dream where I'm looking for a place to live. I guess that's a situation that people can identify with, right? And it's a metaphor for looking for a home emotionally. I don't know. And, and it says for lease. And I know I, don't, I shouldn't go in, but it was just so inviting I couldn't wait. So that's a good, you know, talking about how something's so inviting that you couldn't wait. And I go in there and obviously the place a woman has lived there. It's got the imprint of all that female energy. And she's a person with great passion. She's got these photographs. And it's clear from the dream that she's a photographer. And she's really good at her work. She loves what she does. So why would that be appealing to women? It's discussing the topic of passion. Good. It, it brings up the idea of passion. And also, I think it's hitting the challenge buttons, right? Oh. He wants a woman who's got a passion for her life. It's sort of, in a sense, it's like a giant, this whole dream, the first part of it, is like a giant screening mechanism, where in effect I'm saying that deep down in my soul, I'm looking for certain things in a woman that have nothing to do with her physical appearance. I think that's the essence of it right there, guys. I think the essence of it is the dream is saying, essentially the implied message is that I'm a person with standards and the woman I'm really going to deeply love, it's got nothing to do with her looks. Because I don't mention her looks in the dream, do I? It's just the qualities of energy. So it shows that, oh, deep in this guy's heart, he's screening. And he's also open to true love. So I'm open to true love, which makes me appealing. And I'm screening for non-physical things, which makes me a challenge. And it shows I have standards. Does that make sense? Yes. And then uh, I talk about how... She, I begin to say the things that I like about her, that first of all, she's not startled by something that's unknown. Instead, she's completely cool with it. She's grounded, and the unknown, the unexpected doesn't throw her. She's fine with it. And then I say, you know, she's got a passion for her life, and even though she's clearly in a hurry, she, and I don't belong there, she makes the time to make me feel welcome. That's an embedded command. When I say she makes the time to make me feel welcome, She's the kind of woman who sees that making this guy feel good is very feminine and appealing. That's it. So I am giving commands and suggestions, aren't I? Make this guy feel welcome, and I'm, am I saying who the guy is, right? Yeah, make me feel welcome. No, but I'm not saying it directly. I said this guy. You know, she knows it's, so I'm setting a standard for her, and I'm giving her a command to follow the standard. So I'm setting a standard, and I'm giving commands and suggestions to follow that standard. See, this just rolled out of my head. I didn't. I really did have this dream. I'm not making it up at all. That's brilliant. I didn't think of that. That's true. In the dream, she's totally, she's completely accepting of the fact that I've entered her inner world. 
there's a symbolic thing going on here as well, because her home represents her inner world, her deepest emotions, her private place. And at, while at first glance it seems that I don't belong there, she's actually completely comfortable with me being there to the point where she makes me want to feel even more comfortable. So that's a good metaphor. There's a metaphor in it too. Metaphorically, the metaphor of me entering into her home that belongs to her, the place where her passion is everywhere. And in fact, I've entered her place of deepest passions, even though she wasn't expecting it, and she feels okay with it and wants to make me even more welcome there. And in fact, says I can stay as long as I like without any commitment, because I call her when I want to. And she, oh, Jesus Christ, this is good. I hadn't thought, you're good. Yeah, there's a metaphor there that's very attractive, isn't there? I hadn't even thought of that. I really hadn't. So the metaphor is attractive. Yes? So if you're good, I did. Stay as long as you like. Leave when you wish. But that's what she says. Stay as long as you like. And call me, you know, call me. Uh, uh, it's available. For, she said in the dream, stay as long as you like. It's available for you. Just call me and let me know what you like to do. That's perfect. I'm not going to even, why would I bring up leave? Why would I even suggest it? No, why would I even want to suggest the possibility of my no longer wanting to be there? No, 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 doesn't work. I'm just telling you what I did dream. I'm not asking for suggestions on embellishing. I appreciate that. We're just analyzing why would I present works. So it's a good metaphor, too. That's very true, because in the dream, I'm there in her most private place, and she totally wants me to feel comfortable. I can stay as long as I like without any commitment. I call her when I want to, and she leaves. That's great. That's really good. No, because it's a dream. It's presented as a dream where it's all safe. And, uh, and the point is, and in fact, I'm telling her through the metaphor of the dream how to respond to it, that she's responding to it feeling great rather than running away. And in fact, she makes me comfortable by making a cup of tea. And I think talking about passion, she's got this passion in her life. You can tell she's really good at her passion. She takes great pride in what she does. That's setting challenge. That's this challenge. It's setting standards, remember? Yes? How do we think, like if I'm talking with a girl saying, oh, you know, I have this Let's dream. stick with this. Is it related to this right here, analyzing yeah. why this works? Go yeah, ahead, then. Please. I just want to think in a way where the right kind of machine language words will come into my head as I'm describing this dream. Right. I got you. I've got you. We'll get there. We'll get there. But there are some embedded commands in here and suggestions, aren't there? I hadn't thought about it in the way I convey it. The dream itself doesn't contain them. It's the way I describe it. And what else do I say in the dream? So she says, well, stay as long as you like, you know, and um, she makes me the cup of tea to make me feel comfortable. What else? In link to the pre-framing of her acceptance of your inner world, by giving you the cup of tea, she has to also demonstrate that she's accepting her. She That's accept, true. She That's true. In the dream, she takes some action to demonstrate her acceptance of me. So in effect, it's giving her sort of a metaphorical suggestion to show that she accepts me. And the cup of tea could be symbolic for her. Yes, but the cup of tea could, you know, he's not my cup of tea. He is my cup of tea. You ever heard that expression? Oh, yeah, he's my cup of tea. Right? And the cup could also represent the coochie slurper, right? It could. We're dealing with symbolism here, the world of the dream. Oh, you know what else I think? She's got a very small bag that she has behind her. So I think it, it affected saying she doesn't have a lot of baggage that she's bringing in. She's not carrying a huge thing. She's got a little, like, overnight bag. That's it. Not, so in effect, I'm saying metaphorically, I've got to be with a woman who has no real big baggage. Everyone has some baggage, you know. <laughs> yes. Right. Obviously, for some weird reason, she feels totally safe with me. So it's a suggestion to feel completely safe with me being in her deepest inner sanctum to the point where she wants me to stay and it is motivated to feel comfortable. Now, I know some of this also clearly, at least to me, the fact that she feels good making a man feel welcome, that that makes her feel more feminine, not less, is setting like a, it's, in effect, it's setting a hoop for her to jump through, saying, hey, 
I want to be with a woman who has no problem making a man feel welcome to her. That makes her feel more feminine, more powerful. So we're setting standards and offering suggestions how she would she behave. Yes. Yeah. What's that? The Bali book. What's that about? I don't know that book of photography about Bali. I guess it represents an exotic location. It represents she's escape, right? Successful. It represents Bali. You know, she's got a book of photographs that she took in Bali. I guess it represents she's successful. But also Bali, I guess, what comes to your mind, the island of Bali? It's romantic, yes. What else? James Bond. James Bond? Was he in Bali? <laughs> I don't know. But it's, it's, a, it's an exotic location, right? It, it rep escape, it represents escape. It's romantic. I mean, it didn't say, well, there's a book of, and the book had photographs of Newcastle. <laughs> Sorry for you people from Newcastle, but I heard it's not the prettiest place. It's like Elizabeth, New Jersey. You like this? Okay. So, and then, I used to just tell that, but then, here's the truth of it. I really did. Like a month ago, I figured, why don't I imagine I'm having the dream from the woman's perspective? Now, I think when I say to women, I say, but then I decide, you know what? I decided about a month ago, let's have the dream from the woman's perspective. Imagine I'm the woman having the dream. Now, I think as a hypnotist, you would see, I think that creates a dissociation. Now I'm telling a story about imagining having a dream from someone else's perspective. It creates a hypnotic dissociation. You understand what I'm saying? Like, are you the kind of person who can imagine listening to the story I'm about to tell? What? <laughs> Are you the kind of person who can imagine listening to the story I'm about to tell? In effect, I think it creates sort of a hypnotic dissociation. Do you think you're a hypnotist? So, so at that, well, when you create a hypnotic dissociation, there's a really deep trance, and there's no resistance to anything that you say. Can we write it word by word? That's just like a quote, then, isn't it? Well, the, it, it's deeper than a quote. A quote just backs off the communication. A hypnotic dissociation backs off the person. So they're now, like if I said to you, can you imagine being three feet behind your head listening to what I'm about to say? So it creates, you're a hypnotist, how would you explain a hypnotic dissociation? <coughs> Rather than actually being, the quote, being a quote, you're imagining being the person saying the quote, being the person who's actually thought of the quote in the first place. Yeah, it's, it, it creates a, a much more suggestible state. I hadn't thought of that. For me, when I did this, when I imagined having the dream perspective, I wanted to get more into that energy, the kind of woman who I would really deeply love, to assist me in more readily picking up that energy when I walked around. That's why I did it. And I'm not making this up. I really did all this. I really did have this dream, and I really did do this bit I'm about to describe. The beautiful thing about this pattern, it's 10,000% true. Not a word of it is made up. So when you give the dream perspective from the woman's point of, uh, point of view, you're reframing uh, <coughs> this perspective of that dream from a female point of view. Right. So that's right. reinforcing her feelings that she's totally safe and that you understand her and you get her. It could be. He's got another more subtle point. He's saying when I reframe it and imagine I'm having the dream from the woman's point of view, it's not just a dissociation hypnotically, but it's also showing that I understand how women feel about things. So it creates more trust. That's wicked. If, in effect, at the same time I'm hip deeply hypnotically dissociating her, I'm also doing it in a way where it creates even more a sense that she can trust that I'm a sensitive guy. That's really good. I hadn't thought about any of this. I didn't plan any of this. This was not pre-structured. It just rolled out of my head. And again, I'm not making any of this up. Every word of this is true. I really did have that dream, and I really did do this next bit. I'm not kidding. It's all true. Every word of it. Yes. Yeah, sorry, but the association so not only now have I got to imagine a uh, picture of Rossi's dream in my own head I've now got a picture of Rossi's imagination of himself as a woman having a dream in my own head yeah so it takes <laughs> any so what it effectively does is any aspect of the skeptical mind that would have been there is like 10 million miles away in in uh, in on Mars looking for water while the open minds going yeah 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 give me more so Right. As she's following along, she has to become what I describe and imagine and feel what I'm describing. That's right. Boy, I had no idea. My, this is rolled out of my head. 
I am, I, I, here's the thing. I was not in any way consciously being crafty. I really did have this dream on my cat's tails, I swear to you. And my cats are sacred to me. And I really did imagine the dream. So I, I say, okay, and then I imagine I'm the woman having the dream. So in my dream, I'm in a hurry. I'm coming back briefly because uh, I have to go back to the airport. And I have this place for lease, and I walk in the door, and there's this guy there. And rather than being frightened of this guy who wasn't even invited is there, I immediately feel comfortable. In fact, the first thing I notice is his innocence. I'm walk, I walk in, and I, he's looking at my art, and he's totally transfixed. And the first thing I get is the sense of this person's innocence. He's looking at it with the complete innocent eyes of a child. I think, oh my God, this is a totally innocent person. And then as I talk to him, and I show him around, I just feel this need to take care of him. I want to make him feel welcome in my home. So I fix him a cup of tea, and as I'm showing him around, he's really genuinely looking at my artwork. I don't get the sense that he's not hitting on me in any way. There's none of that at all, like none of it. He's genuinely in love with my work, and he sees it exactly the way I see it. He totally gets my art from my perspective, exactly as I create it from my own passion. It's like this guy totally gets me. He gets what's most important to me, and he gets it exactly right. And he's not even trying. And I can't believe how comfortable I feel with him. Now, that's pretty obvious. I'm describing, I'm giving her pretty much suggestions about feel comfortable with this guy. And I'm describing what it would be like if a guy saw your deepest passions from your perspective and totally understood what moves you most in your life, what would that feel like? You understand? I guess through telling it metaphorically from that position, it's safe for her to begin to imagine that, right? So what you're saying is from your own position, as if you're the woman. Yes. And you're saying I, so you're not actually doing an I, you shift. And right. It's I even deeper. It's like, wait a minute. I'm describing, she's sort of like now going along completely. And in order to understand the story, she has to imagine having the dream about me being in there and feeling totally comfortable with me and getting that I get her passion from the deepest level. So and she's I, actually investing more energy that way. She's investing a lot of energy, yes. So if you never analyzed it before, how did you come up with it in the first place? My unconscious mind dreamed it. I dreamed it. Actually, I swear on my mother's sacred memory who passed on April 29th, I'm not kidding, and on my cat's lives and on my ball sack, I and I, <laughs> if I'm in any way making this up, may I never have sex again even with my own hand. I mean it. <laughs> I'm telling you the absolute truth. I absolutely had that dream. And I think I had that dream because it reflects the wish of my heart. I think that's the kind of woman who I would really deeply fall in love with. I'm not kidding. Now, switching it, and I really did in my mind switch to imagine having the dream from her perspective. It's a gestalt therapy thing that I've done for a long time. I'm very much into my dreams, and I will often take on the different perspectives of different characters in my dream. Because my belief is that everything in your dream is just a split off reflect part of you that you've dissociated from. That's, so I do this anyway with dreams. So I think by talking about the dream from the perspective of the woman in my dream, I'm now having the dream from the perspective of the woman in my dream, which is a, I think that's a triple dissociation. So Ross, yeah. are you saying that instead of doing an IU shift, that is invariably more powerful? This is, in order to understand this story, she has to imagine being a woman, yeah. having this dream from the, from the perspective of a woman. In effect, she has to imagine dreaming about me coming into her deepest place and feeling totally comfortable and wanting to <laughs> welcome me there. And she also has to imagine what would it be like to encounter a man who sees her deepest passions exactly as she does, from a place of pure innocence. Right? Yeah. So I think part of the thing is, as I talk about it, is I'm describing what it would feel like from a woman's perspective to fall in love with me and why she should fall in love with me and what to notice about me that would make her fall in love with me. I'm directing her to experience me the way the woman in the dream experiences me. You understand? And it's totally safe. It's a double, I think it's like a triple dissociation. First of all, it's a dissociation because it's taking place in a dream. Second, it's a dissociation because it's happening from my perspective. And third, it's a dissociation because she has to imagine being the character in my dream, having the dream. So I think it's a quadruple dissociation. When you, when you create a dissociation, you create a trance, and the person is more likely to accept it. So it's one, two, three. It's four levels of dissociation where it's just going to slide right in. 
And the thing is, there's no conscious manipulation here, because I didn't think, okay, here's what I'm going to do. It just rolled out exactly as it rolled out. Now, I know some people are confused about dissociation. So rather than explain it, I'll have you experience it. Are you the kind of person who can imagine being outside, watching yourself, imagining having this kind of dream? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't track it consciously. So anyway, I talk about the fact. Then I say, you know what? I had to go. And I just I left him my card and said, you can call whenever you want. And I had to go, but I remember... As soon as I left on my way to the airport, I remember thinking, oh my God, I miss this man. I love that man. I miss this man. I have to see him again. And all the way on my trip, all I could think about was getting home to see him again. There was just something so compelling about his innocence and who, how he got me that I had to see him again. So now I'm telling her how to think about me when I'm not even around. So I have her imagining me in their place of deepest passion, Wanting me, to, wanting me to be there, welcoming me there, and then missing me and wanting more. Wow, that's pretty fucking good. And I do it through a quadruple dissociation. Yeah. Which is the ultimate in better command? Thinking about uh, you getting her to think about you, because in her mind, it says, this guy really gets me. Right. You know, this is it. This is, this is the one. This is the person who right. really understands really my deep right. soul. Right. So from that point of view, dreaming it from her point of view. It's, it's enforcing that, well, you know, this guy's not only had a dream about the story about going to the house, but he's also had it from my point of view. Yeah, so that's my whole point. Yeah, there's no resistance to it. Yeah. Just stepping back a bit where you say, um, and he's not even hitting on me. Yeah, that's good too. In the dream, there's no sense of me hitting on her because I'm not in the dream. So any thought in the back of her mind that I'm hitting on her through this drops completely. That's really wicked, isn't it? It's hugely wicked. You know when you're saying, I miss this wait, 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 that's very good. Hold on, I want to get to you. But that element where I say, hey, I don't get any sense that he's hitting on me. He's just completely, innocently loving my passion. That's fantastic because it depotentiates any desire on her part. Any response she may have had, like, yeah, this is a bullshit story, is completely depotentiated and drops. Because I'm telling her to, dis essentially I'm saying, look, Quadruple dissociate yourself. Dream the dream from the perspective of a woman dreaming about me. So dream the dream from the perspective of a woman dreaming about me, and here's all the responses you should have. You're filled with admiration as a professional hypnotist. <laughs> Are you not? But the thing is, here's the thing. Guys, I want you to get this. In no way is this any kind of something I constructed. This absolutely rolled out of my head. From my own dream that I really had, and I've had repetitive dreams about this woman. And she always, here's the thing, she always looks different. She always looks different. It's always a different scenario, but her energy absolutely is the same. I can feel her in the dream as being the same woman. That's also very good. From That's also very good, yes. From is describing it? that to a woman because you're not sort of making it look specific. Right. It's not look specific, so maybe she fits that pattern. And you know what also I think it does as I think about it? It touches, remember we talked about yesterday that boyfriend destroyer where you say, well, he, if you discover he's not with you in the way you truly want him to be. This I think is also touching that place in her mind where she thinks about how a guy would be with her in the way she truly would want a guy to be. It's in, a, in effect, it's a dream from that part of me that dreams about what it would be like if I were with a woman in the way I truly want her to be. So to match it, she has to like call deep into that place in her mind where she thinks about how she would like a man to truly be with her. So if there's a man in her life, I think it acts as a, a quadruply dissociated boyfriend destroyer. <laughs> this is like back, you know, it used to be in the era of nuclear missiles, they would only have one warhead. But then they came up with multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles where one missile could carry 10 hydrogen bombs and they could all, once it was in orbit, it would drop them in different locations all over the country. So I think it's like an ICBM with a MERV warhead. By the way, your answers are fantastic. It shows you're really understanding. Had I presented this at the opening evening, you wouldn't have gotten it. Yes. Because there's a man in that picture, it shows that you're comfortable around her being with other men. No, <laughs> that's not what it says. <laughs> no, did you say that there's a man in that picture? 
In which picture? Uh, in her dream. So there's a, there's a man. Oh, it's no. you. It's I'm the man. Oh. <laughs> I'm the man. I am the man. Yes, more contributions. I like this. See, this is mutual learning because I'm learning this as I go. I've never up until this moment stopped to even analyze this. I've just been using it. Yes, back there. I think it's also generally a very romantic way of meeting someone. Yeah, it is kind of romantic, isn't it? That's true. It's an unexpected meeting. It's sort of like something in a movie. It's not like you go out on a date. It's like here she is. She's going about her life. She probably is like coming from the airport, coming home briefly to pick something up and going back to the airport. She's busy with her life, and what happens? She walks in, and there's love right under her nose. You're right. It is deeply romantic, the, the whole thing, isn't it? Jesus Christ, I am a genius. Yes? I say, when, um, you guys are all really awake today. Give yourself a hand. I'm deeply proud of all of you. He's looking at me like I'm somewhere between Darth Vader, Hitler, and a giant turd. <laughs> so, Ross, uh, are you playing with a sense more apart from a romantic novel, playing with the fantasies? So that's the fourth level of her mind. Yeah, this is all going into the fourth level of her mind. Yeah. And also, we're, in order to understand this dream, because essentially this dream is about me connecting with a woman uh, who would be with me in the way I truly want her to be, and it's about her accidentally walking in and discovering someone who connects with her in the way she truly wants him to be. It's about unexpected, deep, connecting love. So it generates a fantasy. She will remember. If she walks away, she will remember it, whoever you're telling the story to. Oh, instantly. she will absolutely remember this and be thinking about it. This has got, this, women are like slipping in the puddles from so this. Anchor, <laughs> huh? Do you want to have an anchor with that? Could you develop an anchor? Do I, I don't need an anchor for this. Jesus Christ, I'm in the, I'm deep, 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 in the core of her unconscious mind, and she's picturing having this kind of connection with me, dude. You don't need to anchor that. You no, know, wait, wait, wait. Anchoring is all great. If you're getting surface level responses, by all means, anchor it. We'll do a little thing on anchoring. But you need to understand, in order to get this, now she's already, even the first part where I just tell my dream, she's getting pretty steamy. But now I've quadruply dissociated her, got her in the deepest level of her mind where she's thinking and, and telling her, how to perceive and respond. Plus, the whole theme is deeply romantic. Thank you about that. It is deeply romantic. It's got imagery of romance. Bali, this exciting. Uh, trust me. This is like, here's what you're saying. You're saying, OK, Ross, you're King Kong, and she's a mouse, and you've just put your full weight on her, and you want to make sure that you um, uh, uh, do something with the little bits that haven't been pulverized. This, that's a bad metaphor, because we're not doing anything to anybody. But, but you don't need to anchor this. Okay. Trust me. Also, she verbally participated at the same time. Or... No, uh, that, this is just it. It violates that rule because they don't have to verbally. Well, if you think, if you count, if you count, uh, as verbal <laughs> participation, yes, they're verbally participating. For us, there's also the idea that she's been searching outside of her home. You know, she's been to Bali, and when she finally gets home to her own place. That's, That's brilliant. Yeah. Jesus Christ, you guys are awake this morning. He said there's also the idea that she's been searching outside of herself. She's been to Bali and all over the world. And here it is in her own home, right under her. Huh? That's right. You mean I could have gone home to your giant cock all along? <laughs> yes, you had to discover it for yourself. You wouldn't have believed it. Um, wow, yeah, God Damn, you guys are teaching me. You really are. You guys are teaching me, and I'm thrilled. What a group. See, now, had I presented this Friday evening, would you have been able to participate? But look how much you actually understand, as opposed to what you thought. Look how much you're really getting it. These are excellent answers. Excellent answers. Yes? When you're saying, when, you're saying you know, when I miss this person, would that be an idea at that point, when you're in to break rapport? And say, well, when I feel his presence again, and then come back. No, 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 no. You Sorry. don't need to gild this lily. No. no. Wait, 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 wait. That little bit about missing him, you know where I think that came from? Because I've talked to women over the years about what's, what it's been like when they meet the guy they really love, and they talk about that kind of thing, that as soon as he went away, they missed him deeply. They just knew this was someone I had to be with. It's almost like you told me when you met your wife after having that first discussion, you just knew, right? Within minutes. 
So it's really, it's a fantastic, it really is. And the real clever bit is doing, is me having the dream from the woman's perspective but in my dream. They miss him when he's gone, not when he's there, they don't know. Well, when he's, you don't miss someone when they're there. No, like they don't know that this is the man. Well, well, no, in the dream from her perspective, she's saying I noticed his innocence and, I, and, and that he was seeing my passion completely as I got it. They miss him, yeah. So I, I just think it, it, this is working like crazy. It's working better than anything I've ever done. And twi I started experimenting with this in 1988, so that's nearly 20 years. So I guess we need to pay attention. But one of the elements that's in here that we haven't talked about is metaphor. Because when I talk about that Bali book on the table, it's a metaphor for adventure and discovery and excitement, isn't it? Yeah. And <clears throat> it really is. And so is the home. The home that contains her passion, the home of her passion. What is the home of her passion? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's her heart and, her, and her, her pussy. So that's a metaphor provided by my unconscious mind. When you dream... It's all presented in metaphor. The unconscious can't directly say what it's about. Yes. So can you flow from talking with her about this dream into, oh, yeah, by the way, a friend of mine was telling me this joke about Paris Hilton. No, you don't want to go to Paris. <laughs> 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 Look, you're not getting this. You're not getting this. I can smell them lubricating after doing this. They are lubricating from this. When their lower lip gets really big and their nipples are jutting out like Mount Olympus and you can see the lubrication on their jeans or you can smell it, you don't need to do anything more, but you take them by hand and you go, let's walk over here where it's a little quieter. Or you know what, why don't we go somewhere where we could focus in and really enjoy ourselves. End the story. You don't, you don't need to go talking about the joke about Paris <laughs> You're so cute. You're like one of my favorite students, <laughs> really, because you're so fucking funny. <laughs> did you guys, hold on. I'm sure the answer is yes, but did you get the Beavis and Butthead cartoon series yeah, yeah, yeah. in England? Did you get Beavis and Butthead? Was it popular here? Jonathan, was it popular here, Beavis and Butthead? Huh? Well, you remember, um, I think it was, uh, oh, hey, but, hey, Butthead. Oh, well, hey, Beavis. It was but Beavis. Uh, which was the guy with the blonde hair? Beavis. You know how Beavis would do, yeah, yeah, butthead, huh? Beavis would do cornholio. Remember, he would drink coffee and turn into cornholio. I, I'm co You're sort of like an Irish cornholio. I, I don't even know. I, 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 I don't even know whiskey. I, uh. You're like the Irish cornholio. You're, you I love you, dude. You're, you're my one of my favorites. Yes. <laughs> yes. Could you imagine to fractionate after the story and just go back, let her find the next topic or talk? Oh, you can fractionate after you tell the story. First of all, they're like, I must drink semen to survive. <laughs> Not me, them. You're liking this cameraman, aren't you? Like, this is the best job you've ever had. Yes. Uh, yeah, with the Don't you have to catch a coach? Uh, yeah, well, that's two minutes. Yeah, the yeah. whole fractionation thing, as Ross was in, intimating there, this this is the deal closer. Well, hold on. What would your train fare be if you both wanted to go back one way by train? Absolutely no idea. No idea. It's about 60 quid for us. 60, 50 quid for one way? Are you sure? Oh, yeah. 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 On the day, it is. On the day? Okay. Uh, what were you going to say? But um, but at this point, your fractionation is down, 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 down. It's what does that mean, like down, down, down? Off. You need to tell them oh, what that oh, means. You're going deeper and deeper and deeper. You, you've got metaphors within metaphors here. You know, you're stepping inside a cottage. You're looking at uh, this uh, photo book of Bali. That's a metaphor in itself. And then you're disassociating here and going into someone else's dream. You, you're yeah. going deeper, deeper, deeper. So you're fractionated in and out, in and out, in and out. Then, boom, that's it. Game over for her, really. Zero. No, game okay, starts on, with yeah. her. Game <laughs> on. Bless her, yeah. Bless her heart. Now, here's the thing. Here's the other thing. If a woman is not open to these kind of connections and she just wants to get banged and treated like a piece of meat, she won't respond to this. She'll, oh, be, no. she'll sit there and go, eh, eh. So it's a good screen. If you do this thing and she's like, eh, then you know walk away from her or send her to mystery method because those guys <laughs> teach women. Okay? Because they want, they're dealing with women who aren't open to this shit and want to be abused. So if she doesn't respond well to this, it means she doesn't really... That part of her is just shut down and closed, 
and she's looking for someone to treat her badly, so walk away from her. We don't deal with women. We want women who are really open. And this is a good screen, too, yes. Okay, there's a part where you walk into the cottage. Right. At first, she's not there, right? right. And then you look around. Right. Now, what does she do when she enters the room? What happens? When she walks in, she's not, like, shocked or angry or scared. She goes, oh, can I help you? Like, she's completely okay with it. She doesn't miss a beat. She's grounded in herself and is not scared. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being on course. We'll talk to you soon. Give those guys a hand. They're going to be teaching. I know. See, Declan, he's a professional hypnotist. He's going to be on that coach going, fuck. Thank you. Have fun. Have fun with your wife. He got married after like a week of knowing her. You know what else I think about this dream is it has its own momentum. It's like it's irresistible and it's inevitable. The dream, in the dream, there's an element of inevitability. Like she's not like she can control it. It's just happened, you know. So I think that all the elements come together here, real powerful. The only thing that's not here is she's not verbally participating. You know, she's not answering back or saying it. Yes. Someone raised their hand. Yes, sir. Three bears. What? It's a bit like the three bears who's been eating my porridge. I don't know if it's a dream about me eating her porridge, but I guess. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like. I, Yeah, they discover someone who's been sleeping in my bed. Yeah. Yes, that's very good. It sort of has a fairy tale element in it, doesn't it? Like, you come home and there's someone there like, oh, who's been sleeping in my bed? That's very true. Yes? Although she isn't actually verbally uh, coming back to you or buying into it, she is buying into it inside what she's thinking, what you're telling her. Right. She's imagining it, although she's right. actually doing it. Now, I'm not going to whip this out the first, yes, very true, very good. I'm not going to whip this out the first minute I'm talking to her. But you could, introduce, how would you introduce this? What, what, do you believe in dreams, or do you think dreams are interesting? I had this the most, I was listening to this guy who told me about this dream he had, and it goes like this. And then you could actually put the whole thing in quotes. So now you've got a quintuple dissociation. Ross, you are like the fractionation. You're not actually fractionating here. You're really going... But I am fractionating her. Here's how I fractionate her. Because I'm just, well, in a sense, yes, I am fractionating her. Because I'm fractionating her among different perspectives. It's another way to fractionate. If you can get someone to imagine something from their perspective, and then from your perspective, and then from the perspective of a third party, that's fractionating because you're going back and forth between what view they're taking of it. That's a different form of fractionation. You understand? Yeah. I mean, you got somebody. Are you paying attention to your feet, 20%? <laughs> Did anyone remind him last night? Who reminded him? Keep doing it. <laughs> when you're getting somebody that's open, are willing to talk with you on these topics, you get instant rapport. You don't have to build it up with them because they're already with you on this. Well, at least I don't confuse curiosity with rapport. They're not the same. Someone could be curious and not in rapport with you. Someone could be in rapport with you and not be curious. Rapport is just a sense of an unconscious connection. It's an unconscious feeling of unconscious connection, that the unconscious minds of the two people are resonate, resonant together. You can, have, you can have rapport with someone and not like them. And they could be actively disliking you and still be in rapport. So this fr fractionation, what exactly is it? Fractionation is moving back and forth between two or more things. You can fractionate different vibes. You can fractionate different visual perspectives. You can fractionate whether you're paying attention or not paying attention. I'm trying to get you to learn to fractionate the, your communication. Your communication is all 100%. Did you guys see Spinal Tap? Yeah. This is Spinal Tap. And in this, the movie, this is Spinal Tap. Their, their amplifiers go to 11, right? Uh, I'll just go to 11. Well, why don't you just go to 10 and make 10 louder? Because I'll just go to 11. <laughs> you're like Spinal Tap. Your amplifier, your intensity amplifier is always on 11. I would like to teach you to fractionate 
the intensity with which you communicate. Sometimes communicate at 11, but other times communicate at 5 or 1. To go back and forth between levels of intensity would be the ultimate fractionation for you. Do you get me? And also fractionate the speed at which you process life. You're processing so quickly that you can't possibly extract maximum information because everything's flying by. So you could try to speed up the world to match you, or you could fucking slow down. And I know how to slow down. Like, just, you can like the 20% go towards. That's right. That will do more for you than any specific language pattern will do. Because it's your major issue in terms of <coughs> understanding the people you're talking to, because you're spinning so quickly in your head, you're not picking up the information. And also, you're speaking so quickly with so much intensity, you're literally overloading their ability to be to want to listen to you. Now, I'm able to handle you because I'm a professional. I know how to like shunt it off to the side and extract out what you really need to know. But unless you're talking to someone who's taught thousands of people and is deeply trained in meditation, NLP, hypnosis, and other things you won't discuss, you're not going to do too well with people. That explains why your skill, career, and everything. I was on the, the outside not wanted kind of well, no, that's because you're an asshole and no one likes you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You see, with someone like this, if you slap him really hard, they enjoy it as much as if you caress him. And I'm not about to caress him. No, I'm teasing. You know, I'm teasing. I like it. This is my, I'm matching him because he, he likes taking the piss. So, right? So, part of my job as a teacher is to take your attention away from what you've been habitually focusing on in a way that doesn't serve you and redirect it to the real element that will make a difference for you. Is this will make such a big difference for you, uh, you won't recognize how good, uh, you won't recognize it. Six months from now, you'll look around the life you're having with all the things that used to be just outside your reach. Because I know you're the kind of person who, who gets in situations where it's just within your grasp and it seems to be either pulled away or you slip at the last moment or it slips outside your fingers. Is that true? Yeah. Now, that's a metaphoric way of, of understanding him. Did I describe any of the specific situations or events? No. But by communicating him through that metaphor, have you ever thought of that? Has that been your own metaphor? Yeah. Have you ever metaphorically thought that things slipped from your grasp at the last minute? Have you? Yeah. Yeah. So I pulled his own metaphor from his head. Because watching him and, and putting aside myself and getting rapport with him, I can see his own metaphors. I know that he's thought of life at times as being he gets this close and he, he it gets pulled away or you slip, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of yourself as someone who slips? Yeah, I've all, yeah. Yes. I've consistently tell myself I'm within touching distance. Before. Yes. That's see, it. now he didn't tell me this before, but I picked up the metaphor because I'm so in rapport with him. I can understand his metaphorical world. When you can understand other people's, look here. This is really powerful. People don't resist their own metaphors because metaphors are the deepest way that people speak to themselves and they organize all the other subcommunications that people have with themselves and how they perceive their world. So if you can pick up on other people's metaphors, then it's an incredibly powerful personal tool. Now often, <clears throat> if you pay attention, you can pick up the metaphor. He didn't say it. I picked it up because I've, I've trained myself to do it. But if you read, for example, women's online profiles, they'll give you their metaphors. And I've given you some of my personal metaphors, but you haven't listened. You haven't listened. One way to detect people's metaphors is what they speak about over and over again with a lot of enthusiasm. They will tend to organize other elements of their lives around that metaphor. Now, what have I spoken about to you all weekend? Cats. That's right. If you could say, if you could talk to me about cats or couch things, you know, um, if you said, you know, Ross, uh, I don't know if you could strut along this fence when you strut along the fence of this idea, or, or, um, I, if you could somehow weave. When you think about cats, what are some of the images and words that come to your mind? Somebody. Furry, what? M well, milk, what else? <laughs> Furry, what else? Purring, purring. purring, playing with string. Mouse. Mouse. Hair balls. Hair balls. <laughs> Who said smelly? 
<laughs> You're right out. Out. I, my loves are cats, aviation, right? If you could say, you know, let's, I don't know if, um, let me give you an idea of see if, see if you can bring it in for a landing. I would go, what is it? Forget it, because I'm, I'm forewarned is forearmed. But you understand? So in his case, I know. I just know. Also, there's something in his movements that told me that uh, something, I don't know how I knew, but I picked it up. So one of the things in this dream that makes it powerful is there's a lot of metaphors in it. The home, where she has her passions, the place of her passions. That represents the heart and the vagina. The cup of tea, oh, he's my cup of tea. Have you ever heard that expression? <clears throat> Common folk sayings like a stitch in time saves nine, that's a metaphor for something. They're not really talking about needles and stitches, right? So one way to learn about metaphor is to write down common slogans. Uh, if it, do you have this one in Britain? If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? What does that really mean? Is it about ducks? What is, can someone tell me what that means? Say again? If something has the surface characteristics of something, it probably is that. Someone else can tell me what that met metaphor means? Interesting enough, cultures have metaphors that contradict. Which is more true? If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, or don't judge a book by its cover. Which one is true? Don't judge a book by its cover. But if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> right. So here's my point. Listen. One of the things that makes dreams, the whole thing about this dream is there's a lot of metaphors in there, isn't it? And there's a lot of romantic themes. That's right. Bali is a romantic thing, a romantic getaway. The fact that here she is traveling around the world doing her thing, and love is right there when she comes home. And it happens unexpected. She's not expecting it. She's just coming home from the airport, and there it is, right there in front of her. It's effortless, yeah. There's a lot of good metaphor in there. Are you enjoying this? No, you, Mr. Beard Guy. Are you getting any of this? You look confused. <laughs> All right. Do we need to change tapes? Ross, I got a new Do we need, Mike, are we changing? Three minutes, okay. You should have a go fraction at yourself. What? <laughs> oh, that would be a great shirt. Go fraction at yourself. That's brilliant. You get lunch with me. That's brilliant. I'm going to make up Ross Jeffries t-shirts. I'd rather be sergeant. Go, go fraction at yourself. I'm, in, I'm there in the fourth level of your mind. <laughs> in the fourth level, your mind. Um, uh, AFCs beware. <laughs> I'm a, I should have arrows pointing down to like my crotch and said, danger, wide load. <laughs> Very good. I like it. He's, I got sharp students. Oh, that's very good. How do you change your metaphors to change yourself? Well, you know, I'm joking around. I'm giving you metaphors for war. This is like a nuclear missile. I really don't think of it that way. I think of it more as a, a my metaphors for sarging are more like, it's more like a, a dance. Or it's more like a dog fight, a play dog fight. It's like Top Gun. Did you ever see Top Gun? Top Gun School? It's, you're all on the same side in Top Gun School, but you joust with each other in the air to develop your tactics. So for me, sarging is very much, here's one of my metaphors. Remember I told you I like aviation? I like flying? For me, it's Top Gun School. It's not a real actual dogfight. A real dogfight, you're enemies, and you're trying to hurt the other guy, right? For me, it's Top Gun School. You're on the same side, and you're practicing tactics. So for me, when I sarge a woman, we're on the same side. We may dance and wheel around each other to see who's got that like persuasive advantage, right? And the elements are there, because in a dogfight, you need to have situational awareness. You need to be able to be aware of what's going on. You need to know the relative strengths of your aircraft and the relative weaknesses uh, <clears throat> in relation to the person you're jousting with. For example, this, uh, I'm going to get off this metaphor very quickly, but in, um, 
In the Vietnam War, primarily, it was the F-4 Phantom. This was the MiG-17 and the MiG-21. Now, the thing about the F-4 Phantom is the F-4 Phantom was big, heavy aircraft, twin engines, twin engine thing, and it had tremendous ability to climb because of those twin engines, so it was very good in a vertical fight, had a lot of power, and flat out speed. It could pop those afterburners and do Mach 2. The MiG-17 wasn't nearly so fast. It had a single engine, but in horizontal, it could turn like a motherfucker. So if you're in an F-4, you don't want to get into this kind of turning fight because the MiG's going to outturn you and get on your 6 o'clock and shoot you down. So if you were in F-4 and the MiG tried to get you into a turning fight, you wouldn't do that. Instead, you would go, you would go vertical. You would go up like this, and so when he's turning, you'd zoom back around and dive down on him. So <clears throat> my point being that when you're sergeant, you have to get a relative idea of what they can do and what you can do and how they can turn and where you can and where you are relative to them at every point. Yes? Because in a dogfight what you want to do, ideally in a dogfight what you want to do is they're over here a hundred miles away. Shoot, you've got your radar, they can't even see you yet, and you just pop them with a you pop them with a missile that's all aspect. There are um, there are air to air missiles where you don't have to be behind the other guy. You can get them from any angle. But once you get close, that, that advantage is negated. If they can get inside that then you have to get into a turning thing, right? So it's a metaphor. It's not really literally true, but it's part of how I organize my thinking. I'll give you some, some sexual metaphor. I can give you some sexual languaging. I will in a minute. That will be my next module. But, so this is one of my metaphors, a dogfight. Have you guys seen this show, Dogfights? Do you get it here in Britain? It, do you get it? It's on the, what channel is it on? The History Channel? You're American, right? You don't get it here in Britain? Oh, fuck, it's fantastic. It's my favorite show. They have dogfights from different eras, like World War I. They recreate it with computer animation that's so realistic, it's fantastic. I love that show. So, but it's, it's an interesting metaphor because you have to know the range of your weapon. You have to have the ability to detect the other guy. You have to be able to predict, based on what you know they can do, where they're going to make their turn so you can lead it and be there ahead of them. It's, a, it's a, one of my metaphors. Is dog, but the other one... <coughs> is sparring, but not really hurting the other person. Uh, anyone willing to be on camera for a minute? Somebody? Yeah, come here a minute. I often will do this with women as a game. I will do this with women. It's really cool. Stand over here. Come here. Put your, put your forearm out like this. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Put your, put your hand, open your hand. Face it that way. Okay, here's the name of the game. The name of the game is don't resist. Don't ever push against me. Don't push against me, but don't lose contact either. Okay? Don't push against me. Oh, you're resisting. No pushing against me and no losing contact. Get it? So I'll play this game with Luna. I'll say, hey, you want to see something really cool? It'll be like within five minutes of talking to him. Let me show you. Put your arm out like this. Okay? Now, if you put, imagine putting your mind in your belly. You'll be able to do this a lot better. And by the way, I don't necessarily have to lead. You can be the one in the lead. I'll follow you without resisting, without letting go in any way. By the way, if you find you loosen your wrist, it makes it easier. And when you start doing this with someone, you begin to develop a rhythm with them, right? Because there's no resistance. I'm not pushing against them, but I'm not resisting either. Are you feeling any resistance from me when you push? You can do the leading. Push. I left for some moments. And you also get an idea of where the person's on balance and off balance. See? You get an idea of where, if you wanted to push, you can push them off. What? If no one's resisting or no one's leading, how can someone lead if no one's resisting? Come here. Sit down. Come here. No, but no. No, but this is my metaphor. Metaphorically, when I meet a woman, even though I'm not really doing the... Metaphorically, even though I'm not really doing this, in my mind I'm doing it. I'm getting a sense of where she resists and where she's open, right? Put your forearm out like this. Relax your wrist. Okay, face your hand towards your face. Okay, so don't let go. Take your hand out of your pocket. Don't let go, but don't push against me either, okay? If you let go, you lose. If you lose contact, then the game is over. <laughs> See? 
And by the way, you can lead too. I'll follow you. I don't have to be the one to set all the movement. See, it gets to the point where you can't really tell who's leading and who's following, right? Mm -hmm. And you also see where the person is a little off balance. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's just an adaptation of it. It's a really bizarre, bad adaptation of push yeah, hands. I see what you mean. See? <laughs> Go have a seat. But you can actually play this game with women too. Because it puts you in a, it's like a physical metaphor for rapport. But in my mind, this is what I'm doing. I'm sort of like getting a feel, okay, where do they take the lead? Where, if, I, if I come here, will they resist and push against me? Or will they flow with it? If they flow with it, then I'll go there and then I'll move them there. So that's one of my metaphors too, sort of like push hands. It's like a, a, a Tai Chi game where I'm, okay, I'm sparring with them a little bit. Another metaphor of mine is you ever watch two really good fighters, two really good boxers who deeply respect each other? The first couple of rounds, they're not going to come out with everything they got. They're going to like test the other guy, see what the rhythm is, right? They're, and they're trying to loosen the other guy up to see, okay, where, let me get him a little loose here, see where he's got an opening. Let me test, let me test. And also when I'm teaching, the first hour when I'm teaching, I'm shaking people. What I'm really doing that first hour, Friday night, is I was shaking everybody. In my mind, I'm shaking everyone. I'm shaking you with laughter. I'm shaking you with dropping little tidbits about what you're going to learn. I'm shaking you by hitting you over your head with a huge concept. I'm shaking you because I want to loosen you up. I want to take the grip of your habitual way of thinking and loosen it and loosen it and loosen it and then back off. And then I come and I shake you again so you're a little looser. And then I back off. And then I shake you again. And, you know, and then... Boom. Once I've got you really shook, where it's at a critical mass, I'll hit you really hard and the, everything that got in the way will drop. Uh, another metaphor I had, you've heard me say it three or four times this weekend. What have I talked about? It has to do with mountains and snowballs. What have I talked about? Oh, yeah. avalanche. 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 One of my metaphors is an avalanche. What have I said to you about avalanches? Giving us a key point. Then. That's right. You don't, and what else did I say in the magic seminar? I said knowing where to... Tap. That's one of my metaphors, too, is that you've got all this plumbing, and you've got to fix it, and you've got a little hammer. If you know where to tap, you don't have to worry about having a huge hammer or hitting it over or over. You just know where to tap. So part of my metaphor of dealing with women is knowing where to tap. Look, I'm looking for the, where's the tapping point. The metaphor I gave you about avalanches, I said to create an avalanche, you don't have to shake the whole mountain, do you? Now, am I really talking about avalanches and mountains? What am I talking about? And instinctively, you know, when I say, in order to create an avalanche, you don't have to shake the whole mountain. Am I talking about, what am I talking about? It's the right impact of a woman's mind. I'm talking about having a huge impact with women, aren't I? You don't need to shake the whole mountain. You just have to know where to start that snowball rolling. Because then, through its own momentum and natural law, through its own mass, through its own initial mass and in the right direction, and through vibration and gravity and natural law, it will shake the mountain on its own, won't it? This is my metaphor for speed seduction. Mystery method wants you to build a fucking snowman from the bottom up and roll it to the top of the hill. <laughs> that and dating. That's dating and mystery method. They want you to fucking build that fucking snowman and push it and push it and push it by demonstrating your value till you get to the top of the hill. And then you get to make an ice cream cone and lick it. I'm going, no, no. No, no. You help them form that initial snowball and give a little push, and as it goes down the hill in the right way, it will create the avalanche from its own mass. So in effect, women's own responses are the snowball. Your initial little bit of sarging is like that little pat, and then it rolls down through her levels of the mind and creates the avalanche for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's another example of a metaphor. I'm not really talking about avalanches. So dog fighting is a metaphor I use, um, this little Tai Chi game, sparring, avalanches. They're all metaphors I'm presenting to you, so you get it before you get it. Yes? So how can we find our own metaphors like you found? Look at your dreams. Look at your dreams. Write your dreams out, and over time, you will see common themes. One of the common themes in my dreams is my car. I'll dream that I can't find my car, that I've lost it. Where's my car? Where's my car? And now that I have uh, OnStar, 
it's no like OnStar is going to stop working in January, but you can call OnStar and, and say, you know, they'll locate their, your car for you. But for me, that's a metaphor. What is a car? Well, a car is my drive, right? So when I lose my car, it means I've temporarily lost my enthusiasm or my motivation. I have to fight it. For me, it represents my drive. This so watch your dreams, but there's some really good books you can get. I recommend a book called <clears throat> uh, Phoenix, The Therapeutic Patterns of Milton Erickson. Phoenix, The Therapeutic Patterns of Milton Erickson by David Gordon. It's not about metaphor per se, but you can see Erickson's metaphors at work. Phoenix, The Therapeutic Patterns of Milton Erickson. It's by David Gordon. And David Gordon also has a book called Therapeutic Metaphors. So I recommend that book. I also recommend a book, because it does deal with metaphors, there's a book called Hypnosis and the Treatment of Depression by Michael Yapko. He would be appalled to hear me mention his name at one of my seminars, but Y-A-P-K-O. So the first book is Phoenix, The Therapeutic Patterns of Milton Erickson by David Gordon. The second book is called Therapeutic Metaphors by David Gordon. Oh, here's a really good one. What am I thinking? The king of metaphor of all time, Carl Jung. Get any book by Carl Jung, but I recommend Man and His Symbols by Carl Jung. J-U-N-G. Carl Jung. You ought to know he was fucking Austrian. Swiss, was he? Carl Jung. Hold on, slow down. Man and His Symbols by Carl Jung. But Carl Jung had plenty of books on symbology and... His whole thing was about um, the, uh, what did he call it? The collective unconscious. Any book on mythology. Get any book you want on, on mythology. Get Joseph Campbell's books on myth and mythology. Anything by, jo hold on. Anything by Joseph Campbell, his books on myth, man and his myth, man and his, uh, any books by Joseph Campbell. Because when you look at myth, those are essentially metaphors that come from the deep unconscious. Yes? Is there anything you can recommend if you can't remember your dreams? Or if there... Hold on, wait. Let me stay on this. So the books are... Which one was Yafko? Yafko is uh, Hypnosis and the Treatment of Depression. I only say that because a lot of his transinductions contain metaphors for healing, and he talks about those metaphors. Say again? He says Jung wrote a book called Memories. Memories or Metaphors? Memories, Dreams, and Reflections by Carl Jung. Who had ever thought that you would teach guys about Jung and mythology and the collective unconscious to get laid? But it's quite powerful. You see how they'll go anywhere I take them because they, they see the connection. Do you not? Now, I'm quite happy with this because... This is the perfect thing to show you this morning as an example of real powerful patterning that doesn't quite exactly fit the model I presented to you and that required no effort. It just rolled out of my head. Now, some of you, did you get all those titles? Carl Jung. I know um, some of you are still a little bit confused because I was talking about dissociation. What did I mean by that? Anyone have some, some, something you need cleared up around this topic of dissociation? It's not something I plan to discuss, and you don't need to know it, but did you not get that? Quite well, quite the highest standard is to try and simplify any experiences that we have. We often recall and remember from our own like, line of sight, like we're within our own body. So dissociation is simply trying to remember that experience, but stepping outside of our body and watching ourselves. Yes, that's one definition of dissociation. One definition of dissociation is how you view imagery in your mind. 
You can view imagery from your, actually like you're looking out through your own eyes so you don't see your body. That's associated. Dissociated imagery is imagery where you see yourself. You actually see a picture of yourself watching the experience. That's one aspect. And the way in which I was referring to it, you're actually taking on another person's perspective. So in the dream, for example, when I tell her that I'm having the dream from the perspective of the woman, she now has to imagine that she's a woman in the dream having the dream. So it's like a triple dissociation. When people are dissociated, it creates a profound hypnotic effect, and anything you say tends to slide in. Now, notice it was not my intent in doing this. Uh, it just naturally f rolled out of how I know how to do things. Yeah. Now, I should also say something else. I opened up this seminar by telling a story about a bear. Remember the two granola loving guys in the woods and the bear? And I said, you don't need to outrun the bear that this is an extreme example of patterning, very extreme. I tend, to ex I tend to learn at the extremes, and I tend to explore at the extremes. I want to push the envelope. One of my favorite movies, here's another way you can find out people's um, metaphors. Say, well, well, give me three of your favorite movies. What were three of your favorite movies? And invariably, they're not just favorite movies because they like the action. Whether they know it or not, those movies have metaphors that deeply touch them. Star Wars is loaded with mythology and metaphor. But one of my favorite movies is The Right Stuff. Did anybody see The Right Stuff? It was a movie about test pilots. And one of the things they talked about constantly in that movie is push the envelope. Push the envelope. The envelope is the flight performance. Of the, it describes what the aircraft can do. They're always pushing the envelope. Now, this is an example of pushing the envelope to the extreme. It's taking that aircraft to the bare limits right before its wings will tear off. You don't need to do this. Like I said, all you have to do is just be a little bit more. All you have to do is know how to fractionate among the vibes. We're going to get into some vibes and patterns this afternoon. All you have to do is know how to control your energy and know a little bit more than the average guy, and you'll do really well. You don't need to clonk them over the head with my quadruple dissociative dream pattern. <laughs> Just, I was reading recently when you say my tempo is up at 11, that's now I'm starting to think why you can put me in a nightclub and on comes the song, and as soon as I, the beat comes then, I go into jelly body and I can't pronounce or remember one word and you can give me that song a hundred times and I still don't know the words because the whole beat thing takes over and I'm thinking now that the beat thing pushes me energy up to 11 where it's sort of now addicted and set and now I'm pushing it back down so I can process this knowledge. That was the cocaine guy. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see me fuck with this guy a little bit? Yeah. Yes. Stand right over there. Stand right over there. Count two squares down. Stand. No. Move that right. Move, move your foot over. Stand right there. Now, <laughs> this guy's an open book. Because he's doing this, right? Notice his gestures. Tell me again about being in the club. The way you, Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if, if I go into a nightclub and something like Club Tropicana from George Michael comes on. <laughs> yeah. The beat. Yeah. I have a friend with me. Now watch this. Stop. I want you to imagine telling this story, but don't let any sound come out of your mouth. <laughs> so here's what I mean, like this. Look here. It would be like, do all your gestures and talk, but don't let any sound actually come out. Move your mouth and everything, but don't. Yeah, just do it. That's why. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> now, you know where he'd have a great job? As an interpreter for the deaf. Because <laughs> he's so fucking expressive. But you notice what he does with his gestures. What is he doing here? He's taking his images and he's pushing them all around. He's taking his visual imagery. Look, here's what you do. You're going. 
you got all these images and you're pushing them all fucking over the place. And it's confusing other people because unconsciously they're in rapport with you and they're trying to follow all your pictures going. <laughs> and pretty soon they're, oh, I feel nauseous. Blah. <laughs> so watch. I'm not making funny. I'm no, trying to no, help no, you. No, no, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, he likes the attention. So what I would like you to do is practice telling the same story that keeps your gestures all right here. So you can talk out loud now, but keep your gestures right here. Right? Tell the story. So if I go into a nightclub, it doesn't matter where the nightclub is. When it comes to spelling and reading, I'm not very good. So when music comes on that I like, I can never ring up the radio station and tell the DJ to replay the song because I don't really know the words in the song because the energy and the beat takes over and it hits me hard and my feelings and my emotions and I switch into autopilot mode. And the actual words go straight over my head. Now, was it easier to comprehend what he said when yes. he put, Because people want to understand you, but you're like, oh, but I would even, but I mean, you're taking all their imagery. I'll give you a hint about people. People don't just have their images in their head. People subjectively, whether they're aware of it or not, project their imagery out here. So when you're, they're trying to follow you, you're inadvertently grabbing their images and scrambling their ability to follow you. So you're scrambling them by how fast you're going, the level of intensity you're putting in, and by taking their images and moving them around when they're trying to understand you. So not only do you need to fractionate with the level of intensity, but keep your gestures here. Because when you're all around up here, you can keep them here or here. But when you start anything, let me give you a clue. Any gesture above your shoulder, any, put your arm out like this. You sweat a lot, man. Any gesture above your shoulder is going to confuse people. Right. Right? That's the, so tell the story again as much as you like, but keep your gestures no higher than your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Tell it again. Well, i got to say the story is Sorry. basic. Even from school as a little boy, the teacher can talk, but it just, there's other stuff going on in my head. It might be music, it might be a movie, and again, if I'm at home listening to the radio, and a good tune comes on, and I like it, and I would love to hear that song again because it really gets me going. But the actual words in the song and the name of it are gone over my head. It's even easy to understand him, right? <laughs> now, put your arms. I want to make a distinction. I'm not teaching him alpha male body language. This is not. Uh, real shithead dunder, real shitty dunderheads, right? <laughs> or misery method. Whether, I'm not teaching you body language. I'm teaching you about what your gestures do for you energetically. Now, you notice how it's easier for you to stay calm when you keep your arms uh, no higher than shoulder, right? Isn't it? Because the minute you raise them up here, it actually takes your energy out from the rest of your body and puts it up into your head. Watch. Start to tell a story from up here. Tell, start telling stories from the way you used to. Go. Tell a story about something really exciting, the way you used to. Tell a story about anything. I don't care. You're in the club and the music's moving you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, though, because I prefer I'm more persuasive and communicative like this. Ah. <laughs> see, now we see rapid personal change, Mr. Skeptical Reporter, who thinks I'm a scumbag. <laughs> see? That's pretty amazing. He didn't have to sit in therapy for 15 years and cry about his mommy. Well, I'm this way because I witnessed a sexual act between me father and a goat. And you see? And it, and it charged my body with all this manic energy. And now I'm... It wasn't a goat. It was a sheep. Get it right. Uh, but see, now I want you... Here's the thing. He'd make a... Are you, do you have nephews or nieces? Yeah. I bet you're the favorite uncle. <laughs> yeah. Is that true? Well, yeah. I like playing on the trampoline with them. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Are you the favorite uncle? Perhaps. Yeah. He'd make a fucking fun, nutty uncle, wouldn't he? He'd be the <laughs> ultimate. I want you to have the ability to turn this on when it's appropriate. I don't want you to... See, the name of the game is not about being calm or manic. The name of the game is choice and freedom. So... I want you, I truly, seriously, I'm not kidding, as, on my word as a teacher, I want you to have the choice to be 
up in here and crazy. When you're dancing, I don't want you to be here. I want you to be crazy and a spastic. You know, that's why we love you. You know, our little Irish spaz. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously, I want you to be able to show us how you, if you, if it was appropriate and you want to make the choice, how would you go back to being all nuts? Show me. I'm not being facetious. Go ahead. I want you to turn if, it back on. If before I identified this stuff, I'd go out and I'd be just talking with my hands, I'd be kind of like Tony Montana and Scarface, I'd be just like, <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she says to me, she says, uh, you know, we can be friends, I'm just like this with my hand, no fucking way, no fucking way, I want more. Like that. I'm talking really fast, but I can feel like the, the killer bays in the television. <laughs> there he goes, he's starting to speed up, see? <laughs> see? See? Now, I don't want to take his choice away because his energy is delightful. You're the kind of person who could walk into a crowded room and light up the party. Why in the world would I want to take that away? It would be like defacing a, Mona, uh, defacing a Da Vinci. I don't want to do that. But I want to give you the choice when you want to persuade people and make a connection to be here. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So show me how you talk from here. Yeah, so like I say, when <laughs> now, that's perfectly. Now, he just went from being utterly incomprehensible and completely a whirlwind of, of confusion generation to being perfectly persuasive. Did you get what he said? He's actually charming and witty and utterly persuasive when he controls it. Now, that's fractionation for you, the ability to fractionate your speed and your intensity so you can speed it up when you want to and slow down when you want to. That alone, see, I know as a teacher that oftentimes what people come in and ask for is not what they really need. Because what they're asking for is being conditioned by the stuck way they're seeing the problem in the first place. They want to keep the blinders on. They just want to be able to look over here instead of over here. And my job as a teacher is to go, no, that's not where you really need to change. You need to change here. That's why I get paid the big bucks. <sighs> See? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. That's a profound change for him. Now, a good drill for you is to practice, to practice slowing down and speeding up and where you put your gestures. And also, energetically, he's much more grounded here, isn't he? He presents himself as, gr as grounded, hard to push over mentally or physically, and someone who's really solid and steady. A woman could walk with him hanging on his arm and feel totally safe walking down the street knowing that he, they're not going to get pushed over by anything that happens. You, here, you present here as being very solid, very grounded. That's almost a little mean. So put a <laughs> smile on your face. See? Now that's solid, grounded, friendly, open. That's got all the vibes mixed together. He's listening so he can receive. He can be vulnerable. He can be strong. And he can be playful. He's got it all right there. And when he wants to turn it up and be playful, he just moves your arm, his arms up like that and speeds it up a little bit and he's there. <laughs> Now, here's the really cool thing, that this isn't just going to have profound impact with his sergeant, with his getting women, because it will, but this will improve his ability to communicate with every human being in every situation, because it's what he really needed. Does that make sense? Yes. Does it make sense to you? Yes. Does it? I know, here's what he's going to write. He's going to write, Jeffries was sucking on seed and using foul language the entire time. And his <laughs> no, he'll be fair to me. You'll kill him if he doesn't, right? <laughs> Who's your buddy? RJ. That's right. Let's have a hand. Let's have a hand for our favorite Irish spaz. <laughs> Hold on. See, this to me is the biggest reward of teaching. Is is to is to go, oh, I know where to look. Now, you know what else also made this possible? Is I got his personal metaphor. My ability to get his personal metaphor told me it was about the physicality of the whole thing. Slipping, almost getting it, things slipping through his fingers, being right out of his grasp. It told me that the intervention I needed to make had to do with his movement and his energy, not something else. So all these skills kind of lock in and play together. Now some of you are thinking, well, how can I have that level of awareness? How can I do that? 
Well, pay me lots of money and study with me, and I'll show you. Yes, you had a question. Yes, what about most of us who are like kind of shy and who don't feel effective, you know? Contrary to him, we're like you're talking to a girl or anybody, like you said, with him. I don't we feel, well, okay. we feel shy and we feel they're losing attention. First, hold right there, because okay. I've got loops open. So let me close some loops. Are we okay. done with the dream? Yeah. Are we all satisfied that we've analyzed that dream and we understand? Yep. Yep. And then I got onto metaphor and I gave you some resources you can learn use to learn more about metaphor. I talked to you about my personal metaphor. You want to take a five minute pee break? Yes. Yes. Take a five minute pee break. And their whole motto is to serve is a great honor. So I believe that. To serve, to be in service to people with my talent, with my unique talent in a way that sets them free in a way that they could never find on their own. That's a great honor. So to serve is a great honor. And you notice the ring? Someone told me, you know where this comes from? Supposedly the story is when the English and French would have battles, the English would occasionally capture the French archers and just to spread terror they would cut off this finger. Huh? They would cut off these two? Okay, so this is actually a symbol like my fingers are still, you didn't get me. Fuck you. But this, I was told that this is a French thing. It comes from the French archers saying, see, I still have this finger. I think that's not true because the Germans have this expression, the feig, right? <coughs> Isn't this how you say fuck you in Germany? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> this is it in Israel. No, you know how you say fuck you in Israel? Trust me. <laughs> that's for the Jew hater. The, the ADL told me to tell that joke. I've given money to the ADL. It's a bunch of bullshit that you've bought into, man. You've got to watch your ability. You've got to watch your propensity to believe in something because it's controversial, because it's a good way to fool and trick you. So anyway, right. You had asked a question about shyness. You yes. said, right. what do you do for those of us who are shy? Yeah. Now watch how language glue, glues the prog problem back mm -hmm. onto you. It is not that you are shy, but that through the way you process that, you're recreating it in yes. every moment. Do you understand? Yes. So just through doing this drill, and we'll go back through it later in the day, because they're still hungry for language, and I'm going to give it to them, is through going back through that drill, you can learn to have equanimity and full, complete awareness of the, that experience, and it will cease to be anything that blocks you. So then it's simply a matter of going out and talking and having some idea of where to steer the conversation, and you're and done. Actually, usually it's I lose uh, what do you call it? Um, trust in myself being effective. I, lose, I, think, I'm, I think people are going to Then you're focusing on the wander. wrong thing. You're, stop. Stop. You're telling, listen to what he's doing. He's retelling the story of his limitation and therefore mm. hammering it back in another level deep. <laughs> Every time you tell me or someone else or yourself this story, you're reaffir reaffirming your belief in your limitation. You understand? Yes. Simply by how you language it and the fact that you're bearing testimony to your belief mm -hmm. in your God of shyness. <laughs> Let me give you a commandment. Thou shalt not worship at the altar of your limitations. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not worship your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt have no other God but me. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a form of internal uh, idol worship to worship at the altar of your mistakes and go, I am this, I am this, and give public testimony that, yes, I am shy, I can't do this, I get distracted. Instead, if you want to language it, you can say, up until now, it has been my experience, that I. Right. Watch how you language it, because if you language it wrong, you just glue it back to yourself. Mm -hmm. And this kind of languaging goes on all the time when you talk to yourself about it. How many times have you had an internal, watch this reporter, how many times have you had an internal conversation with yourself about these limitations you have with women? All the time. All the time. So would you say 5,000 times? Maybe 500. 500,000 times. So 500,000 times you repeated the mantra, I am shy, I am shy, I am shy. And now do you wonder why you act shy and you feel shy? Well, fuck, you programmed it in, dumbass. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is this is how human consciousness works all the time. We're always chattering to ourselves. That beautiful woman, I guarantee you she's having a conversation about something that's been going on for years. So when you get quiet in your mind, or listen, the name of the game is not always being quiet in your mind. The name of the game is having the freedom, choice, and ability to go there when you want to. So if you have the choice and the ability to get quiet in your mind, 
When everyone else around you is noisy, who do you think will have the advantage in terms of picking up the right information? You. Well, Speak me. it. Me. That's right. So this is why all of you, are, some of you have been complaining, I didn't come here for the meditation stuff. Well, learning to have the choice to get your mind quiet when you want to be enables you to see things that are invisible to other people because they're just too noisy to pay attention to them. 90% of what I'm doing is knowing where, where to pay attention and what to ignore. Hmm? That's it. The language is impressive and the language is powerful. Don't get me wrong, I am not knocking language. Language is the naughty key to all that naughty sauce. It's great, but it's, it's really only a 20%. If you imagine the world of speed seduction to be like a big globe, Antarctica would be the language patterns, or maybe South America and Antarctica. There's other bits, controlling your energy, knowing what to pay attention to, knowing how to be quiet in your mind, knowing what to ignore, knowing how to utilize what she says. Those are the bigger pieces. <coughs> Well, thank you. One person has, wasn't raised by wolves. It's, the, the staff at this hotel is so beautiful. All these lovely Polish ladies. And Where are you from, dear? I know. I know. But I want you to tell everybody. She's, she's not going to tell me, but her ears are turning bright red. Look. See the color changes? Look how red she turns. Look at the, her ears are turning bright red. <laughs> you know what happens is when you blush, you feel the blood rushing through your body. And sometimes it rushes places where you don't really want to talk about. <laughs> With me, I find that, you know, that's the general overall thing. So my point for you is watch how you've been telling yourself all these stories and buying into it. When you can create a place of quiet in your mind, you can watch the stories going by without buying into them. So it's not that you're even going to shut the stories down. You're going to find a way to look at them without buying into them and take all the emotional energy that's running them, clean it up, redirect it into a better way so there's no more emotional energy powering the stories and they go, uh-oh, uh, uh we're out of gas. <laughs> so you don't even have to try to turn them off or fight them. Trying to turn them off or fight them, there's too much momentum. If you've done 500,000 repetitions, that's a lot of momentum to try to push against. We don't want you to do that. There's a better way to handle it. Right, so let's get back to the saucy language. You like it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, important items yet to cover. Who got laid last night? He did. You did. Who else? You did. Raise your hands, the little aces who got laid. You did. You did. You did. James, you're dressed nicely today. I know. Do you want to do it better than this? Your booze look better. Um, you can see this guy doesn't have a camera, so you can talk to him and give him another name and tell him your stories. Okay. What's that? They're not going to come back. They did their gig. Right. Um, someone told me he was. He told someone the Paris Hilton joke, and she said, "Really? I didn't know that Paris Hilton was in a in a." Boat wreck. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> Who is that? Who did that happen to? Well, that's called a dumbass check. <laughs> I had an experience where some, this is years ago, I was in the coffee bean and the tea leaf at uh, Marina del Rey, where I live in California. This woman walks in wearing purple shoes, purple pants, purple shirt, purple eyeliner, purple lipstick, purple gym bag. And I said to her, Excuse me, but spirits are talking to me. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Thank you, Spirit. The spirits are giving me a message. They're telling me, you like the color purple. And her response was, you're good. <laughs> and she meant it. She was some dumbass porn star. What was her name? <laughs> porn stars tend to move into the marina when they retire. She's a retired dumbass porn star. What was her name? <laughs> Fantasia, I think she called herself. <laughs> there was another one I met. There's a, you know her? There's an Asian porn star. Her real name is Nancy. She calls herself Kamisha. Kamisha. I see her around. And her biggest joke is a few years back, she was in the Disney parade at Snow White. They didn't know her porn star uh, history. <laughs> <laughs> Items yet to cover. Why Ross Jeffries is the world's best genius? Why, how to get a 14-inch penis like you, Ross? <laughs> Um, okay, examples of patterns. 
Blammo Blowjob Discovery Channel Cube. You want some more pattern examples? Yes. Uh, yes? yes? That wasn't very enthusiastic. Yes. Yes. You don't care? No. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes. victims come back today? Will I have victims back today? God. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I need to do is I left my phone in my room. At, at lunchtime, I'll call Lily and have, see if she's going to come in. She's really cute. Openers, yes. Yeah, we should do openers. SRT? SRT, well, we'll see. Examples of how to use observations and intuitions, examples of accelerators, total from relationship, shock pattern, uh, anchoring states, examples of pattern, blammo, blowjob, discovery channel. You guys want to hear the discovery channel pattern? Yes. yes. No, that thing has them, so yes. that's off. Yes. No, seriously, yes. Yes. The gay approach? <laughs> Yeah, I'll show you the gay approach. <laughs> Blammo, cube. Okay, let me address a few of these. Let me address a few of these. Um, so he's asking here about the cube. Well, the cube is an example, first of all, before we take notes, the cube is an example of a, of a game, story, quiz, demo. It belongs to that miscellaneous category, <laughs> joke stories, poems, games. The point of the cube is... First of all, the cube, by nature of how you discuss it, we'll get into it in a minute, creates a trance. It's a series of visualizations where you get a woman to visualize. By the very act of visualizing, it's creating something of a trance. It also requires her participation, yes, and it's an incredible opportunity to, to introduce other themes and to do embedded commands and suggestions. And one of the things about any of these tools, whether it's the cube, whether it's the Discovery Channel, the Discovery Channel is not a demo, but whether it's the cube or a joke or a story or the blammo pattern or handwriting analysis or oh, Jesus, anything like that that you're doing, the whole point is to start generating these states. If, for example, you're doing something like the cube and you see she's starting to get really sexual and talk about sexual topics, don't go on to other things. Develop that response, see? Don't get stuck in the formalism. Don't get stuck in the formalism of the equation. If, if, if the safe is already swinging open, don't worry that uh, by theory you need 10, 10 com If the theory says you need to have 10 different digits in that combination, but you see that the safe door is open after two, fuck the theory. Look, always deal with what's right in front of you. And so with any of these things, don't feel that you ever have to complete any of these demonstrations. If you're doing the twin brothers scenario, which we did yesterday, and, and today what I need to do is put it in context and show you when to do Twin Brothers and what to follow it up with. So today, rather than doing too many more individual patterns, we'll do one or two, I want to start putting things in a flow chart so you see where and when to do them and in what context. Would that be useful? Yes. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And I know that's what you're wanting. Had I done that Monday night, you wouldn't have seen the value. Listen to me. Shh. You Germans are constantly interrupting. Stop it. Cute. Uh, so my point is, when you're doing these things, like if you're doing the twin brothers, and she looks at you, she says, I want to kiss you. Don't continue with the twin brothers, right? Many of you in the beginning get so stuck in the formalism of the pattern that you're not paying attention to who, what's right in front of you. You know, they're all designed to do something. If they get the job done early, then chuck it. Uh, the cube is an example of a kind of visualization game. Generally speaking, with these kind of things, when I do an opening, I will get the openers just before lunch, and then for an hour after lunch, we'll focus on openers. And then from almost all of the remaining time, I'm going to give you some flow charts, where to start, where to go next, where to go that, what to do. We'll give you like two or three actual charted out flow charts so you can begin to have an actual pattern for training wheels that you can drive on. But what I want to say is something <clears throat> like the cube Typically, I will do the cube on the second day. So let's say I meet someone, we have a nice conversation, blah, 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 and we arrange to meet a second time. Almost always, I will meet at the Starbucks first. We'll sit at the Starbucks for like an hour, and then we'll move to another location. I've been talking about changing locations when these other kids, were, their testicles hadn't descended, so it's nothing new. And it's, that's a classic technique. Classic, na guys who are naturals with women know that. Move a woman among different locations very quickly, and it gives her the sense that she's spent much more time with you than she actually has. Creates comfort.
But with something like the cube, I will generally save it for like the second meeting, and I'll you know start out being funny and just asking some questions. Then we'll move into it. And with any with any of these things like the cube, that's a more formal sit down kind of thing. You say, well, I've got this really cool visualization game. It's a real fun way to get to know people. And so if you're interested in learning about yourself, uh, I'll, I'd like to play this with you. So I have that little qualifier. If you're interested in learning about yourself, she sort of has to, in a sense, not really, but metaphorically sort of raise her hand and go, yeah, I'm interested in learning about myself. And the cube, you, rather than me go through it with any kind of detail, I want you to get the purpose of it. It's a really fun game. It's a fun little quiz that gets her to participate. It's a way to loosen her up, to learn about her, and it also requires that she visualize. And in the process of her visualizing, it will, it will reveal, it's actually pretty accurate when you learn to do it, but it also enables you to introduce some interesting themes, you see, and to move in some interesting sexual directions. So basically the cube works like this. First of all, there's a book you can get called Secrets of the Cube. You can get it, I think you can download it online illegally, which I don't recommend. <laughs> Did you ever see that South Park episode about music piracy? This is Britney Spears. Because of online, she was hoping to have a $20 million mansion. But because of out, down, online downloaders, she had to settle for this $15 million mansion, and it doesn't have a helipad. I'm afraid this Christmas, no Santa by helicopter. No, we didn't understand. We didn't know. That's how evil always starts, son. People don't understand. So it starts out by saying, okay, imagine a desert. And you have her describe the desert. What color is the sand? What's the texture of the sand? So you have them measure a desert. You have them imagine a desert a cube, a ladder, some flowers, a horse. You have them imagine a desert, a cube, a ladder, some flowers, a horse, and a storm. And then depending on how they describe it, you give them answers back. Rather than go into it here, it's much better covered in the actual book. I recommend that you get the book. But here's an example of how it works. I'll say, so imagine a desert. She'll say, well, my desert has pink and yellow sand. I'll say, is there water? Yes, or yeah, there's water. What's the shape of the desert? Oh, there's hills that roll like this. And I'll say, well, the desert represents your view of life. Now. Water represents emotional support, and you've got some really good emotional support. You know what it's like to stop and feel deeply connected to someone and really feel that sense of being supported. So I use the cube as an opportunity to embed commands and suggestions. I'm not just going to give the interpretation straight out of the book. The book will give you interpretations, which are all well and good, but I'm going to, I'm going to weave in all sorts of commands inside of there. You understand? Well, you know, when you become interested in what it would be like to feel excited about learning embedded commands, you might realize that that learning process is taking place. Do you understand? Don't you? It's been vague. <laughs> it's been vague. You're on. With roar. With roar. Hands down. Hands down. Hands down. Hands here. Yeah. Yes, James. Boom them out. When, um, when people picture their ideal lover, my face doesn't automatically spring to mind. And that's oh, that's good. When you look, when people picture your ideal lover, it doesn't automatically spring to mind. My face doesn't automatically spring to mind. Oh, that's good. When when people picture your dream lover, my face doesn't automatically spring to mind. <laughs> Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You need to speak up. They, can you hear him in the back? James, yell. I give you permission to yell like you're at a soccer match. First time I used, um, I came up with this on the fly, and it was a girl who was absolutely devout lesbian. And she sat there, and I literally saw a pic in her mind to see her going into trance, picturing her ideal lover, because she was talking about her girlfriend at the time, and then putting 
fried fish right there. And her exact response was, hmm, I don't know. And she, went, and she was literally picturing fried fish, and you can do it with all sorts of things like a bell. So when people picture your ideal lover, my face doesn't automatically spring to mind. And then you know what you do? Here's what I would do. I would say, when people picture your ideal lover, my face doesn't automatically spring to mind. But <laughs> bring them together. You got that immediately. Bring them together. You know, when you picture the wildest night of sex, I don't, uh, clearly, I don't spring to mind. But sometimes people just think things differently, you know? Did you wind up banging her? No, I didn't. That one, I did not like the concept. But you have banged lesbians. Well, I mean, one of them, the one that did, was absolutely, it was just absolutely wrong because she wanted me to tie it to the bed. Do, and I mean, seriously, I couldn't say it because... Are I'm, you getting this, reporter? He banged a lesbian. She wanted you to tie her to the bed, and? Well, did she give you the ropes? Well, no, it was duct tape. Duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Yes, you too can be a lesbian banger and have her demand that you duct tape her to the bed when you go to www.speedseduction.biz. Can you say it with me? www.speedseduction.biz. That's right. And I want to tell you about my 100% absolute satisfaction money back guarantee. If I'm not 100% absolutely satisfied with your money, I'll send it back, guaranteed. And now we're back to our program. That's good. So we're, we were at the point where she's booky butt naked and wanting to be duct taped no, to the what bed. What was, I was in the, in the bar playing around with us. Um, Speak up. I was in the bar playing around with her and I was using sort of connection patterns and then lust patterns. And this was on New Year's Eve and she said, can I show you something? And I go, yeah, sure. She had a skirt on. She lifted the skirt and she had these black, pant, black, um, black knickers on. She said, see that tattoo there? And it was like a little tiger, and said, "Yeah, that's pussy, pussy." And I'm like, "Right." And then she put, I swear to God, she pulled back the knickers, and it was dripping. I was like, I was, I was gone. I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> but there was things she Are we getting his voice on tape? If not, his. Can you hear his voice? Yeah. So even though we're not seeing his face, I don't know we can. Tracing what it feels like. I think it was before that. I trace what it feels like. Do you know when she's. And an orgasm and stuff like that. Before that. Yeah, just before she was doing stuff like that. And then she started to get You know what we need to do? Is... We need to do an interview with him from the back of his head. For just for the testimonial. Would you be willing to do this from the back of your head? Yeah, okay, if you want to. Yeah, okay. All right. So she's dripping wet. She shows you she's dripping wet. Yeah, she was dripping wet and then she started saying about we started because I was acting like a best friend, you know, and I was talking like it was just like two girls talking about different sexual fantasies. Two girls talking, yeah, right. <laughs> Except one of them has a woody that could like wreck a building. <laughs> and she said, well, um, we started talking about sexual fantasies and stuff. And I, yeah, I was used to... I got Hold on a minute. Eric, yes. do you think you're as good looking as he is? Not quite. Not quite? Are you serious? I don't know. I mean, do you think he's got a better oh, body than oh, you? God. I don't want to see, but I'll tell you what. Lift your shirt and show him. I'm serious. Just lift your shirt and show him. Show him. No, no. Show him. I'm turning to stone. No, show him. Show him. No, no. No, not me. I've turned to stone. He's the Gorgon Medusa. Right. You're better looking than him. So let's see. So her panties are dripping. And she, she pulled them back and she said, look, what do you think of that? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there. And I was like, what the fuck do I do now? I start, we started kissing and getting off and stuff. Right. And um, basically, I ended up taking her home and stuff. And you I took her home. What's yeah. the stuff part in the end stuff? Well, basically, um, I stayed there because it would be too expensive to get a taxi, blah, blah. Right, blah. and? I stayed in the same bed, and she was starting to tell, well, started to tell me all the fantasies and stuff. Right. And that, that was sick. What she wanted to do, and it was like, R-A-P, she wanted. Um, Not R-A-P, it's R-A-P-E. Yeah. R-A-P is what you doing, what you doing, baka ka da doing and it's
It's not R-A-P-E if she's saying, please do it. Yeah, you understand? I it's a fantasy. So what did you I do? The thing is she said, no stopping. Over the tape, over the mouth. Even if she was trying to stop me, just to slap her over the face. And, ma and make sure that there was absolutely no stopping. And I basically was just I'll to use and violate her. That was... That and <laughs> that was literally... What it was, but and what did you do? Did you just lay there? No, I didn't lay there. Fuck did I? <laughs> what did you do? I, I just put, well, basically, I kneeled on top of her, pushed her down, sped, duct tape around the hands, duct tape the, the, the legs and, and everything, and well, you know, I had fun. <laughs> and were you thinking, thank you, Ross Jeffers? <laughs> yes, actually. Were, were you really I was thinking, that? fuck, you know, because my life, like, 18 months previously. If that anyone had told you you'd be pulling a beautiful lesbian from a bar, duct taping her to the bed and fucking <laughs> her brains out, how much money did you spend on her? For nothing. I mean, nothing. I think I might have nicely bought her a drink maybe once. Hold out your hand. That way. No Sorry. spending money. I know. <laughs> <laughs> One dollar fifty. Sorry. Now, there's no excuse for any of you, I know, is there? I know, but the thing is, if guys find out you're doing stuff like that, um, I mean, one guy, he was he's a really supermodel. He does modeling and stuff like right. that. He turned up on the doorstep one day saying, you better stop hanging around with such and such a girl. And I'm like, my mum and dad answered the door and because he, he was that pissed off I was getting results like this. Fuck him. Fuck him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Fuck him. Does that lesbian live here still? Can you well, she him? No, she lives in... Um, that was the thing. Where does she She live? said... I, she she gave me a phone number and I said um, she said call me now she, and I didn't call her back the next week she, I got the most foul look off her in the club I was like I should have probably called her back because I, I wasn't sure how to play the ground at that point I was like I was like fuck you I thought what's she doing now you see other people are dentists and accountants I turn virgins into duct taping lesbian bangers. Very good. You're going to have to tell us all the different patterns you used on her, okay? Not now, but would you like to hear his story and so have him tell you word for word how he pulled this lesbian in the bar? Who doesn't want to hear that? Say again, when you pulled the virgin, it was what? When I pulled the virgin, that was really quite funny, actually, because I was online, and she'd had a boyfriend who was six months, and he was pestering her, but come on, let's sleep together, let's sleep together, and she wouldn't do it, but with one of the patterns that I developed called the naughty girl versus the good girl, where, you know, they get to, do you know that line? Yeah. So, there's like that little line in between, do you know, the good girl and the naughty girl, and that's that's the line of temptation. <laughs> and, um, and so you never think of, um, you know, you're a good girl? And she goes, oh yeah, I know. I said, but you never think about doing the naughty stuff. You know, your mother would never, the stuff your mother would never approve of, the things your mum and dad will never find out about. I know that isn't running through your mind. I know that isn't. I know you're not even feeling how good it would be. I know. He's using negation. He's saying, I know that's not the case. I know you're not feeling that. I know you don't I know. think about those naughty thoughts that yeah. mom and dad, you never want them to know about. You're yeah, not and I know you're a fucking liar as well. <laughs> yeah, and she was like, and. You said you're a fucking liar. I said to her, she was a fucking. And I said, said you're a freaking liar, aren't you? And she was like, well, and, but that led into phone sex sort of thing. But when I met up with her, within an hour, we were, in, we were in a hotel room and we ended up doing it and I popped the cherry with in an hour and some guy had to spend like six months and I was like, how the fuck? Do I just, uh, sometimes I don't understand why every guy isn't doing this. Girl? She was uh, 19, 20, around about that age. I think she was 20. And how old are you? I'm 22. So you're a youngster too. How much money did you spend on her? None. Who I didn't. paid for the hotel room? <laughs> Who paid for the hotel room? No, I've <laughs> run off. paid for the hotel room? I was man. going to, but I didn't pay for it. I ran off on the hotel. It? Who even paid for it then? Well, I didn't pay for it. So, well, you ran out? Yes. <laughs> Stand up. Do you want to see the text? Sir, no, congratulations. Do you want to see the text wait, 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 the guy wait, for the hotel room? Hold on, sit down, sit down. So, he de virginized the teenager and didn't pay for the room. Let's have a standing ovation. Right Bastard Speed Seducer of the Year. The nominees for Right Bastard Speed Seducer of the Year are James and James. Congratulations, James. That's, so the, they're after you for defrauding an innkeeper then? What? You defrauded an innkeeper. Technically not because I didn't fill out the form, so legally they won't be able to... Well, how did they even let you have the room if you didn't fill out the form? No, they just said I'll um, fill it in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a barrier. Wow. <laughs> wow. I, I'm just, I'm, God, I'm so proud of these men. Do you want to see the text message where he says, a 
please contact for payment for the room received last night. When was this? Oh, when did okay, you do this? Okay. When did you bang her? When was this? It was probably about two, three months ago. No, that's okay. I don't need to see the text message. Have you been in touch with her since? Yeah, the thing is, about an hour afterwards, she said she didn't want a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Another standing ovation. Come on, everybody. See, now you would help my business tremendously if you would be willing to show your face on camera and give that testimony. Thank fuck it. We just made a million dollars. Thank you. We're going to get that separately. Huh? Do I get a cut? Yeah, I'll give you a little cut. Right across your face with my straight face. <laughs> Motherfucker. So, who here thinks that James did it on his looks? You're all a mean, right bunch of Saudi bastards. Who thinks, no, seriously, who thinks they're not good looking enough to do this? Do you really objectively think that James is better looking? Come on. Is he better dressed than you? He's got a more sleek, smooth body. <laughs> yeah, he's got that sleek, smooth. I'm kind of getting sleeker myself, aren't I? <laughs> so you're a good living example. Oh, God, don't show me those hairy arms. I will put up my breakfast and also my dinner from last night and the lining of my stomach. All right. You want me to move on here, but I'm having fun. I will move on. So when you do something like the cube, you want to use as an opportunity to embed commands and suggestions. I like that. You know, when you think of someone you want to have wild sex with, my face doesn't pop right to mine. However, sometimes women have told me sometimes things will come up in a way that make them just think things differently, you know? But let me bring up a couple other things off the top. Let me give you something off the top of my head. Um, you guys missed it. Let me give you something off the top of my head. You're asleep. I think you need to eat. So when you do something like the cube, you use it as a vehicle to embed suggestions and embed commands. He had asked what embedded commands were, and I demonstrated. And also in the cube, they say in the desert, there's, um, in, in, so in the desert, there's a horse. Describe the horse. And the horse is actually her ideal lover, right? And you tell her, well, the horse represents your ideal lover. And, and, um, Etc. Etc. et, cetera, et cetera. You just anchor it to yourself. One way I do anchoring is if she gives me, th like when I do the twin brothers, if she says she likes a great kisser, someone who makes her laugh, and someone who um, has great hands, I'll say, so, when you're with someone who's a great kisser, someone who has great hands, and someone who makes you laugh, where do you think that could lead? Do you see it? So look, guys, it looks like this. When you're with someone who's a great, and what do I do? I look at my hands when I do it. Why do I look at my hands when I do it? I'm directing her attention, right? So it goes like this. So when you're with someone who's a great kisser, makes you laugh, and has great hands, where do you think that could lead? I'm taking all the feelings, I'm stacking them on my thumb, then I'm putting my thumb down the center line of my body. They never get it. Look me in the eyes. They don't get it consciously. Have you, have you used that? Does it work? 100%. Have you ever been caught? Never. Has anyone ever said, what are you doing? In fact, I've gone one step beyond. I said, and this person's right in front of you. <laughs> That's, they, don't they don't get it. You at home, they don't get it. They don't get it. <laughs> try to get caught. I give you. I. I. I want to give you a challenge. Try to get caught. So it goes like this. So when you're with someone, here, do it with me. So when you're with someone who's a great dancer, great kisser, makes you laugh. Where do you think that could lead? You're stacking. Here's how it works. You're stacking all of those good feelings on your thumb. And then you're putting the thumb down your body, so you're transferring all the feelings. And you can even hang your thumb in your belt like this. And later on during the evening, you say, you know, I'm having a great time. <laughs> Is this fair? Yes. I can't hear you. <laughs> now, now, do you see how easily he's able to learn when you slow down? You remembered what I said. You were able to put it together in your mind and come up with a beautiful application because you slowed down. Do you see the power of it? It almost gives me a woody. I'm such a good teacher. <laughs> you know what else? I know somebody used to do this. So he would be at a, he would be at a bar, and he'd be, 
he'd be talking to girls, and he'd say, so, so what you're really saying is, if you can meet a guy who's like, who, who makes you feel connected and makes you feel that sense of destiny to the point where you go, hmm, that would be incredible, wouldn't it? <laughs> then he sits down in the chair. Right? So then it's all anchored. You get it? Yeah. Anchoring is really simple. You don't need to take a course in it. it you know, John Wooden, who is, anybody know who John Wooden was? No. You wouldn't. But, damn it. Uh, UCLA, my school where I went to, had the world's best basketball team. When John Wooden was a coach for like 30 years, they won the NCAA championship like 28 years out of that 30. He was arguably the greatest college basketball coach in the world. And John Wooden only had one play. He had one defensive play, which was man on man. He had one offensive play, which was the fast break. His players were drilled over and over again in taking one kind of shot, which is a 15-foot shot from basically the free, fr free throw line. He trained his players that when they would get the ball, they didn't do any fancy stuff. They would always stop at the free throw line and pass the ball effectively. And UCLA's opponents, there was no point in their opponents ever scouting UCLA to find out what their plays were, because they were obvious. There was only one. But they drilled them over and over and over again so they did them to perfection. So you don't need to have 20 different ways to anchor people. You just need one or two. You can anchor by stacking things on your thumb and doing this. You can put things in your hands. That's another way. You know, when you think about someone you want to have wild sex with, I know my face doesn't immediately pop into mind. But you know, you can put things in your hands and imagine they're there in your hands. That's another way to anchor. It's very simple. You can anchor things to an object, to a chair. You can, here's another wicked one. I've done this. Right? So you're talking to the girl, you've got your drink here. And she's telling you about the things that turn you on. So you say, so. So what you're really saying is, is, so if you could be with someone who's a great kisser, words are whatever quality she likes, whatever it is, you say, so, and you look at your hand. So look at your hand, guys. Practice with me. Look at your hand. Why do I look at her hand? Because I want to direct her attention to what I'm doing. Right? So if you could be with someone who makes you, you know, who makes you really laugh, has great hands, and is a scandalous kisser. Where do you think that could lead? They don't get it. How many times have you done this? Uh, probably about 35, 40 times. 35, 40 times. How many times has it actually worked to get a strong response? It's never failed to get a strong response. It's always worked. It's worked 100%. 100%. Has it, have you ever been caught? I don't even, no, never. No, there you go. A guy repeated it? What do you mean? Oh, repeated it? Good, she's putting it in. I also put a bit of a challenge in on it as well. I say, what is it about when you've got those three things in front of you, if you've got those three qualities in front of you, what is it about this person that would want to make you come back for more? Ooh. What is it about them that would make this person want to come back for more? So he says, so if you could be with someone who has this, this, and this, what is it about you that would make this person want to come back for more? That's beautiful, because now he's not only anchoring all that stuff to him, he's now challenging them to jump through the hoop and explain why they're worth it. And there is a little bit of fractionizing in there, too, right? That's right. Well, hold on, hold on. So he's going, so if you could be with someone who has this, this, and this, what is it about you that would make this person want to come back for more? By the way, I've used a similar thing when women say, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to go out with you because I know who you are and you just want to fuck me. And you know what I turn around and do? I say, you know, if I was a woman, I would have so much confidence in my ability to fuck my brains out. I know that that person would keep coming back for more because the sex would be so fantastic. <laughs> that gets rid of the objection. But I, I, that's brilliant. See, Jonathan, this is an example of a student improving on what I do by adding in an element. 
I taught you that element, but I never put it together in that way, did I? So when you meet someone who has this, this, and this, what is it about you that would make this person keep coming back for more? So it forces her to begin to describe her good qualities and, and, and try to prove to you that she's worthwhile. Yes? I used it once, and uh, then the girl said, well, I'm also a really good kisser. And then she couldn't come up with any other stuff. So, so said, what you have to say is prove it. So then, so then I said, oh, well, actually, that's all I wanted to know about you. And I kissed her. Good. <laughs> so do we get this, how it works? You could do this with anything, even if it's not a formal quiz. If you pick up that her trance words, in the course of talking, you pick up her trance words, her destiny, energy, and ecstasy. You could say, you know, isn't it interesting that if you were to meet someone who made you feel that energy, destiny, and ecstasy, how it could lead to something that would be a whole new direction for you to take? <laughs> Almost like there's a part, a much bigger part you want to take on tonight. But you know what? Why don't we go somewhere where we could really focus in without all this noise and really relax and enjoy? Now, notice that part where we could really relax and enjoy. Enjoy what? I don't say. So it keeps it safe, and it also gets her to imagine it. Because she imagines it. If I said, you know, why don't we go somewhere where we could relax and focus in, where it's quiet, and we could really enjoy making out and fucking like crazed weasels? That might often work by this point. But yes, but... Memorize which stuff? Well, first and foremost, don't memorize. Understand. Look at me. Understand how it works. If you understand the principles, you can come up with your own stuff or your own unique combinations. I'm very serious. This is as important for you as it was for him to learn to slow down and vary his intensity. Understand how it works. And then second, if you want to memorize it, rehearse it out loud. Don't rehearse it out loud just sitting there. Actually get up and move the way you would move if you were doing it. Imagine the person in front of you. And if you really want to add a kicker, imagine being inside the other person, listening to you, having all the responses you would like them to have. That's a great thing to rehearse before you go out sergeant. I was going to talk of this when I wrapped up. But if when, before you go out sergeant, you rehearse all of this, and then you imagine taking on the perspective of a woman, hearing all this, and getting really turned on in her body and thinking, I want to fuck this guy. You would be surprised how that communicates a great message, and you wind up having that happen. Instead of rehearsing failure and getting rejected, why don't you look at me, look at me. Instead of, this is a subtle point. And notice, I'm not saying instead of rehearsing failure and being rejected, rehearse being accepted and succeeding. I'm going to say this. Instead of rehearsing failure and being rejected, why don't you rehearse being inside the woman feeling totally turned on and wanting to fuck you as a result of what you're saying? Because that is really, really powerful. It sends a message out. And Lisa's taking notes. Hmm. Yes. Does that mean if you're rehearsing inside of yourself <coughs> superior performance of from the time you go out talking with a woman to closing it and you're rehearsing this stuff over and over and over again in your head, right. you're, it's just going to, you're going to perform because you're going to push yourself to right. doing it. Right, but I didn't say superior. Okay, not superior. You don't need, well, this is an important distinction. You don't need superiority. You look at me. You just need to be effective. And sometimes effective is just very simple. Sometimes the most effective thing you can do is pick the right subject. That's a quote. Quote me. Sometimes the most effective, write that down. So Ross Jeffrey's quote. Sometimes the most effective thing you can do is to pick the right subject. But you can't pick the right subject unless you know what kind of energy and vibe you're looking for in a woman. So to get the skill of picking the right subject, you must spend some time in study, whether you're meditating or going out for a walk or hiking or in the shower. You must spend some time beginning to discover the energy and vibe of the women that you would like to be with. 
so that you know instinctively and intuitively how to pick the right subjects. Hmm? In this dream, it was a way of my mind, my unconscious deeply rehearsing the kind of energy that I would like to be with in a woman who I would deeply love, perhaps for a lifetime. Hmm? So you need to spend some time not only rehearsing the skills and, and the beliefs and all of this and the concepts, but you need to spend some time tuning in to the type of energy and vibe in, in the woman, the personality that you would like to attract. Hmm? Because certainly what I don't want is someone who needs to be persuaded to have sex with anyone at all. Someone who doesn't enjoy sex, it's not my job to take a cold, sexually turned off or freaked out woman and, and try to make her open to life. That's not my job. It's not my job to take someone who's terrified of taking any kind of step and making her into an adventurous person. It's not my job to take someone who's a selfish person and make her into a giver. Hold on. It's not my job to take an angry, enraged person and make them into a happy, open person. This is not my job. All the things I've said to you, notwithstanding about people have their first responses, if people really have these patterns, I'm not out to teach them. I'm out to teach you guys. But it's not my job to be their transformer or their healer or their therapist. Or the person has to work to convince them very much. Anytime it begins to feel like work, like I'm pushing the snowball up the hill. If I'm pushing the snowball up the hill, then it's not speed seduction. If I'm pushing the snowball down the hill and riding on it as it goes, going, wee, that's speed seduction. And then she eats my ice cream cone at the bottom on the way down. That's speed seduction. But if it feels like I'm pushing hard or the timing is just really off or she's not displaying those, you know, she doesn't bring her own mind to the exploration. She's not fun. She's not healthy. She doesn't have some reasonable ability to control the circumstances of her life. Many women who are flaky are not flaky because they don't like you. It's just their life is totally chaotic and out of control. Their parole officer tried to rape them and walked in on them shooting heroin with their twin brother, who's cheating on them with their mother. You know, this whole Jerry, you don't get Jerry Springer here, do you? I was on that show three times, by the way and before it was violent. So, uh, for this, I love a kung fu lesbian teenage Siamese twin vampire who lives in a trailer park on the dole. Uh, no, for teaching this, you know, talking about, I've been talking about this for a long time. So, you need to decide and you need to explore for yourself in different ways what is the vibe and the type of women you want to attract? And sometimes you can only do that by having many experiences and seeing what you like and what you don't. Now, certainly a lesbian who has you duct tape her to the bed and fulfill her rape fantasies, did she want you to slap her and choke her while you were fucking her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly that's someone who would be fun, but I don't know if you'd want to take her home to family supper. <laughs> Although it might liven up Shabbat dinner at my sister Marion's house. <laughs> and my nephews would like it. Whenever I bring over a beautiful girl, they go, oh, I can't, t uh, I won't tell you their nickname for me because it's a family nickname. Lisa knows it. But they go, Uncle blank blank has brought someone else again. <laughs> Not anymore. My nephew Gideon's girlfriend is smoking hot. She's half Israeli, half Italian. She's not only gorgeous, but she's got a great attitude. She's real spicy and spunky. She calls me uncle, but she flirts with me like, hello, uncle. And she's giving me a little, hello, niece. She told me she was having dreams about me. She said, uncle, I want to talk to you. I went, All right. I said, uncle, she kind of looks at me like, are you doing something? She says, I've been having dreams about you. I went, really? Tell me, niece. And she said, well, in this dream, I'm in the swimming pool outside in the backyard and your voice is calling to me under the water and I try to fight it but I feel myself being pulled downward irresistibly I can't control it and the water just takes me and your voice is down there waiting for me and she said I've had this dream several nights in a row uncle and and I said you well you know Martinique if you're asking me am I doing something to you psychically no I'm not I really wasn't I, I said I love my nephew I would never do that to him I wouldn't either but, you know, maybe I represent a level of power and maturity that you feel is really, really attractive, but you're not ready for it yet. So that's why you fight the tug. That's, she says, I think you're right. 
But so my nephews, he, he no longer cares because he's, he's got his needs well taken care of. Where was it instead of rehearsing something in rejection? Instead of rehearsing rejection, why don't you rehearse how women will feel as they totally want to fuck you as a result of what you're saying? Now, I want you to rehearse out loud what you'd say and what you'd do, but then I want you to fractionate and take on the woman's perspective being on the receiving end of this, how she would feel in her body. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of you men. You're, you've become great learners since Friday. You're on it. You're learning. You're participating. You're demonstrating great understanding. Fantastic audience. This is fun. Remember I said I also don't want to perform emotional dentistry. I don't want to have to perform her, pull her emotional teeth. And if a woman is chaotic, I said if she doesn't have her life organized, I don't want to deal with it. Some women have, they have to have a moderate level at least a modicum, a good degree of control over the circumstances of their life. Because otherwise it just gets too, I don't have the time. I'm too busy, I have too much of my mind. This job I'm doing now is just part of what I'm working on. And I don't have time for people who waste my time, who can't follow through. I just don't. Well, yeah. I mean, not grasping onto it, being OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, a little, that's, that's far too complex a question to ask for most people here. I, you're right, yes. My answer is yes. That's very advanced thinking on your part. You're Indian by extraction, aren't you? My Indian students are always the smartest. Shame on you white people. <laughs> I'm the Omega male. No. No, he's not good at searching. Welcome back. Are you enjoying yourselves? Yes. How are you doing? Super. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Super. You did some good work. Uh, uh, good for you, buddy. You feel different? Unreal. Unreal, yeah, I know. That was some good, good bit of work. So this afternoon, um, I want to do the following things. I want to cover how to install those four vibes that are really attractive to women, how to use them in the openers, and then how to carry them through the entire Sarge. So this afternoon, we're going to do vibe and the walk-up diamond openers. Since you guys want it, you want some different sequence of patterns, I'm going to give it to you since you feel you need the training wheels. I'll give you your training wheels. We're going to do a little bit more on the, um, on the meditation exercise that you yes. need, and then we'll take some more questions. You know what, Shirlene? Um, if you want to take like another 45 minutes to flit about, uh, I want to do the openers with them. You're welcome to stay, but I, I won't need you to teach for like another 45 minutes to an hour. You okay with that? Shirlene also has CDs for sale there in the back of the room, and she's told me she'll take the curse off me if you buy them, so. <laughs> right. So. I want to congratulate you guys. I was absolutely thrilled to see the level of participation this morning when I shared those, that dream with you. You guys were spot on. I mean, really good. And even educating me, I did not realize some of the dynamics of what made that work. I really did not. You guys educated me. So seriously, give yourself a, a pat on the back. <laughs> right. So one thing I want to show you, and this is something I do want you to take notes on after you understand it. Because this afternoon, we're going to get into the vibe and openers, and then we're going to show you sequences, a couple of examples of what would make for a successful Sarge, because you want that, right? You guys need some sense of a road map, some kind of training wheels that you can run on before you take off the wheels and just go. And I understand that. I've been promising that to you. I had to lay the groundwork first, because now, you have a good working understanding of how this stuff works. Now when I show it to you, you won't be scratching your ass, sticking your thumb in your rectum and going, uh, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee. <laughs> Well, maybe the Germans will. <laughs> I was picking on the French, but now I've been picking on you guys. At least he doesn't talk like, <laughs> I know what you're doing. You're planning to take the Sudeten land. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Aren't you? Now, this is really, really interesting. I came up with this back in, back in um, like right around Christmas time this past year. I was really thinking about this whole program of nailing your inner game. Of pe uh, people have asked about those DVDs and CDs. That's my bad. I'm still working on it. Uh, we have your names and addresses. Eventually, we'll get them to you. So be patient with me. I will send you updating emails. But I've been working on this idea of, OK, Let's say you get guys to stop doing all that reinforcing and all that ruminating. That's all gone. And you give them beliefs for learning. 
how are you going to teach them what to pay attention to and what to ignore? Because when you set out and you do a Sarge, as I said, one of the most challenging things is confusion. You're not quite sure what worked or what went wrong. In James's case, he got good positive feedback. When that lesbian lifted her skirt, pulled aside her panties and showed him and said, look, it's dripping. And, right, and then she took him home and said, duct tape me, please, and fuck my brains out. There was no ambiguity there. <laughs> no ambiguity. And there's no uncertainty in your mind that you had a 100% successful outcome, right? The first time I did it was a different story. The first time you did it? Oh. The first, like, ever, so, well, first time I ever used a pattern. Okay, but, but don't gainsay me here. For, this, for the point of the story, when that happened, you had success. So there was no confusion there, right? But the bottom line is there's usually no confusion at the peak of your skills because it's all working. And when you have no skill at all, there's no confusion. You know you're failing because nothing's happening. But when you start to move up the learning curve, often what happens is you're not sure what to pay attention to. You don't know at what level or at what point in the Sarge things are not working. So it gets confusing. Am I right or am I right? Yes. Raise your hands if, I, if you've experienced this. Right, the single biggest challenge for those of you in the back of the room who teach these skill sets, whether you teach your own or mine, I'm telling you right now, the single biggest challenge for guys getting this stuff is not approach anxiety and it's not fear. To be certain, those are important, but the biggest single thing is confusion, not knowing. Are they being effective or are they not being effective? Are they... Are they becoming attractive or are they not becoming attractive? It's that fractionation back and forth between thinking it's working and then thinking it's not working that's deeply confusing. You're fractionating yourselves in a way that's not useful. So one thing I came up with that I think is very useful, <clears throat> when you're looking at, at any kind of skill set, but especially sarging, one thing to look at is to chunk it according to time. You can look at, it, it, maybe you need to improve what you're doing in the preparation phase. Maybe there's something you need to do more of or to do differently or to do less of or to subtract or to add in. Before you go out and Sarge, are you doing the right preparation? Are you, are you visualizing how you're going to behave? You understand? Are you rehearsing the basics? Are you putting on the right vibe when you go out? Do you understand? Yes. So you may need to make some improvements in the preparation phase. Now bear in mind, <clears throat> here are the ways you can improve. This is where I do want you to write notes. So write notes. There's those things that you need to add in. So you may need to add something in. It may be that there's simply something that you're entirely missing that you need to add in. Okay. So you may need to add something in. That could be a skill set. That could be a, be a belief. It could be a vibe. It could be an attitude. There may be something you need to add in. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. There may be something you need to subtract out. This is in, I'll tell you, but this is in any phase of improvement, whether it's before, during, after. There are the things you need to add in, things you need to subtract out, there may be things that you need to diminish. So it's not that you shouldn't do them, but maybe you diminish the intensity. And who had an improvement in diminishing intensity? You may need to diminish the intensity. You may need to diminish the frequency. In other words, don't do it as often. You can diminish intensity, frequency. You can diminish the speed at which you do something, so do things slower. You may want to diminish the amount of internal dialogue, so don't let it go entirely, but just really turn it down. So there are those aspects that you need to diminish. Does that make sense? Yes. So you may need to add in, you may need to subtract out, you may need to diminish, or you may need to increase or intensify. Another, <clears throat> so you can increase the overall energetic intensity, you could increase your volume, you could increase your speed, yes? You could increase the number of repetitions you simply go out and do. So instead of talking to five women, maybe you have to increase it and talk to 20. You can increase the amount that you listen, the proportion of how you do something. Maybe you actually increase the amount of listening as opposed to the amount of talking. So at any stage, in all these stages I'm about to show you, you can make adjustments in these different ways. And finally, there are those things that need to be balanced. 
<clears throat> in other words, yes, you're increasing or diminishing, diminishing them, but you're only doing it in, in pair with something else. So, for example, maybe you diminish your dominance, but you increase your playfulness. So you're not diminishing your dominance outside of anything else. You're doing it in concert with something else. Understand? Does this make sense? Yes. This is pretty common sense, but people tend to forget it when they're in an area of light that's very charged. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the first phase we look at when we look at sarging, where we might want to improve, is the preparation period. There's how you prepare immediately before you go out and sarge, like the hour before. Do you do a little bit of meditation? Do you rehearse your beliefs for learning? Do you rehearse your vibe? Or do you just go out without any rehearsal, without any preparation? I can tell you, even for myself, when I take time to clean up my energy and prepare my vibe and imagine myself walking into the room, and when I, when I Sarge, I do all my vibe. I do all that stuff. And then what I do is I imagine walking in to the venue, and I see a symbolic representation of my energy reaching out and unconsciously touching all the women who are already going to get me. Now, they may not consciously be aware of it, but because they're tuned into my vibe, my vibe, they're already getting me. And then my job during the evening is not to create any kind of attraction at all. It's merely to take the attraction that the vibe created and to bring it to the conscious surface. Do you understand? That's my model for me of doing speed seduction. Everything I do with my behavior and my language, it's not creating anything. It's simply bringing to the surface the connection that happened the instant I walked into the room. Even if they're not looking at me, my belief is the ones who are going to get it have already gotten it unconsciously. Now, some of them are so aware of their own energy and their own bodies, they immediately know they've gotten somebody. They're just not sure who. So they'll look around the room, and then when they look at me, they go, oh, I, he's the one I get. You understand? <clears throat> so maybe you need to do something in the preparation phase. I bet most of you do. I bet most of you do. Then, this is really cool. There are those things you do continually throughout the Sarge. There are certain things that you need to do continually throughout the Sarge, from the beginning to the middle, all the way to the end. It may be something like that that you have to work on. Now, what are some of the elements that you should be always doing? You never stop doing it. Always be in control of your state. Always control your state. Right? Always be calibrating the other person to see if they're following with you or not. So controlling your state, calibrating just means paying attention. Right? Control your state, calibrate. I teach you should always be in rapport. Those who say break rapport, with all due respect, don't understand what rapport means. They think rapport means trying to gather information about the person or getting them to accept you. That's not rapport at all. Nothing to do with it. A person could hate your fucking living guts and you could be in rapport with them. To me, rapport is about an unconscious sense of connection. Somewhere on the unconscious level, you're vibing with that person, even if they fucking hate you. The best way for you guys to be in rapport is to not worry about it. Quiet your mind and focus on having the right vibe. Now, you got that? So there are those, you may need to make adjustments in those things you're always going to do, continuously. You never stop doing them. Does this make sense? You're going to be changing your vibe throughout the Sarge, but you're always paying attention to you, on some level to your vibe. Does this make sense? If you can learn to analyze things in this level, you'll get a lot better understanding of where you need to make improvements. Hmm? Now, there are those things you do in the Sarge, look here, before we take notes, <clears throat> that you do sequentially, meaning you have to do, you only do them once, and you do them in a certain order. Think of a recipe. When you bake a cake, you put it together, all the ingredients, you mix it up in the bowl, you stick it in the oven, you take it out of the oven, but you don't crack in the eggs once you've baked it, right? You've got to do it in the right order. But you don't keep cracking in the eggs. You do it once at the right point, in the right proportion. Does this make sense? Yes. 
<clears throat> so what we're going to cover the, uh, this afternoon is really those things you do sequentially. When you guys ask for a sequence of patterns from start to close, you're asking for things that are done sequentially. You only do them once, and you do them in a certain order. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're asking for. I'm going to give that to you. But I want you to understand that may not be where you need your improvement. And it may not be where, where you have the most leverage. You may have the most leverage for improvement somewhere else. Now here comes the really tricky one. This is where mastery lays. Mastery is, mastery is found right here. This is where the biggest leverage for improvement is and where people who have mastery. I'm, gonna add, I'm a masterful teacher, correct? You would agree, yes? yes. Very masterful teacher, yes? yes? Because I understand how to do this with my students. Look here, this is subtle, but this is where mastery is. You can hear a pin drop. This is the stuff that you return to periodically throughout the Sarge from time to time. So you don't do it all the time, but neither do you only do it in a certain order. You return to it periodically throughout the sarging process. So I'm going to say it again. You don't do it all the time, but you return to it periodically throughout the sarging process. This is where mastery is, right here. And in fact, in any kind of persuasive skill set, I can't speak to other things, but in any kind of persuasive skill set, the mastery is right there. And it's what most people ignore on their way to mastery. Most people who get good and stop right there don't understand this and don't master this bit. It's this bit that is your key to absolute mastery, right here. Yes, I will in a moment. Thank you. Good, good learning. I'll get there. What would be something we return to periodically? We don't do it constantly, but we periodically do it. Well, it could be firing off anchors if you do that. What's that? Fractionating. Fractionation, we don't do it every moment, but we continually, we periodically return to it. Now, the frequency with which you do it and the level on which you fractionate can vary. But people who are great communicators naturally fractionate. Whether they intentionally plan it out in their mind or just do it inherently, they do it whether they know it or not. So that's, yes, that's one thing you do periodically. What else might you do periodically? Check her site. Uh, OK, I would consider that almost, it's on the line between something you do continuously, and, but I'll buy that. What else? What is something you do periodically? You don't do it all the time, so nor do you do it only once. Mild, What's that? Mild, how about periodically checking to see how comfortable she is with being touched? Periodically, we're going to return to scene. One of the things I do is periodically, I check in to see the balance between comfort and heat. I'm working towards two things. I'm working towards comfort and heat. And periodically, I will check in to see where that's at. Now, how I do that's another question. But periodically, you ought to be checking in to see how comfortable she's growing with your touch. That's one example. It's a periodic thing. What else might we return to periodically? Right? Very good. He nailed it. Structuring opportunities. Periodically throughout the Sarge, we're structuring opportunities and offering challenges. Are we not? Remember I talked about challenge as being something that's really powerful? Periodically. We're testing for readiness. We're testing to see where she's at. Remember I said, if a lady is giving you every signal that she's totally turned on by you, wants to be with you, and is absolutely ready, don't go piling on more stuff. You're done. Job over. Get, you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> and in the beginning, many of you, what I know you're going to do is you're going to get so excited about these tools working, you're going to go crazy with them. I'm saying, no, chop the throttles, put out the flaps, Put down the landing gear, it's time to land. You're going to be putting the throttles to the firewall and wanting to go 800 miles an hour. Mm -mm. This is key. Also, utilizing her responses. Remember I told you about that? 
when she gives you very strong responses, do we ignore information that who does most of the talking in, in a good speed seduction? Let's hear it. She does. 80% of the talking is being done by her. If she gives you information and you ignore it, you are a fucking idiot. You understand what I'm saying? Write that down. If she gives me information and I ignore it, I am a fucking idiot. This is the beauty of speed seduction, that to do it well, you really have to listen and pay attention to the unique person in front of you. If you're doing 50 different stories to show her what an exciting life you have, you're not doing speed seduction. And more, you're doing the work. Remember, we're not the guys who push the snowball up the hill and it gets heavier and heavier. We take the little snowball, we tap it, and it gathers its own momentum and creates an avalanche, a snow slide. So you better be paying attention to what she says and to incorporate what she says. Yes, you're always paying attention, but utilizing what she gives you, you do periodically. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I'm always paying attention to her. But if, for example, she does, I'm not going to always be going, you're right. I'm not a, someone who wears a, a, a big overcoat and flashes myself in the schoolyard. Well, sometimes, but it's only a hobby. All right? So there are those things you do periodically. Periodically, look here, periodically fractionate your own energy. Periodically switch between being someone to someone who's being funny. Periodically check in with your physical body. Periodically, from time to time, check in and feel your feet on the ground so you remember you're actually there, present in a human body, not flitting around in the stratosphere. Does that make sense? Do any of these ladies want to play with me on stage? Or are yeah, they still shy? Oh, they're, look at that. They're afraid come of me. On, no, 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 no. Hey, no bullying. That's not allowed. <laughs> I'm not of a mind to offer a gift. To, look here. Not at them. I just wanted to see it. Calm down. <laughs> There you go. I'm not of a mind to offer a gift to someone who's not of the mind to eagerly accept it. If you give a gift, you don't persuade. If you're persuading, you're selling, not giving a gift. End of story. You know, if people don't want to learn how to triple their orgasms and to have feelings that they've never had before and be even more in love with their boyfriends in a way where their boyfriends never even think of looking at another girl ever again unless she picks the girl out to go home with them, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> it's none of my business. They're the things you do at the end when you're closing the deal. Maybe you really have to work on your closing. Although I don't even like the word closing. It's more like an opening, a powerful <laughs> opening for a new direction. And sometimes when you, you know, you ever meet someone and within 10 minutes, you just know you like this person? Because you know this person can lead you places. And there's like, a different part that you want to take inside yourself. And you can feel your opening. You feel your opening for something new, a new direction you want to take inside. And even though people may laugh and friends may not approve, and I get that, you may even feel a little strange about it at first, still at the same time, you also can find a place in your mind where you set that aside, where you just can see yourself stripping away completely from anything that would have blocked your own pleasure right? It's a place where you want to succeed, yes? You all want to succeed. You can see yourself succeeding in a new direction, right? Right, boys? Right. Okay. There's stuff you do at the very end. Yes? You're closing. Although, for, now, there's a sense in which that's a mistake. That's also a mistake. I don't believe that closing is a discrete part of the process. I believe the moment I approach someone, the way I interact with them energetically has already begun to close. Anything that moves us further along in a mutually enjoyable exploration is part of the close. If you look at the close as something that's completely separate, then you're making an error in your thinking because it's not. It's not really separate. So for the sake of the diagnostic, yes. But in reality, it's not really a separate thing. The story I told you about my nephew, my nephew Gabe is 18 years old. He's a virgin. It's so cute. 
18-year-old girl who's hanging out with him. She clearly has a crush on this kid. They went to meet me for pancakes. I was sitting at the, uh, this diner in um, the farmer's market. And she had read the game, so she wanted to meet me. So she and another guy and my nephew Gabe show up. And she's on one side, Gabe's on the other. And I'm talking to her about the game. And suddenly I look at her and I say, so, do you have a thing for my nephew? Now, women do this thing where the real answer will flash across their face for a tenth of a second before they hide it. She went, and then she hit it. Like, uh, and I went, aha. And she and Gabe both turned the same shade of beet red. And they were looking at each other. I went, aha, mm, very nice. So later he says to me, cock, oh, no, he says to me, um, <laughs> I almost gave away my nickname. Ixne on the Nuncle Aka K, right? Or your Iard Fay. My uh, nieces and nephews have a nickname for me that they're not allowed to say. Or call me by. That's for them only. That's right. Good girls. So uh, he said to me, oh, I almost said it again. He said, Uncle, Uncle Paul. He said, what do I do with, with um, what's her name? What do I do with Nicole? I mean, I said, have you kissed her? He said, no, I'm not quite, you know, I'm not sure I should. She's my friend. I don't really know. I said, you haven't even made out with her? No. I said, dude, she clearly wants you. He said, yeah, I know. She told me she was a virgin. And then he looks at me and said, you know, I'm a virgin too. <laughs> I said, okay, no problem. I'm thinking, you won't be for long, kid, not with me as your uncle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says, well, what do I do? See, for him, he's viewing it as a discreet thing that he does at the very end. He's viewing any kind of physical contact her, with her at all as something he does at the very end to close the deal, and that's a mistake. I said, no, you can't just go from no contact to lunging at her. You know, I said, try this. Try play fighting with her. Get into a pillow fight with her. Wrestle with her. So she gets used to the touching. He went, oh, you know, I get it. And then he said to me, you know what? I met someone even hotter, <laughs> and she's not a virgin. I went, oh, OK. Go for it, kid. But, so it could be to, to view closing as something that's discrete and separate and different is, a, is an error. But for the sake of this diagnostic tool, we can think about it that way. And then there's what you do afterwards. How do you review the situation? How do you learn from your mistakes and take what you did well and reinforce it and congratulate yourself for it? Now, yes, Eric. So I'm going to show you this stuff. But what I'm going to show you is deals with the, you had a comment? Uh, um, no, I wasn't asking. If you have something, I, I want to hear what you have to say. So what we're going to be dealing with is you want to know the sequential stuff, right? Yes. But bear in mind, it's only the sequential stuff. It's only a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole thing. And um, the other thing is when you look at changing, these are some more distinctions that I think you'll find helpful. You may have to just adjust things that are analog, and you may have to adjust things that are digital. Now let me explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> Analog variables are anything that vary along a range. For example, do these, Lisa, do any of these lights have a dimmer switch? Can you just, there's some lights here that switch on and off. Which ones switch on and off? Okay, that's digital. Off, turn it back on. Can you turn? OK, this is analog. They vary. No, that's on and off. That's digital. Analog would be you can dim them. Are there dimmers? No, that's off. All right, put them back on. Put them back on. Any time will do, like now. That's the dimmer, OK? That's analog. It varies along a range. Could you put the other ones back on? There you go. So some of what you're doing is analogical. For example, your volume, the speed at which you move, the speed at which you process, that's an analog. Digital is either there or it's not. Digital would be you either say this word or you don't say this word. You either make this move or you don't make this move. Does that make sense? So you may want to look at those things that have to be shifted or changed. Should we wait? I will. I don't mind. That's like one hell of a condom, isn't it? This is like the ultimate French tickler. <laughs> Looks like something, it's, it's Bigfoot's French tickler. Look at that. Oh, 
You half expect it to coo when you pet it. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Now, I don't want to say I'm that big, but <laughs> when I go to Disneyland, I pay adult admission and an extra kid's ticket, too. <laughs> but I'm pumped. Thanks a lot. I'm here all week. But I just made that up on the spot. You Germans will not stop the talking, yeah? If you do not stop the talking, I shall have to introduce you to Golda, the she-wolf of the Israeli SS. <laughs> <laughs> and she will make you sit in the comfy chair and tell you stories while you are a very naughty boy who doesn't come to visit enough. <laughs> right. Do we get these distinctions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Finally, there are those things that are interpersonal, meaning how you react, interact with others, and intrapersonal, what's going on inside your own skin. These are pretty exhaustive and, and thorough diagnostic categories. And <clears throat> do you understand that distinction? Interpersonal, what you do with others, and intrapersonal, what you do inside your own skin. These are all the different levels you need to look at where you might want to make improvements and adjustments. Does this make sense to you, Shirlene? Make sense to you guys? Yeah. So when you come home for a Sarge and you review, these are the various different things you can look. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's start, since we're going to do some sequential stuff, let's start with openers. My theory is if you're really good with opening, if you're meeting, people usually come to me and they ask questions that are not the best questions. They say, how do you meet women on the, on the tube? Or how do you meet women in the supermarket, or how do you meet women on an airplane, or they make it very geographical. But when you get really good with this stuff, you just find yourself meeting anywhere, anywhere, everywhere you go. It's no longer about a geographical location, yeah? So basically, I like to think of My drawing is improving. That's a diamond. <laughs> okay? You can draw a diamond on your paper with four different positions. Each corner represents a position. Just draw it. Don't worry about it, Gauron. This is only a model, <clears throat> but fundamentally, when you're going to do walk-ups, when you're going to meet women, there are four different approach attitudes, approach vibes, approach angles that you can use. And a good approach will either involve two of them simultaneously or one fractionating right after the other. So over here I have put-ons. Put-ons are anything that's a joke, that's obviously not meant to be taken seriously, or you're taking the piss out of the person, or you're saying something that, that is sort of like, it's putting you on. Do you know what having someone on means in Britain? Is that what you say? Oh, you like having us on? It's having someone on. Or it's saying something funny, put-ons. One of the things I, I, I stopped doing it, but it was actually pretty effective. <clears throat> um, let's say she had a really big bag, and I, I would say, Wow, your bag is great. Sorry, my complimenter is on stuck. It gets a big laugh. Fuck y'all. That's an example of a put on, right? Um, or another put on I often use. <clears throat> I was at the Roosevelt Hotel and they were having a playmate convention, and I'm walking in in the lobby, and these I've never seen so many plastic surgery examples in like nine square feet. These women walk down and they got like collagen lip and they walk like right in the middle of me. Suddenly I'm in a swarm of them. I look around and I say, I picked the wrong hotel to be gay. <laughs> and they all laughed and they said, oh my God, that, give, give, that gives you a hug. You're coming with us. And they're like, they're dragging me along and I'm talking about men and saying, so Aren't men dicks out here? And they all start going, and two, a few of them say, 
who says we're into men? And they're like, it was a really interesting thing. They were so stupid, though. And like, I'm thinking, nah, uh -uh. I would rather go talk to the wall than, than talk to these people. <laughs> but that's a good one. That's a good opener is to say, is to say <clears throat> I picked the wrong X to be gay. So X would be wherever you are. So if, like, you're in the supermarket and, and this beautiful girl walks by you, you say, I picked the wrong aisle to be gay. Get it? That's a put on. It's not meant to be taken seriously. It opens the door with some laughter. Another put on is the fake stutter to say, that bag is enormous. And you say, sorry, my complimenter is on stuck. Trust me, it always gets a, a laugh. You have to be able to deliver it right. That's an example of a put on. What would be another put on? I've told you some. Well, be acting flamingly gay, which I don't do anymore. I used to. Yeah, the woman walks into the coffee bean. She's got pink eyeliner, pink lipstick, pink cheek blush. Strike that. She's wearing purple. Purple eyeliner, purple lipstick. Purple um, blush, she had purple gym outfit, purple bag, purple nails. I forgot to mention that. She had purple streaks in her hair, too. And I said, excuse me, the, yes, the, the spirits are telling me, uh, um, yes, yes, you like the color purple. That was meant to be a put on, but she said, wow, you're good. <laughs> she was dumb as a rock. Okay? <clears throat> Example of a put on. Oh, that's, I haven't used that in a long time. Uh, I say to her, you know, or to say, excuse me, miss, I know this is going to sound a little strange, but I know what your perfect lover looks like. She's going to go, what do you mean? I said, well, I see his face in the mirror every morning when I shave. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Okay. I, there, I'm forgetting some. I've done a couple others that were really, really ripper funny in my career. Um, Oh, there's context-specific put-ons. Um, <laughs> you like that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking deadly, is that what you said? Yeah. Back in April, I went to this um, to see this roly-poly, light in the loafers, flamingly gay, spiritual reader. His name was Hans King. He had a crowd of women in that room, like 98 women, and the only two guys were me and my nephew. I said, hey, Gid, there's going to be plenty of punani here. Let's go cruise for chicks. He went, okay, uncle. So <clears throat> this guy is a complete retard. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. He was talking about how, you, did you know the universe wants you to find that perfect girl or guy? All you have to do is find someone who sees you exactly as you are without any wanting to change you and loves you just the way you are. I looked at Gideon and said, why didn't I think of that? Wow, it's really simple. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But anyway, during the, he kept talking about the spirits will give you lucky numbers, how you could turn into the tune into the spirits to get lotto numbers, right? They call it lotto here? And so at the break, I saw this hot-looking woman at, his, uh, at the literature table. So I said to my nephew, watch this. And I walk up to her, <clears throat> and I have my cell phone in my hand. I say, excuse me, miss, but I know... The spirits have been talking to me since the spirits, the spirits are showing me a 10-digit number that is the absolute key to your happiness. I opened up my cell phone and had the, like the number of the phone on it right there. <laughs> now, she said, I'm here with my girlfriend. I said, like I said, the spirits. <laughs> but that was very context-specific, right? You couldn't use that somewhere else, could you? But maybe you're in the bedding shop, right? You have, what is it, Ladbrokes? Ladbrokes? I don't know if you'd want to date a woman who frequents the betting shop, but you get my idea? You get the idea? Here's another put-on I love to do. Now I'm waking up. I'm remembering my own put-ons. Um, in America, they have a, a store called Staples. It's office supplies. Do you have uh, that? What do you have here? Staples. Staples. Go to your local Staples. Find the prettiest girl there who's a customer and walk up. I swear I've done this, and it works. Walk up and say, excuse me, but where do you keep the laser printer cartridges? 
And they always say, I don't work here. And you say, yeah, I know. But the people who work here are butt ugly, and you're really cute. <laughs> <laughs> also works in the supermarket. Walk up to the pretty girl. Walk up to the pretty girl. Excuse me, but uh, where, do you keep, where do you keep the mango, mango, the mango spicy jelly? You guys have some kind of jelly. I was at the open air market two weeks in Hammersmith, and it's jelly with pepper in it. Um, what's the word? Chili jelly? What do you call it? No, no, it's like jelly with hot sauce in it. It's not chutney, but anyway. So walk up to the girl in the, mar the supermarket and say, um, excuse me, but where do you keep the lamb, the, the lamb shanks? And they'll always say, well, I don't work here. And you go, yeah, I know, but the people who work here are dwarf butt ugly or whatever, and, and you're really cute. Get it? My name is. I like doing put-ons because they, they, first of all, look up here. Uh, uh, the thing about put-ons is they're screening. If a woman doesn't laugh at my jokes, I, I'm probably not going to get me, so I'm going to leave. You're screening to see if the person's playful, right? And it also, it, it takes away the attention of meeting someone. When you, get, when you start out with explosive laughter, it sort of like drops the natural tension between people. And they're fun to do. And put-ons challenge me to think on my feet. My best put-ons were not calculated. I didn't go out and with them in my mind. I would come up with them on the spot. Yes, James, yeah. lesbian banger. <laughs> one of the ones I did once was in last January. Was, I was in a club where, and this, this girl was sitting by the bar. And there was guys that come up to every two, three minutes. And she was getting really pissed off with it. And there was this one guy who just he was hanging around. And she was, I could tell she was like really pissed off with him. He went and said, you two make such a cute couple. And um, she said, oh, he's been pestering me all night. So I said, yeah, I just have to give him a chance before I came along. I'm an angel. Oh, James. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Here's another one. If you see a woman, I've done this. If you see a woman who's blowing guys off left and right, walk up to her and say, you know, I'm wondering what it is you're doing to keep the guys away because it's not working with me. <laughs> <laughs> or if you see a, it, since you guys like to talk about sets, if you see a set and there's no guys around and walk up and say, I'm wondering what you're doing to keep the guys away because it's not working on me. Put-ons. So the key thing about a put-on is it's fun. It's obviously not done with any kind of malice to it. It's, it, it's funny. It gets a laugh. From there, then, you're going to introduce yourself. So you do the put-on. Usually what happens is when I do a put-on, once the woman laughs, look up here. I'll say something like this. Once she laughs, I'll say, I'm glad you laughed because I noticed you here, and I wanted to meet the person wrapped inside all the pretty. <coughs> my name is. So that's my standard follow-up for a put-on. I'll say, I'm glad you laughed because I noticed you here and I wanted to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty. Hold on, hold on. Or I'll just say, I noticed you here and I wanted to meet you. The, in the wrapped in the pretty is a clever way of implying. Now notice, it's not a direct compliment. We're going to get the indirect compliments in a moment. It's an implied compliment. I didn't say directly, I think you're very pretty. I said I wanted to meet the person wrapped in the pretty, which is not directly saying I think she's pretty. If you really want to be a bastard, you could say, I'm glad you laughed because I wanted to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty, but she just walked out the door. <laughs> we don't do that kind of stuff. That's negging. We don't neg. Yes? That opener that you just had, what is it that you're using to keep the man away because it's not working for me. It's not working with me, yeah. Right. She will laugh, and automatically that opens up a bubble that you're both in the same side. Now you're really learning. Do you see how smart he is? I do one little change, and suddenly he goes from a confused spastic to a super genius. <laughs> <laughs> the god of thunder. <laughs> My thing with put-ons is, is it's really playful and it's fun. I want women to get the sense around me right away that they can be comfortable, they can relax and they can have fun. Did you get the sense after meeting me for a short while that I was a fun person to be around? Yeah? Yeah? Say yes. Yeah. I want them to get a sense that I don't have any meat agenda. In other words, I want to lull them to sleep. No, just kidding. <laughs> Shirling's like, what? <laughs> Thank you.
you know, something unusual is going on. I can't quite explain it. But <clears throat> up until this year, every seminar I've ever done, my hands are usually marked up with ink of different colors by the first day. I have not had a spot of ink on my hands either weekend. So something weird is going on. But normally that would be a hallmark. I'd walk out and there'd be like ink all over. Nothing. So something weird is going on there. Put-ons. <clears throat> so as soon as she laughs, I want to say, I'm glad you laughed because I noticed you here and I wanted to meet you. So I'm conveying my purpose. I'm, I'm not hiding the fact that I wanted to meet her. I'm stating right up front who I am and what I wanted. So that goes to the next vibe, which is being direct. Being direct and sincere. That is a very attractive vibe. So as soon as I do the put on, I immediately move right over here to being direct and sincere. I want to state my intent. Now other schools will teach you don't state your intent. Fuck that. Own your intent. It's not like a massive intent like, oh man, I saw you here and I, on my DNA woke up and screamed, replicate with this woman. <laughs> If she can't handle the, the, the genuine, if she can't hand you, handle the genuine, oh, look, I got a mark, see? Spoke too soon. If she can't handle the genuine, low-key, simple statement that I saw her and wanted to meet her, then, you know, what's the point? So I'm glad you laughed because I saw you here and I wanted to meet you. If you want to doll it up a little bit, you can say, I saw you here and I wanted to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty. For some reason, that phrase, wrapped in all the pretty, it, goes, they, it just sounds good. It's, it's a more, uh, I'm sure you've heard you're good looking from guys before. They've told you you're pretty, yes? <laughs> right? But they probably don't say it in quite that clever way. And it's also pointing out something else. It's saying, in effect, that statement is a challenge. Remember I said you should challenge women? The challenge of that statement, first of all, it's an implied compliment. I didn't say directly, I think you're very pretty and I wanted to meet you. I said I wanted to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty. The presupposition is, first of all, I'm seeing the pretty, but I don't think it's who you are. I just see it as something that's an outer garment, right? Second thing it's saying without saying it is, it's only an external covering. What else do you have? It's not coming right out and saying, what else do you have besides your looks? You know, people corrupt my teaching in the most unusual, bizarre ways. This has now worked its way into one of the other schools of pickup, where that's one of the things they say. So what else do you have going for you besides your looks? That's so vulgar. That can work. That will work at the right phase. But it, it's vulgar. It, it, it's like a giant pink flamingo on your front lawn. It's like, you guys don't have Chuck E. Cheese in England, do you? Thank God. It's like um, Dame, who's the one who dresses up like, it's like Dame Edma's sense of fashion. You know, it's vulgar. But this is implying it. When you say, I wanted to meet the person wrapped in the pretty, you're saying a lot of things. First of all, you're saying, yes, you're pretty, but I can see past it, and I want to see what you have beyond that. But it's all done through implying rather than stating. You state your intent. You're saying, yes, I wanted to meet you. That's true. You're speaking the truth, yes? But also, the implication in the way you state, I wanted to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty, is that you see beyond it, and their, her being pretty is not enough, and what else does she have going for her? It's all stacked within an implication rather than stating it directly. And remember, women use implication all the time with us. So we're simply communicating through the same back channel. We're using the back channel and communicating that way. There's nothing dishonest about it. We're not lying in any way. We're not hiding anything. We're simply being crafty. There's a distinction between being crafty and being dishonest. We're simply getting the message across in a way where it's more easily received. Does that make sense? Yes. So then I'll go, you know, hey, I wanted to meet. I'm glad you laughed because I saw you here and I wanted to meet you. I'm glad you laughed. I saw you here and I want to meet the person wrapped in all the pretty. You get it? Yes. So if I start with a put on, I'll immediately go to direct and sincere. If I, I can also start with being direct and sincere, could I not? I could walk up to the girl who's there in the supermarket and say, uh, excuse me, I saw you shopping here and I wanted to meet you. 
I like saying it a little bit better. Guys, look, at, look up here. Here's a never fail fallback line. If you can't think of what to say, and your mind is going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I guarantee you this will work. You walk up and you say, excuse me, I noticed you here, and I realized if I didn't say something, I'd never get to meet you. <laughs> My name is X. Now, that's a devastatingly simple statement, correct? <clears throat> There's nothing she can argue with in that statement. Excuse me, I saw you here and I realized if I didn't say something, I'd never get to meet you. It's absolutely minimalist pickup artistry. <clears throat> I mean, what can she say? Oh, that's some slick bullshit pickup line? <laughs> It's about the least amount you could say and still get the message across, right? Yes, sir. Wow. That's a little heavy. <laughs> That's a little heavy. That's adding some weight. That's a very. Okay, listen. Excuse me, I noticed you here. And I realized if I didn't say something, I'd never get to meet you. Well, <laughs> I actually had women laugh when I say that. And I say, why are you laughing? They say, because it's so honest. Why that should create a laugh, I don't know. But I've had them laugh. Like, I, why do you? Because so, you're so direct or that's so honest. Women are not expecting. I'll tell you something else. Beautiful women are not used and not expecting to a direct, honest approach without any <coughs> bullshit. Because they're so used, ladies, you don't have to be on camera. You don't have to come up here. But please help with at least some participation. Have you not been bullshitted over and over and over again and heard everything come out of a male mouth? Yes or no? Yes? You, you'll, you'll go that far and help me out there. Yes? That's true, right? So how often have you had a guy, other than the fellas you're dating now, how often has a guy just come up to you with no bullshit and said, I saw you here and realized if I didn't say something, I'd never get to meet you. How often does that happen, Suvi? Does it happen often? Sometimes, but not very often? No. But that kind of approach is impressive, simply from the fact that it doesn't aim to impress at all. There's the paradox. <clears throat> In paradox, there's power. The fact that that approach has no intent of impressing whatsoever is what makes it impressive. And it's also pretty sexy because you're like, you're not begging for attention, going, here I am. I put my head on the chopping block. Here's the ax. What would you like to do? <laughs> the on ironic thing is it's so disarming that very few people will do anything other than be flattered. Even if she's not really interested or she's with someone, you just made her day. Now, I want to tell you something else. Very rarely in my career have I ever had women get actively nasty with me. Occasionally, as you've heard, it happens. 90% of the time, when it doesn't, I'm not saying it won't work 90% of the time, but when it doesn't work, within that world of things not going the way you want, 90% of the time, the worst that will happen is nothing will happen. 90% of the time, the worst that will happen is nothing will happen. She'll simply show no interest. She'll just stand there or smile or turn away. She's not going to yell at you, make fun of you, laugh at you. 9% of the time, she's not going to tell you to piss off. 90% of the time, can we actually shut off the AC or turn it down? It's a little bit much for me. It's hurting my throat. The dry air. 90% <clears throat> of the time, the worst that will happen is nothing will happen. I promise you. I told you those freakish times when women got mad for no, no reason. If they do get angry at you, what's our fallback line? Nothing, nothing I did nothing merits that kind of response. So whoever you're angry at, it's not me. Yes, James. I, I, I had a, a situation like that once. I, I actually handled it in a funny way, but it was a bit of a neg at the same time. Well, she, go ahead and tell me. Well, um, I, was, I, was, um, I walked up to this girl who was outside the club and said, excuse me, I'm just sorry to interrupt you. I just have to tell you for the most gorgeous looking woman I've seen tonight. It was just something stupid like that. It was just like a little experiment. And she turned around and just stopped and went, oh, blah, 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 blah. So I just turned around and walked away. And my friend um, decided he would go in and start trying his, uh, trying his luck and stuff. 
and I got far enough away and I shouted, Danny, stop winding up across the tube. You've only got a fiver and you don't give change. Oh, that's mean. <laughs> you hear what he said? He said... He said he told his friend, Donnie, stop winding, stop winding up the prostitute. You've only got a fiver and they don't give change. Oh, uh, See, that's unnecessary, but that's fucking funny. All right. So that's a simple, direct, sincere approach, right? I notice here and realize if I didn't say something, I'd never get to meet you. Can she argue with that? No. Can't she? So direct and sincere, put on. Now, this one's tricky. <clears throat> this one's tricky. It's intuition. It's having a genuine intuition about the person. Now, those of you who don't have any intuition, you do your cold reading stuff if you want to. But <clears throat> how do you develop intuition? What was an example of intuition? Well, when I looked into him and I said exactly what his own metaphor for his problem was, that was intuition. Right? But being intuitive, demonstrating understanding about her world. It doesn't even have to be a deep intuition. I would call this intuition or demonstrating understanding. Another word is simply pacing, verbal pacing. Demonstrating understanding, verbal pacing, verbal pacing, showing understanding or intuition about her world. Let's give some examples, because that's a very loose concept. Let's tie it down to the ground with some concrete examples, shall we? Yes. Yeah. Are you awake? Yes. Are you awake? Yes. I don't believe you. Yes. I have to drill my students, you know. I'm... All right. By the way, I noticed something very interesting about the Mill. I forget your name. Tell me your name again, Mill. My name. That she, when, when I give her a certain kind of attention, she turns beet red. <laughs> yeah, sort of like that. And you know, that's right. And when you flush in your face, sometimes the blood rushes elsewhere. <laughs> that's right. Mm. Yeah. And the more you struggle and try to fight it, the better it starts to feel. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And you know, when you struggle and fight against feelings, there's that other, that's right, much more responsive part. Because you thought you had to be up here for me to play with you, but really, we can play quietly together. You know, when you're a little girl, you thought about playing with boys. But then you thought about playing with men. Yeah, hmm. Anyway, <laughs> look up here. Look up here, James. Be a good boy. <laughs> You don't have to play with people in the way they expect or where they expect. You just watch responses. So anyway, <clears throat> room 8001. Anyway, <laughs> forget, forget, forget. Where were we? Oh, OK. Demonstrate. You can simply pace the ongoing situation. Let's say you see her in a pub and guys have been like disgusting her. They've just been awful. You can walk up and say, excuse me, but I'm your reward for the, so, the evening that's gone so badly so far. My name is. Now, that's both a put on, but it's also an observation, isn't it? Excuse me, but I'm your reward for how badly your evening has been going so far. My name is. You like that, don't you, Shirley? You like that? That would work on you, I think. I like it. But it's, a de it's demonstrating you understand her situation, that she, all these guys have been hitting on her, right? That's, that's what I did last night. The tube What's station. that? I did that last night at the tube station. You were predicting my, my game. Very good. What did you say? Well, this guy was like, quite drunk and was trying to chat this girl up, trying to get a number off her. And it was quite painful. So I was pretending to look at my tube map. Oh, that's right. And then um, she, walked, she started walking, and I started walking, and I just said, that was a really bad pickup he tried on you, wasn't it? And she was like, oh, yeah. Good opener. That was a really bad pickup he tried on you. <clears throat> so you can demonstrate that you understand what's going on in the context where she's at. So you can demonstrate you understand what's going on in the environment. It can be as simple as I, I often, I go to Starbucks a lot back home in L.A. And if I go, at, if you go at the right hour, you'll see women in line like, 
like this. They're waiting for their triple shot there. <laughs> and I'll say to them, wow, it looks like you have the I can't start brain. <laughs> it's an observation. I'm demonstrating that I understand what's going on with her. I'm doing it in a funny way. I could come up and say, you look like you really need your coffee. It doesn't have much impact. So in this case, I'm combining it. Do you see how I'm stepping? I sort of have a foot in both vibes. I have a foot in my demonstrating I understand her vibe, but I also have a foot in the funny put-on vibe. You understand? I'm kind of like taking this kind of stance. I've told this story many times. I'll tell it again because it's a good story. A couple years back, I was hanging out with my student, Dr. Ken. We were at an NLP event, not one of mine. <clears throat> and I said, let's go take a break. There's a place down the street where all the uh, Asian students from UCLA hang out because Dr. Ken's got an Asia fetish. Now, personally, I don't care. I'm most attracted to women who find me really hot. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter where they consciously realize that's what's happening. <laughs> what matters is that they want to respond powerfully. <laughs> Don't you? Think? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> anyway, so we went to this place, and it's the kind of place where it's sort of like a pub here. You order your food at the counter, and then you have a seat, and they bring it to you. Well, as we were at the counter, I looked over, and I noticed there was a very pretty Asian young lady, maybe 22, 23. She was sitting like this, and uh, she was studying her, her textbook, but she was She was clearly talking to herself inside her head. It didn't take a genius to see it. Uh, no, I didn't study. Where'd he go? Goran, Sauron, did he walk out of the room? He, oh, yeah. No, I didn't study in the Himalayas to be able to see this, right? I'm just <laughs> observing. So I said, aha, I'm going to have fun with this girl. So uh, we order our food. I'm sitting here. So the girl is sitting like behind me facing this way. I, I make sure Dr. Ken sits here. And so we sit down. I kind of wink at Ken. Uh, I, I go, I, I say to him under my breath, watch this, right? So I'm talking to Ken. Suddenly I turn around to her and say, excuse me, um, we have something very important to talk about here, and you look like a very loud thinker. Could I ask you not to think so loudly? <laughs> we need to talk. And I turned around. And Ken is like biting his lip, because obviously she's having a strong response. And so we're talking along, and then I whisper under my breath to Ken, OK, watch this now. <laughs> I turn around and say, excuse me, I told you not to think so loud. <laughs> I turned back around, and then a second later, I feel, and she said, I turned around and I said, yes. She said, who are you? <laughs> and then we start talking, and we're talking. And she starts talking to Dr. Ken. And uh, she's leaning in. And I kind of like lean back. And uh, <clears throat> I say, you know, I think you two should talk. And I get out of my chair, and she gets in my chair. And they're talking to Dr. She's talking to Dr. Ken. And I sort of pull this chair over here. And they're talking and talking. And she said, how old are you? He said, I'm 42. She said, no way. I don't believe it. You're 42? Show me. And he shows her the license. She says, oh my god, you're 42. You're 42. And so she starts talking again. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to go order dessert. I, so I walked to the counter, and these two are really connecting. I said to the, the lady at the counter, look at those two. What do you think? She said, oh my god, they're really clicking. I said, yeah, take your time with my chocolate cake. So I come back, and I said, you know, Dr. Ken, we really need to go. I think you guys should exchange an information, because you want to talk again. <laughs> and she went, we want to talk again. <laughs> And she goes to give him her number, and she says, wait a minute. You're 42. I can't give you my number. You're 42. And I said, you know what's going to happen? I turned my, I said to Dr. Ken, I said, you know what's going to happen? A minute from now, we're going to walk out of here. And what's going to happen is she's going to start to kick herself and go, oh my god, I let another one go. Why did I do that? Why didn't I call him? Oh, I should have gotten his number. Anyway, come on, Ken. And we are, wait. <laughs> now, Charlene, was I manipulating that girl as you would define it? Is that manipulation? I'm serious. 
No? It's pretty clever, though, isn't it? So <clears throat> that was an example of observing her experience, right? I was demonstrating understanding in her world because she was talking to herself, but I also made it a put on. I could have walked up and said, excuse me, whatever you're studying must be very difficult because clearly you're struggling to understand it. I could have done that. I could have done that. But that kind of approach is no fun. I don't want to do that. That's not very fun, is it? No. Right? So this, this, and this. And finally, I just lump this in a general category. I call it comment, question, Actually, strike this. Strike that. Strike that. Direct and sincere can also include a comment, observation, or question. Yeah, Hold on. Yes. Yes. The intuition. I'm so proud of you. You didn't see what he did. He started the to do what he used to do, and then he dropped it and came from here. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply proud of you. The intuition stuff, is there a way that you can teach us that we can sit back, watch, and see can we kind of step inside of the other person? God, I'm proud of this man. <laughs> I'm not being funny. He should have been in the previous step. What a fucking great piece of work this was. See what's going on, and then your mom watching for about five minutes and your own conscious or your conscious picks something up and then over you go, break or stay, and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> and when the people saw the man sitting in his right mind clothed next to Jesus, they were sore afraid and begged him to leave their country. Can you believe this question that he's asking so intelligently? Shirlene could probably would be the, probably the better peach person to teach you this. What I, can, I can give you the start of it. The start of it is doing that meditation practice to quiet your mind. That beginning breath meditation I gave you will not only quiet your mind, but trust me, over time, it will open up your intuitive mind. And here's the other point. The more you can observe yourself without buying into it, the more you would then be able to understand other people. The ability to peer into yourself without fear because you're no longer buying into the old story frees you to understand yourself, and through that, you'll be able to understand other people. That simple, non-glamorous, unheroic, even boring exercise I gave you has profound implications. Now, we're trained as humans in this culture to look for the heroic, that it's got to be a lightning bolt striking us that has any value. But the spark in the right place is as powerful as the lightning bolt in the myth. And that little spark, that was really good. I'm going to say that again for those of you. That <laughs> I just made that up on the spot. The spark in the right place is more powerful than the lightning bolt in the myth. Do that exercise as a start. All right. <clears throat> I include, I lump into this category also comment, question, observation. So I'll say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? You carry yourself with such discipline and elegance. Do you study yoga or dance? Right? So I'll say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Do you study yoga or dance? Because you carry yourself with discipline and elegance. Or I, some, when I see a woman who seems to have a really good energy, I'll say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> you do some kind of meditative or spiritual practice because you have a... You have a lovely energy about you. It's direct and sincere, but it's more like a question and an observation. It doesn't take the form of, excuse me, I noticed you had a great energy, I wanted to meet you. It's, excuse me, do you do some kind of yoga practice or meditation? Often I'll put it like this, excuse me, do you do some kind of yoga practice or meditation? And then when they say, why, why do you ask? I say, because you have just a beautiful energy about you. So it's sort of like a question and a compliment, or an observation and a compliment. So it's compliment, question, observation, and a different combination. No, there's not. Comment, question, observation. 
One of the ones I like to ask, I'll ask this one and say, excuse me, but can you fight? That's sort of a put on, but it's also, if I notice a woman carries herself really quickly, like she can fight, I'll say, excuse me, no, I'll say, can you fight? And that's, they go, what? They don't know if they're being complimented or insulted, <laughs> which is not my intent. But if they look like they can fight, I'll ask that. And usually they say, well, if you try to take my purse, sometimes they can fight. If they can fight, they're deeply flattered that you picked it up. <clears throat> can you fight? Now, one of my favorites is what I call the blurt out. Not the blurt out, but the blurt out. I love this one. The blurt out tied in with the indirect compliment. The blurt out and the implied compliment. So write down blurt out, implied compliment. I want you to write down implied compliment, blurt out, and then write out in quotes the phrase, it's just that. It's just that. Trust me on this, guys, OK? Write that down. So write down implied compliment, blurt out, it's just that. Do you trust me on this? Now, throughout this course, I've been talking about the power of implying things, yes? We can imply things by being vague, by leaving things out. The implication is far more powerful. <clears throat> for example, if I said to one of the ladies back there, the reason that you can feel an attraction for me is you notice I'm a great speaker and I have a nice jawline. Yeah. In Internally, they go, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. Right? What's wrong with me presenting something that specific? Someone tell me. Why is it ineffective? Why is that ineffective? It may not match their experience. They may not see that at all. It may not be the case at all that you see me being very good looking and attractive. Right? They may not see that. Really see that. They may not. Ah, <laughs> oh, you got it. See? Ah. Exit stage left. Okay, but see that doesn't work because it's statement may not match the experience. But if I say you know it's not that uncommon for someone as you sit there to realize that there's just something, something tickling in the back of your mind where you can't quite put your finger on the attraction, but something. It's just something. Maybe you try to hide it, but. Anyway, I find when I let those feelings run through your mind, <laughs> mm, then you start to think about other things. Now, did I say anything? Did I say what it is? Did I? Nope. Not at all. When it's, when it's implied or vague, it slides in because there's no resistance. So I want to talk about the implied compliment. So your, your like, describe it feeling of energy that's gone through someone. Right, but I'm not saying exactly how it works. Right, because that's been vague. Right. I didn't say it starts in your face and then it swirls around the small of your back, blah, blah. I didn't, I didn't do that because it may not match their experience. Now, look up here. The indirect compliment. Guys, this is really powerful. Supposing I walked up to a woman and I said, you know, I noticed that you have real class and real style, and I wanted to say hello. Anything wrong with that? No. Perfectly fine approach. Here's a better way to do it. You walk up and you say, excuse me, it's just that I really admire women with class and style, so I had to say hello. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between those two things? Challenge. Ladies, what would be the difference between a guy walking up to you and say, excuse me, I just Notice you have so much class and so much style, I had to say hello. And a guy saying, it's just that I really admire women with class and style, so I had to say hello. She's borderline. She's not 100% sure that it's... There's a slight difference in there. There's a little bit of a... Sure if it's her. 
There's a subtle difference there. The difference is, in the first case, I stated directly that that's what I think about you. But in the second case, I didn't directly state it. I said, I really admire women with class and style. So I had to come up and say hello. The implication is that's what I think about her. But I didn't state it directly. So her mind fills in that gap. And it's no longer a compliment that she resists because her mind is filling in that gap. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Excuse me. It's just that I really admire women with pouting blowjob lips. So I had to say hello. No, my, comment, my compliments and openers are never sexual. Or usually not. Although, um, la there was a woman here a few nights ago at some executive conference who was driving me up a tree. She had to be in her early 40s. And she looked so fucking good in that tight, gray, formal business suit. And her legs were like, her, her, business mini, her business skirt was like a little unbusinesslike. And she had these horn rim black glasses, you know. And there was just something. I was like too exhausted. But my student gave me a nudge. He said, how would you pick her up? And it came to my mind immediately. I said, I'd walk up to her and say, excuse me, I don't know whether it's the glasses or the clothes or the way you move what's inside those clothes, but you're driving me crazy. And I had to come up and say, hi, my name is. Now, I was just too completely shagged out to do it, like completely knackered. That's the word. <clears throat> I, I didn't do it because I was like completely exhausted. But that's sort of like... Um, that's pretty direct, and it's pretty complimentary, too. It's cheeky. So the implied compliment is really powerful. It takes the form of, it's just that I, and then you say what you like. It's just that I really admire women who carry themselves with a certain grace and power. So I had to say hello. You get it? Hold on before you ask. Do you get it? Yes. It takes the form of, it's just that I really like or I really admire women who X, and you describe them, so I had to say hi. You like it? Yes. My name is now. You get that? Now, the blurred out, <clears throat> I've lumped this in with the blurred out, because a blurred out works like this. You're walking this way, and she's walking this way. Look here. A blurred out works like this. She's moving this way, and you're moving this way. I know, geographically, whenever we're going like this, I'm going to use a blurred out. A blurred out is you simply say, you're thinking out loud. You say whatever comes to your mind, provided it's non-sexual. Right? So if what comes to your mind is great legs, you can say that. If what comes to your mind is strap her to a tree and do the, you can't say anything <laughs> sexual. No, James, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to understand, in your interaction, she was the one who said that she wanted you to duct tape her. She brought it up. She said, duct tape me and fuck me like you're raping me. She said it. Okay? Didn't come out of your mouth. Okay, that's the difference. You got to talk to this boy. See, uh, just do me a favor, these other pickup instructors. Stand up and lift your shirt. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. <laughs> I get guys like this laid, okay? You want me to? Yeah, show, show them. Me. Show them what you're packing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, all right, sit down. Dude, no, 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 no. All right. All right, sit down. Oh, my God, it's like fucking a hug and, it's hugging a fucking rug. I get guys like this laid. Oh. Next time it's my uh, I'll never mention it again. He's like ready to vomit. <laughs> I get guys like that like. Okay, put it back on. Put it back on. So the blurred out, you're just saying whatever comes off the top of your head. You know, I like to talk about what comes off the top of my head. Oh, you got to go? Did you enjoy it? Right. So whatever comes off the top of your head is what you want to give the girl. You got it? So for example, I remember I was coming down the steps of, of a parking structure. She was walking up. And as she walked up, 
what I noticed about her is she was incredibly stylish. So I just blurted out, style to burn. And she walked by, and I turned around to look, and she was looking back at me. She said, what did you say? I said, you got style to burn. She wound up talking to me. She said, why don't we talk again over a beer? This girl was like 22-year-old marine biologist studying for her master. She was Canadian. And she shows up for our coffee meeting wearing like four-inch stiletto heels and a fucking skin-tight outfit. I'm like, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone is staring at me. I'm just like, this happened when I was three years ago. This 45-year-old, I'm not ugly, OK? But this 45-year-old, fairly handsome, <laughs> this 45-year-old guy, this, she's, and she's got tattoos. Oh, I didn't see the tattoos. Like, she's wearing this super low-cut, hot, tight dress with tattoos all over her back. Like, uh, I'm like, wow. And every head is turning as, we're, as we walk in together. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool to blurt out. Hmm? <laughs> blurt out. So you just say whatever comes off the top of your head. Um, I've done this so many times, it, it's, it's, it, you don't rehearse it. Now, you can do a rehearsed blurt out. The rehearsed blurt out is, it's just that. It's just that, it's just that I really admire, as she's walking by, you say, it's just that I admire your class and style. Or it's just that I really admire women with class and style. Right? That seems a bit strange doing that as a blurt out. I know, but you can. You can use that. I re, it's just that I really admire women of, in, in, in any of these. Now, um, I'm going to take 10 more minutes, and then I want to bring Shirlene up for like 45 minutes, OK? And finish up what you need to teach them. But, and then I promise you we'll do more on this, and I'll give you some pattern sequences, because I promised you, right? We'll go to like 738. Any objections? Yeah. Fuck oh. off. <laughs> now look. It's kind of, sort of. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sense in which they do, because when I'm being direct, I'm sort of coming from the place of being commanding, but I'm also being vulnerable, right? When I'm putting them on, I'm coming from that vibe of being funny, right? <clears throat> when I do this, I'm demonstrating authority in their world. Yes. Yes. So I am, sh I am doing all of them. Now look here. One more piece. This is not going to seem to make any sense. I've never explicitly taught it before. But I realize it's a big piece of what I do. And I've been remiss as a teacher. Where do I go from there? Once I introduce myself, where do I go from there? Yes? What's that, love? That's for me? Is it ticking? Okay, Grant from the Anti-Defamation League, you're Nick, mate. Okay, never mind that. And action. Shh. From there, where do we go? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. From there, there's two directions, two or three directions you can go. I can begin to discuss something in the environment. Discuss something in environment I can discuss something about her Discuss something about the environment. Discuss something about her. So I walk up and I do this in the tube station, right? Let's say I walk up and do this in the tube station. I do any of these openers. I introduce myself. She gives me her name. I could say, you know what I would like to do in the tube station? I like to sort of play this game. 
who's getting some? I wouldn't necessarily do that in a tube station. But you could, right, you could discuss something in the environment and or offer a game. Offer a game. You could discuss something in the environment, offer a game, discuss something about her. So, you know, I, I noticed something about you. You seem to be the kind of person who likes to learn about yourself, right? And then where could you go from there? You could. But here's the one I've been using lately with fabulous success. It doesn't make any sense. It's contrary to what I've always taught, but it works. Are you ready? Yes. I haul out the non sequitur. Can anyone translate the Latin? Who had a proper English education and learned Latin? Say again? Yeah, I know, but can anyone translate the Latin? Yeah, I know, but can anyone? I, I'm showing, yeah. Yeah. Non sequitur means it doesn't follow. There's no logical connection between what you just said and elephant fart. See, I just did one. Right. <clears throat> I'll trot out a non sequitur. But the non sequitur actually leads into a little bit of a game. The non sequitur I've been using with fabulous success, I, I, I just try it, is I say, so, are you a roller, a folder, or in, in America we say tosser, but tosser doesn't mean the same thing as it does here. I say, are you a roller, a folder, or a thrower? Now, invariably the response is, well, what, do you, what does that mean? This, in effect, is a game or a quiz. So I like to go to like a little game or a quiz, so you can write that down. It is, an, it is a game or a quiz. In fact, I'm, I say, are you a roller, a folder, or a thrower? And she'll say, what do you mean by that? I'll say, here I go. So well, let's say we're on vacation. We have our suitcases open. I'm going to take you to the most incredible, anywhere you want to go, and you're packing your bag. Do you throw your clothes in? Do you roll them, or do you fold them? Now, I've never had this not work. They always bite down on this one. I don't know why, but they do. Now, whatever answer they give me, I'm going to play with the answer. Let's say I'm a folder. I'll say, you're a folder? I said, well, you know, I'm a toss. I'm a, I'm a tosser. <laughs> I'm an occasional tosser. I'll say... If they say they're a folder, I'm going to say, oh, well, I'm a roller. You know, rollers and folders, they usually don't get along unless there's some kind of chemistry here. Did you catch it? Oh, you like that, Frenchman, didn't you? <clears throat> I'll say, if they say they're a folder, I'm going to say, well, I'm a roller. Rollers and folders don't get along unless there's some kind of chemistry here. Do you get the little suggestion just to get the ball rolling a little bit? Hmm? And then I go, you're not going to believe this, but I go into the following. I say, but you know, when you do like to get away, when you do want to escape and indulge yourself or get away, what do you really love to do? And you'd be surprised how quickly they go right into it. So let's say she says, well, you know what I really love to do? I love to go skiing. You say, and she, I said, really? Well, and tell me about that. And as she starts to tell you, you stop her. You go, wait a minute. Take me along with you. So we're there in the Alps. Let's say she says she wants to go skiing in the Alps. She goes, take me along with you. So we're there in the Alps. What hour, what time do we arrive? Well, it, it's noon. And, and what's the air feel like? She goes, well, it's really crisp. Okay. And are we dressed for skiing? Or we? She goes, no, we have to get into our ski clothes. Okay. And, and so we're there on the slope. What do we do? Do we have a little something to drink beforehand? She says, well, I like hot chocolate. I say, tell me how your hot chocolate... Is it sweet or a little bitter? I have her describe it. And say, so I take the cup and sip it from you. Do I like it or do I give it back to you? She says, you like my chocolate. They'll play back with you. Do you understand? Now stop right there. The natural objection is, come on. You mean women will actually play with you like this? Not all of them. The ones that don't play with me like this, guess what I've learned? Who is our favorite philosopher? Is it Socrates? No. Is it Karl Marx? No. Is it, uh, is it, um, is it uh, Euripides of Euclidion? Uur is it Euripides of Uranus? No. <laughs> Our favorite philosopher is Snagglepuss. And what does Snagglepuss say? Exit, stage left. 
Right. So I want to screen early on to see, does she have an imagination? Is she playful? And will she engage with me? You're saying, yes, they do do this. How do you know? Well, if they don't, then it stays back. I thought maybe you've played this game before or something like it. Game, no. no. Right? So I go right into that. And by the time I'm done, within 20 minutes of meeting her, we've already gone on a romantic vacation in the Swiss Alps together. That's not bad for the first 20 minutes of conversation. You're looking at me like, that's really wicked. Yeah, yeah. When I was going home on the tube last night, because it was packed, there was a couple of nice, saucy Indian girls that got on. Nice, <laughs> saucy Indian girls. Let's say that. Nice, nice saucy, saucy Indian, Indian girls. girls. I love Indian women, too. I think they're the most exotically beautiful women in the world. I think they're awesome. But So I moved my way in beside them on the tube, and... They were being noisy and shouting and one of their girls' birthday parties and one of them had to stand beside me. She had no choice. So... <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I started a bit of bullshit about, well, where's the party on tonight and stuff, but then I said to her, you know, I was putting the 20% of power to my feet and I said to her, if we could put time and money to one side, what would you like to do, and where would you like to go? And she said, eh, I'd like to go to Italy to see Del Piero play in a stadium and move in the Ferrari. Now, I'm just, I didn't stop her when she started off because we didn't go through this yesterday. Hold on right there. Who did she say she wanted to see? Say again. Del Piero. He's Who's this? He plays for what? the top Right there, what I would have done is said, Del Piero, tell me more about Del Piero. And if you could have an audience with Del Piero, what would it feel like the moment before he opens the door and you know he's about to walk through? You understand? Talk to her about her feelings about Del Piero. Bring that up. She's, getting, she's handing you a silver platter, mate. So go ahead. Yeah, it was, she just said maybe, and flying in a, around in a Ferrari with him. And I said, right, just with all the letter on the, the, the letter on letter on the inside of the Ferrari, some music on, flying along the coast when the sun is sinking into the back of the sea. I want to go out with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, stop. Have you ever thought, have you ever in your life, before you took course with me, ever even thought of experiencing the world in that way? Did you ever think to yourself in these terms? You never thought in these imaginative, sensory-rich terms, did you? You getting this, reporter? Did you ever think of understanding or looking at women through those sensory-rich, imaginative, romantic terms? No. Did you ever think of talking to women in those sensory-rich, romantic terms? No. So do you get what's going on here, Jonathan? He's actually transforming. In order to understand and do better with women, he's transforming how he thinks about the world. Oh, duh, it's, it's right. Just, when you were on about dreams, something that really was very powerful for me, I went to my friend's about six months ago on a Sunday morning, and he was waking up out of bed, and he was, and he said, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I had a fucking dream last night that I was wrestling this big rat with fucking teeth on it like a tiger. And I could imagine, I could picture it in my head. Hi, I'm Ross Jeffries. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? <laughs> yes, many people are afflicted with bizarre mentation syndrome. <laughs> if they're Irish and they're on my course, it's especially likely. Send your donation to Tabitha Cat. Yes, go ahead. Finish up because we got a lot to do. No, it was just that he, he said to me that he, he imagined it. He said he had this dream that he was lying in his bed and he was wrestling this big rat. And I laughed at him and thought, yeah, that's quite funny, Damo. I can imagine that. And I could. Right. And it was just when you were talking about the dream process, it, it clicked because I've had these thoughts in my head before without I've actually been aware of them. About wrestling rats? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. You're good. Be quiet. <laughs> no, you be quiet too. Shut up. We got to keep moving.
I'm going to go for a non sequitur. From there, I'll invite her to play this imagination game. Do you understand? Right early on, within the first three to five minutes, I want to start engaging playfully. I want to start a playful engagement with that woman to see, will she play with me? Now, for example, with these ladies in the back, they will not play with me in front of the room. And I can only play a limited extent with them in the back of the room. But there's a limited extent to which I can play in the back of the room. It's mostly energetic and nonverbal. <laughs> there you go. It's got like a five second delayed fuse, but when the fuse burns, it burns. Look at her. Look how red she turns. See? Yeah, hi. <laughs> of course, if you came up here, you wouldn't need to turn red, but it's your choice. At least not where it's visible. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So I want to engage the woman playfully early on. Within the first five minutes, look at me, I want to en playfully engage her in a way where she has to participate. Remember I talked about participation and investment? I'm going to do something early on that requires her participation and investment. That's why I'm not going to launch into some long wordy pattern, because it doesn't require her participation. There are all sorts of things you can do. This is one of them. Got girls for me to play with. Last time I was here, a guy had me brought his wife, and I, anchor, I had her orgasming on stage. I said, my intent was to make her more attracted to him. I said, now open your eyes, look out, and give all that energy to your husband. Look out. And she said, I don't see him, even though he's sitting right there. <laughs> and then and, and two other guys brought their, uh, one brought his girlfriend. I played with her. They're now, uh, they're married. She's got a baby coming. Say la vie. Now, I know there's a lot more I promised to teach you, so we'll go to at least 8 o'clock. We may take a brief, we'll take like a 15 minute break between then and now. But I'm going to keep teaching. Do you want me to keep teaching? Yes. Can we have a hand for Shirlene? It's good propaganda to have a woman as part of the team because it makes me look better. That's the only reason why you're here. Piss off. All right. So, so we were going over here to um, just getting into doing sequences. My preference is when I've, once I've made my introduction, I want to go into something that requires their involvement and participation. You understand? Because this is one of the things I'm screening for. So something that would involve their, here, there are two ways in which you can get a woman to begin to get involved, to require her involvement and her participation. There are two basic ways you can go. There are two basic ways you can get a woman started in this process of involvement and participation, right? One is a gun and the other is a knife. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just taking some swats at Shirlene back there to wake her up. You can ask question, you can ask a question, or you can play a game, play game, quiz. Generally speaking, once I've made my introduction, I'll either start out by asking a question, or playing a game or a quiz, or combining the two. I don't start out with a heavy pattern like Discovery Channel or Blowjob Pattern or anything like that. I can go with a game or a quiz or I'll ask a question. So here are some of the games and quiz, uh, quizzes I would do and how I would bring them up. So first of all, so here's our introduction, our opener. Yes? And then we have a decision tree. We can go one of two ways. We can ask a question. Or we can go to a game, quiz, demo, something like that. These are our two different pathways we're going to take. Do we understand that splitting yeah. off? The early model of speed seduction, which was done before many of you had even reached puberty. Were you even going through, in 1993, were you even, you, you had not even reached puberty, had you? You weren't even, you were barely in, out of, out of, children's clothes. You were five years old. You like to rub that in, don't you? 
Now, when you rub that kind of thing in, it makes you, is it like, no, never mind. <laughs> I would like you to rub something in. Or out, doesn't matter. In, out, in, out. Rub it in. <clears throat> now, I can ask a question, or I can go to a game or a quiz or a demo. The early model of speed seductions would go right into a heavy pattern. Like, you know what's interesting is you ever felt an incredible connection with someone? Like, you know that kind of click right in there that just makes, I would start with a heavy thing like that. I don't do that anymore for so many reasons I can't even count them. Uh, I don't even want to go into the reasons why I don't do it, but I don't do it. This is much more fun, much more easy, much less work, much more incorporating her participation. First and foremost, the thing I'm screening for is I want to see will the woman playfully participate with me. You see, 50% of this is picking the right person to play with. You could use the word subject if you want for the purposes of this discussion. I really mean it. I want to find out in the first three to five minutes, is there any chance energetically that she and I are going to connect and enjoy each other? And so in a sense, remember I gave you the metaphor of shaking you guys? The first evening I'm shaking you. I'm shaking you with laughter. I'm shaking you by presenting you with the most unlikely example of success, James. <laughs> Um, I love you, James. You're great. You're going to give me that testimonial, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you imagine if you tune into the internet and you see this guy on the internet saying, Hi, I'm James, and he tells the story of how he got a super hot lesbian to show him her dripping wet knickers and then took her home and duct taped her to the bed and banged her silly and gave out my website address. That might get some traffic, don't you think? That's quite a convincer. Huh? The Forbes list? I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> Just never you mind. So anyway, so I want to ask a question, or I want to offer a game quiz, or because I want to see if she's going to participate. It's almost like, and I don't mean this in any kind of violent or mean or intrusive or violative sense, but it's like I'm connecting with her energetic field, and I'm shaking it a little bit. I'm shaking it, and then I'm letting go. Because I want to hear, is there resonance? Is it resonating in response to my shaking? Or is it going crack? Is there stress? You understand? It's almost like I'm striking a gong, and I want to feel, is there resonance to what I'm, the energy I'm presenting? Yeah, I'm like pinging. I'm shaking a little bit, not in any kind of intrusive or violative way, but stirring, I'm stirring up the molecules of who she is, and then I'm stepping back to hear how those molecules sing. I sort of shake up the molecules of who she is, I'm stepping back to here. Are the molecules singing back to me? Or are they groaning or, or complaining? And right there, it's going to tell me everything I really need to know. Hold on. It's going to tell me if she's going to participate with me. It's going to tell me, is she primarily someone who I need to talk to about abstract concepts, or I need to bring it down to earth and get her own experience? It's going to tell me a lot. That initial moment, a few minutes of encountering her and seeing how she responds to my energetic Shaking, but again, I don't mean shaking in any kind of, I'm using not a precise term. Surely you have an idea of what I mean, but it's not shaking like this, it's agitating in a sense, dancing. So I'm going to game quiz demo or ask a question. Now, what would be an example of a game or a quiz? Twin brothers, remember? Did I not tell you about the twin brothers scenario? You know that one? It's on my gold walk-up DVD. Twin brothers scenario, I could offer um, the snack quiz. You remember my snack quiz? The snack quiz is I'll say, OK, let's see if we're snack compatible. It's very important. Anyone who I'm going to hang out with has to be snack compatible with me. Right? Now, the presupposition of that is that we're going to be hanging out, right? Snack compatible. I say, OK, you ready? And then I'll say, answer honestly. Now, for some reason, I don't know what it is. And I don't know how it applies in Britain, but at least in the United States, and I suspect in the Western world, women like to read these magazines where they have quizzes. Is your husband a really good lover? Take this Cosmo quiz. Or is your boyfriend really good in bed? Take the Cosmo quiz. Is your lardy fat ass and thighs getting so big your boyfriend's cheating on you? Take the quiz. The, the, there's just something about quizzes that women, there's something about it that they love. So 
The snack quiz goes like this. I'll say, okay, let's see if we're snack compatible. Uh, here we go. Answer honestly. The first choice. Ready? Ritz crackers or little goldfish snacks? Ritz crackers or little goldfish snacks? Do you guys know what Ritz crackers are? Do you get them here? What? Oh, you don't get the little, well, come up with some snack. Uh, crisps, do you get Pringles here? Okay, you could say Pringles or pretzels. Pringles or pretzels? Now, no matter what answer she gives you, you go, eh, oh God, well, it's two out of three. So her first answer is always gonna be incorrect. Not in the sense of punishing her or anything, it's just being playful, like, oh, damn. Like, shucks. Pringles or pretzels, right? The next one is, I, I'm stumped here, guys, because normally I use, um, I use Ritz crackers. And what are some common snacks in Britain? I don't know. All in one gulp, or do you eat them one little bite at a time? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, do you eat it all at once? Do you eat the whole pack? How many come in a pack? Okay, do you, do you eat, like, can you... Are you the kind of person who has a lot, uh, who has no self-control, or can you eat just one? Well, that doesn't have to be Jaffa cakes. That can be your favorite stuff. Just use it. Now you're speeding up again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're okay. I, I approve of you. You don't have to keep talking. You get it? So she says, if she says Jaffa cake, no matter what her answer is, you go, absolutely, you go, right. You got that one. And you say, can you eat just, do you have to eat the whole thing or can you eat just one? You could even go into a little bit of blowjob pattern. You could say, you know, I have this friend who loves Jaffer cakes, but she doesn't eat them right away. She thinks about them all day long. And she says there comes that moment where she's ready, you know, you know when you're ready to indulge yourself and she like undresses that pack, that Jaffer's cake? And she just holds it against her tongue. And she says, it's like an explosion of pleasure in your mouth. She says, it's like an explosion of pleasure in her mouth. She says, it's like an explosion of pleasure in your mouth. Now, you're kind of doing it tongue in cheek, right, to see how she responds. You're playing. Then you do the final one. <clears throat> in the States, I say, I say, now listen, it's a trick question. So listen carefully. This is a trick question. Reese's Cups. Do you get Reese's cups here? They're peanut butter cups. Do you get chocolate covered peanut butter cups here? You don't have chocolate covered peanut butter cups here? You fucking primitives. Do you have them? What do they call them? Reese's? Reese's cups or s'mores? Do you have s'mores here? You fucking primitive animals. You don't have s'mores? S'mores are what you do with a s'more is you take a graham cracker coated with chocolate and then you take marshmallows and melt it in between and it's like a chocolate marshmallow sandwich. There's a kind that's pre-made but then there's a kind that you actually make. You melt the chocolate like in a saucepan and uh, you toast the marshmallows and melt them and then you pour the chocolate over the graham crackers and take the melted marshmallow and you have like a little sandwich. It's super sugary sweet. Well, do you have anything like that? I'm going, to open, well, I'm going to open a homemade s'mores stand and make a fortune here in Hammersmith. What would, it, what would be the equivalent? <laughs> What's a wagon wheel? Is that some kind of Geordie slang for a woman who's got, had 15 children? Oh, I had some wagon wheel last night. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more. Oh, I had a camel's yawn myself. It was like fucking the night. Oh, I got myself a King Kong finger. <laughs> um, so you would say, I would say like, I would say Reese's cups or s'mores. And then when, whatever she says, it's the right answer, right? I'll say, see, we're snack compatible. It's just a cute little game. But listen, it's not a typical, because there are other schools that pick up Huh. That, that teach little games like this, but there's a difference here. What is the topic we're already starting in on? Within the first three minutes, what is the theme here? What? Say it. You got it right. Say it out loud. I can't hear you. That's right. We already got her talking about indulgence. Now, do you want to know how I came up with the snack quiz? I swear this is true. I was in a car wash, 
in uh, Venice, and these two girls, one girl was eating snacks, and the other girl was eating some other kind of snacks. They didn't even know each other. And one girl says, what are you having? She says, oh, I'm having these. She says, oh, I quite like these, but, but these are even better. And they started talking about all the snacks they like to eat. And then they were talking about the snacks they like to eat before they go to sleep in bed. And I swear, I almost heard the obligatory porno background music like, <laughs> in my mind. Like, here comes the obligatory gratuitous lesbian scene at the car wash. But I thought, hey, that's really good. This is what women talk about amongst themselves. And they were sort of like salivating, talking about their various treats. And it involves oral pleasure, right? Doesn't it? <coughs> Run with it. So you see that early on, right on, within the first three minutes, we're very kind of subtly introducing a very interesting theme, which is indulgence. Do you get it? So you could go to a gamer quiz. Another game I quite like that works really well with waitresses, bartenders, that sort of thing. It's not mine. I give full credit to Neil Strauss. Neil Strauss came up with it, but it's really good. It never fails to create a playful atmosphere. It's fantastic. It's called the five questions game. Will you play the five questions game with me? You don't have to come up on stage. You can sit right there. Will you play? Yep. OK, very good. OK, the way the game works is like this. I'm going to ask you five questions. You've got to get them all wrong. You understand? If you get them all wrong, you win. And I'll give you 20 quid. But if you get even one of them right, you lose, and I get to punch you in the arm. Fair enough? <laughs> I'm not making any promises. That's the game. Are you ready? So you've got to get them all wrong. OK? Here we go. What's your name? OK. What city are we in? What planet are we on? <laughs> hey, it works. Okay. How, how many was that? Shut up, guys. <laughs> but, OK, but you've played this before. Yeah. You have? Yes. You really have played it before? Yes. But you answered right, so you lose. <laughs> <laughs> Hold out the arm. Hold out the arm. No, I'm not going to hit you. I'm not going to. Yes, I will. That's the game. It's just a cute little fun game. There's no. Serious intent, it's just like, it, it's fun. It creates a fun little thing that it's you and her having a nice little talk. I've used it. I give full credit to Neil. It's not mine. Um, you want a special funny version of the first question? I go like, am I the greatest, best looking guy in the world? If she says no, I'm like, well, thank you. If she says yeah, I'm like, ah, you're mean. But oh, that's good. And, <laughs> yeah, but it produces some, um, how it's called? It's like an interruption in the game because I can... Play with the answer. Ausgezeichnet. Very good. Confusion. Good. Then okay. More, um, I appreciate it, but we're in a hurry tonight, okay? <laughs> okay, it's just a fun little game. You remember my twin brothers thing? You could play that, yes? Yeah. Yes. My little non sequitur. Are you a roller, a folder, or a thrower? They always get talking. I say, so, okay, so we're going on vacation, right? Would you roll your clothes, do you fold them, or do you throw them? She answers, and you go, oh, we're not compatible. Go, but you know, that, just for, for fun, you know, I heard this question at the party. If you could go somewhere where money and time were no object, where would you go, and what would you enjoy the most? And as soon as she starts answering, you go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Take me along with you. So we're there at the Alps. So you can go right to that. You understand? So you can play one of these little games. If you're in a club or a pub or something like this, what game could you play in a club or a pub or a party or a place where there's a lot of people gathered together? What's the game? Remember what I told you? You know what game I like to play in a place like this? Who's not getting any? I like to look around the room and say, who's gone at least a year without getting any? So let's play. What about that guy over there? And women are mean as hell. They love this game. They all want to play. I'll go, what about that girl? No, she's not had any, you know, or with her. And I play this little game with them. You get it? Yeah. And then where could you go from there? Once I played this little game and we're having fun together, where could I go from there? Shirlene gave me a good one. Shirlene is a wicked natural speed seducer. <laughs> Shirlene, said, Shirlene said, here's a good one, Paul. You do this stuff, and then you talk to the girl. You say, you know what's interesting in a place like this is most of the time, you talk to someone, and the conversation doesn't go anywhere. But every once in a while, 
It's just there's a really strong connection. What would that look like? <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah. I wonder what that would look like. It's like you're putting your head on the platter and showing your face. Never mind. Anyway, you see where this could go? Yes. So <clears throat> if you play, you could play that little game with her. But here's something else I do. This is really interesting. Look here. Let's say I don't want to go the game route. You could go from a game. You could go from a game to the question, right? You could play a little game with her, and then you could ask a seduction question, which I'm going to get to. Or you could go straight to the seduction question. You get it? Thank you. Bye-bye. Shalom. I'll see you next trip. Lahitra Oat. Tack, tack. Bye-bye. Shalom. Lahitra Oat. All right. Now look here. Here's a general rule. When, I, when I'm about to ask a seduction question, before I do, I ask a stupid question, and then I pull it back. I have found in my experience that it just works better if I start to talk like a normal stupid guy and then stop myself and go in the right direction. So here's what I'll do. Like, I, I remember doing this at a place called James Beach. Did you ever go to James Beach, Shirlene, in Venice? I'm sitting there having dinner at the bar. Look at this, guys. Here's how I open. There's three girls and a guy sitting at the bar having dinner. I walk in. I sit down and say, bartender, I'm buying drinks for all these people. They can have water or ice water. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I open up. And I start to so, so how do you guys all know each other? And I go, OK, you. We're going to play the five questions game. I play the five questions game with her, and all the friends are laughing. And then um, they say, well, who the hell are you? And I say, well, I'm so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And um, that's how I came in really funny, just like that. And I said, and I said I, I'm just talking to them, and I'm just, for, I talk casually just for a few minutes. You know, how do you guys know each other? Blah, blah, blah. And I turn to one of them, and I start to say, so what do you do for a, and I stop myself. I'll say, you know what, never mind that. I said, when you really want to cut loose, when you really want to indulge yourself and escape, what do you love to do? And what's something you really like to do but haven't yet found someone to try it with? Or what's something you really like to do but you just haven't got let yourself try? And she went off on this huge thing about scuba diving and the a um sa say the sail say yeah, where are those? Yeah, Indian Ocean. She had this thing. She'd been there once, and she's, she just went crazy telling me about it. It's the most beautiful experience of her life. I said, wait a minute, slow down a minute. I'm a little slow. You're going to have to take me along with you for me to get it. So <laughs> we're there, and, and with, we had this 20-minute long scuba diving expedition, and we're going down in the water. I said, OK, now when we go down together, <laughs> are you guys getting this? This is what I'm saying. So I said, so we're going down together. Are we going down? Slowly, or are we going down fast? And she said, oh, we're going down slowly. We're enjoying going down together. She's like, oh, really? So we're talking about how the water, and we swim through this secret cove and see all these beautiful fish. And as we're ascending together, we're feeling more and more joyous until we come to the surface. And um, you know, we like look in each other's eyes, and we're so happy to be there. And she's like, and she's we just lean in and start kissing each other, like in front of her friends. And uh, her friends are like, uh, uh, I go, no, nah. then I stop. I was like, oh, we're just being friendly, blah, 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 blah. But that's pretty damn good, isn't it? Yes. For like, it was, uh, that was like 45 minutes. Because I did other things, we were talking back and forth. But. Actually, what I said in this one is uh, I started by asking the wrong question, right? I said, so what do you do? And then I stopped. Uh, the, what, what I was going to, the average guy says, so what do you do for a living? Isn't that a typical question? Yeah. I don't want to be typical. So I start to ask the typical question, and what do I do? I, fra fra I fractionate between her expectation of the typical stupid guy question with the real seduction question. And for some reason, it just makes it more acceptable. By the way, what energy did I come in with? When I walked in there and I said, bartender, I'm buying drinks for everyone. 
They can have water or ice water. What was it? It wasn't just, it was, it was part of put on and part being very dominant, right? It was very dominant energy, but it was playful. Like I came in, took control, but I did it playfully. Yes? You get it? It wasn't like I'm the big cock of the walk here. Who the fuck are you people? It was playful. It was funny. Right. He's got a good question. Okay. Okay. Here's a good question. He's got a good question. Listen. We were sitting here talking in between seminars. What day was it? That was uh, Friday. Friday morning. Yeah, you were talking. We were having a discussion about how Jews are shape-shifting vermin who are destroying the world, because that's what he believes. Um, no, I'm kidding. He doesn't really believe all of that. Um, yeah, most, of most of it. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, we're just kidding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Forget the secret underground tunnels with the weapons. Um, he told me a beautiful story. He told me that he was, he was swimming with whales. Where was it? Uh, Tonga. In Tonga. And he saw this mother humpback whale. And the thing that impressed him is how gentle she was. She was very big, very powerful. She had her calf with her. And she could have just sent him, she could have flicked him into nothingness, but she didn't. I said, dude, stop. That's an incredible language pattern. All you have to do is describe it with a little bit more sensory richness, and that's a beautiful pattern, and you're telling the truth. You weren't making that story up, were you? No. I said, that's incredible. That would get any woman like an, uh, going really strongly, and it really happened to you. So he says, well, what if you have your own experience like that? Do you start with it? or do you?" My suggestion is if you have a really great experience of something you do that helps you to escape, don't start with it. You want her talking and involved. Remember? Yes. And then, then if your experience somehow will really embellish her own or, or match her own, tell your experience. That's perfectly fine. If you tell your experience, make sure you include sensory rich detail. You don't say, well, we jumped in the water and the whales were big. <laughs> what I'm asking, if you, like, when you invite yourself on her journey, right. should you then... There's two choices. I oh, I, I get your question. I get it. When you invite yourself on her journey, and she's yeah. taking you along, yeah. when it comes time to tell your journey, do you invite her along yeah. with you? Do you say, imagine this, we're swimming together? Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it that way because it's really gilding the lily. Yeah. You've already gone along with her. You can just repeat, you can just tell your story. Okay. Right? Yeah. If you want to, if you want to be a little sneaky, sorry, you can incorporate some of her the way she described as long as it's within the bounds of truth, as long as it accurately describes what really happened with you, it's perfectly okay to incorporate some of her own words. For example, like, if as she's describing her skiing, she keeps talking about buzz, buzz, thrill, buzz. If it's part of the truth of your story that you were experiencing something like that, but rather than calling it buzz, you would call it high, it's perfectly okay to use her words in your story. If it reflects the truth of your own experience, that's perfectly okay. Because what it's going to do is that, that message is going to go in just a little bit more deeply into her experience. As, provided you're not making it up. If you're making it up and throwing in her words, that's leaning into the darker side of the force. But if it really is reflecting your own experience that you've had, it's perfectly okay to use some of her own words as part of your description of what happened to you. Provided it's an honest match. In that case, it's just like, you're just like translating from French into German. You're still speaking the same truth. Just, do you understand what I'm saying? It'll slide in better. I didn't mean, you fucking nasty fuckers. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> but it will slide in better. Now, stop right here. Oftentimes, just doing, with the right kind of girl who's highly imaginative and sexually adventurous and comfortable with men and comfortable with sex, often just doing that is quite enough. You don't have to go any further. Uh, just giving sensory rich descriptions, letting her describe her experience, and joining along in with it. Now, here's the advantage. I used to say that when she starts getting real excited, anchor it. Like, you see her talking, and, and some people I used to work with used to, will teach that. Let's say she's talking about the story, and you say, go, what's your favorite part of it? Which isn't bad. I'll say, well, what's your favorite part of the dive? But 
instead of watching for her, her getting excited and then anchoring it when she's getting really excited, I don't need to do that because I'm along in the experience with her. I'm saying, okay, so then what, we, what do we do, right? You understand? And because I'm in the experience with her, those feelings are already linked to me. But notice, it's voluntary. She could always say, no, you're not going on the trip with me, right? But because she's participating and taking me along on the journey with her, it's a voluntary process. At any point in this process, she could go, nah, we're going too far, right? The fact that she's taking me along, every moment I say, well, tell me what happens then. In effect, she's giving consent. Do you understand? Every time I said, well, then what does the water feel like? By, by going along with it, she's in effect giving her consent to it. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Yes. She's participating. It's not something I'm inflicting on her or kind of, do you understand? So you don't need to sit there and tap a chair or anchor yourself or, because she's participating with it. Do you get it? Yes. It's, much, it's much less work, too. You don't have to sit there and go, oh, anchor, anchor, anchor. You can actually enjoy her story. I'll tell you, you want to know my kryptonite among women that shuts down all my skills? You want to know my kryptonite? Yes. It's not big tits. It's not a hot ass. If a woman tells me a fascinating story and can regale me with fascinating stories, I just go like a five-year-old and get sucked into her stories, and I, I don't do it. I forget to do anything. If a, if a woman can tell me a good story and keep me utterly fascinated, like this chick, Lily, the 25-year-old, she just kept regaling me of tales of her adventures working for this merchant soldier of fortune consultancy company. I was like, really? What happened then? Well, I was sitting with the prime minister, the former head of Pakistan's intelligence service, <laughs> sipping a tea, and uh, uh, really? And she, then she told me how she was jumping out of a plane with a fake rifle at 300 feet. I'm like, really? And the French paratroopers told me, really? I was like, <laughs> she was sergeant me. <clears throat> a good story gets me every time. So anyway, so you're going along with this. Do you understand? Now, in the process, it's perfectly OK to inject sexual metaphor. Like, a, like I'm going to do that. My formula is, OK, she's telling me the story. What in the story matches something sexual? So if she says, OK, so we're, I say, so we're going down in the water, right? As we go down together, are we going down slow? Are we going down fast? It's sexual metaphor, right? That's perfectly, that's fine. I have no problem with it. So. Well, let's list them. OK, going down, what would they be? What, when you, it's easy. When you think of sex, what are some of the terms that pop to mind? That's, that's not metaphorical. What are some of the terms we use to refer to sex? In and out. What? Come first. What? Come fast. Okay. <laughs> what? What? Back and forth. Penetrate. Open. Opening. Did you hear me say I was talking about you feel your opening? When I talk about, when I say, well, it's almost like you can feel your opening for something different. Am I saying you feel your opening your mind, or, or is she feeling her opening? When I say that, I'm, imagine, I'm imagining the woman masturbating. I'll say it's like you can feel your opening to this something that's really exciting. I imagine her, it's an ambiguity. This is where the little tools come in, the smaller pieces. It's a cute ambiguity. When I say you feel, this is, I, this is sexual metaphor. It also acts as an, you're accelerating the pace of the feeling. You feel your opening. Here's one way to interpret it. It's a phonetic ambiguity. You feel you are opening. It's you, apostrophe re, opening. Right? So you feel that you are engaging in the act of opening in some way. Or am I saying you feel your opening? In this sense, feel means you're touching yourself. Your means the possessive form of the word. And opening means what? It's not a, it's not a verb. In this case, opening is a verb. It's actually a gerund, right? Is that ing? The ing form of the verb is called a gerund, correct? Any linguists here? I'm the only cunning linguist here? Yeah, it's a bad joke, I know. 
your opening, right? You feel your opening, which is you feel, you get the sense that you are engaging in the activity of opening, or you feel your opening. Feel in the sense of your, that's the verb, you're touching. And what are you touching? You're touching your opening, your vagina. You understand? So I, isn't that great? You feel your opening. And when I say it, I'm picturing her masturbating. So I say, it's so great. It's like you, you can feel, you feel your opening. And you can say, you feel your opening to a new direction, a magnificent new direction you didn't know you wanted to take inside. Now, does that mean you didn't know inside that you wanted to take it, or you didn't know that you wanted to take the erection inside yourself? You get it? Nude, am I saying new direction? But I want you to understand the context. Hold on, hold on. No, 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 quiet. This is done in the context where she's consensually going on a fantasy journey with you, right? The whole point is that she said you take, she's taking you by the hand and taking you on this journey with her. So it's in the context of a consensual, and every few moments you're going, well, take me with you, or what, do you, what is the water like? You're continually... Each step of the way, she's consensually going on this journey, consensually. Now, that's an interesting ambiguity, isn't it? Am I saying consensually or consensually? Did you hear it? Consensually is sort of a made-up word, but it means together through sensuality. So am I saying consensually, consensually or consensually? That's another ambiguity. So, no, I'm not saying consensually. <laughs> but you could. You know, listen, whatever meaning you can concoct inside yourself, Ross, concoct. Does it, does it happen that women try to correct you, like uh, you say, blow me, and she says, below me, does it? Never. Because, look, you must understand, they don't correct me because I'm not inflicting anything. They're enjoying the journey. Properly presented with the right kind of person, Seduction is something that women enjoy. They want it to happen. So why would they fuck up their own good time by going, meh, 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 meh. If, now, if I were inflicting it on her, if it were something I was doing to her rather than sharing along with her, she might, or if she just didn't like me and didn't want to have anything to do with it, you understand? Or if I was doing it in a way that wasn't pleasant. Because I'm doing it in a way that's pleasant and she's going along with it, why would she fuck up her good time? If she enjoys a roller coaster, and I got her in the best roller coaster in the world, why would she suddenly try to make herself sick? Doesn't make any sense. No. Stop worrying about that. Okay? So we got her on this journey, right? Yes. You feel your opening. You, it's almost like you can feel your opening to a new direction. You want inside. Now, the other ambiguity is, listen to me, look here, does that mean the ambiguity is new direction or new direction, but also there's an ambiguity about inside. Does that mean she wants inside herself, she realizes she wants a new, a new direction, or does it mean she wants a new direction inside? You understand? You got it? Well, that's really gilding the lily. That's pushing it. But you have to understand, look here. You're going to miss a point. I, want, I don't want you to miss this point. I want you to look here and get something. What's really driving this, I want you to hear me. What's really driving this is not the language. It's my vibe and my attitude and showing her that it's OK to go there. I want you guys to get this. If you do this through the vibe that, ha, 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 look what I'm doing to her, it's not going to work. If you do it, it it's got to be done. The language only works because the conductive medium is the vibe that I'm creating with her. Do you understand? All right. But it works pretty fucking good, doesn't it? <laughs> so she go, we go through this journey together, right? We come up. And then what I'll do is I'll change the subject. I'll talk about, I, remember I fractionate. I don't keep building this heavy thing. That's another reason why I wouldn't immediately share my own experience, because it's too heavy. I'm going to fractionate. What are some ways to fractionate? Once you've done a pattern like this, would you like three specific ways to fractionate, any yes. one of which will work? Yes. 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 Yeah. 
you can fractionate the direction of attention. So your direction of attention has been towards each other, right? Is that true? You can fractionate the direction of intention. You can vector the attention outward. In other words, you can suddenly pay attention to other people in the environment or to the food or to her friends. So you can fractionate by temporarily changing the direction of attention from inward between the two of you to outward. What's that? Yeah, I don't want to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to knock down the door with a sledgehammer. What I'm doing is making my side of the room so enticing that she wants to open that door and leave it open. But if, I put, if I've created all these good feelings and I keep building them on and on and on, this is the old model of speed seduction where I used to do that before 1997. And so it's not that it, it, it won't, let me try and be really accurate here, because I don't want to mislead. If you keep piling it on, with some women it can work. But uh, the challenge with it is, 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 there's challenges on many levels. I could go directly into, I could say it's just like when you take a bit of chocolate in your mouth. I could keep piling it on. The problem with piling it on is, first of all, it presumes I'm not picking the right person to play with. With the right person I don't need to pile it on, that is going to be enough. You get it? Yeah. The second is, piling it on isn't always an infliction, because there are some women who want it piled on. They just do. They want that sense that they're totally overpowered, totally overwhelmed. They have nothing to do with it. You're doing it to them. There are women like that. The challenge is, that in my experience, is with women like that, they tend to have a pretty loose grip on reality. That whatever is presented to them as their reality in that moment, they accept as a reality. The problem is, that everything in their life they have that response to. And so if something comes up that's really painful, that will become all of her reality. And it's just, people like that who respond to that tend to have a very badly defined boundaries. They really don't know who they are and who you are. And you're sort of like blurring the boundary in order to seduce them. It's not healthy for you because they will, you know Nietzsche, Nietzsche said, don't look into the abyss too long, because when you look into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. Uh, the abyss is like a big gaping hole that goes on forever. Uh, the problem with the kind of people who respond to this is, in order to pay attention to them in a way that they'll respond to, you have to start taking on some of their way of it. So yeah, you may be influencing them, but they're also influencing you with their bad boundaries and their nuttiness. You ever sleep with a girl and feel confused or just kind of dazed for a few days or weeks afterwards? I'm not being funny. I don't mean like, why did I fuck her? She was awful. But you know what I mean? Yeah. That's her confusion getting, sticking to you. It can happen. I don't want to make you paranoid or anything. I, I, it's not like, yes, James? Yeah, when you sleep with people, you get their energy on you. Be careful where you stick it. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you something. You won't believe me, but I swear to God it's true. Last three women, the last three women I had in my bed, I did not penetrate. Because they didn't come to me, either they weren't, they didn't come to me with the kind of energy that I felt I wanted to put myself into. Not to say I didn't have fun. I had fun. But I'm not going to put myself in, into someone who's not coming to me with pretty good. They were really, they wanted me, but they wanted me for the wrong reasons. They wanted me because they saw me as some kind of super successful, like, wow, you have the answers to all my problems. And I didn't want to have any, you know what I mean? So anyway. Um, the problem with piling it on is also it's just a lot of work. And I don't get to have any fun with the other person. So I don't pile it on. You could go to other patterns. I don't. What I want to do is fractionate. So you can fractionate the direction of your attention. So your, since your attention is on each other, you can turn your attention outward to the environment, to some other person, to the drink, anything. Hold on. Hold on. Do we understand that point? Yes, sir. 
It's another, remember I said fractionation is part of the machine language of the female psyche? Yep. Yep. There are many different ways you can fractionate. So fractionate the vector of your attention, where it's, where it's directed at. Yeah. That's a German question. You want an exact, you want the exact minutes? That's no, I'm serious. It's a good question, but what are you really asking? I'm calibrating to the person. It depends. If there's something out there, outward there, that could be useful and that's drawing closer together, I'll stick with it going out there. Let's say what we see is a couple in the corner making out like crazy, like a really horny, heavy makeout. I might want to spend some time having to look at that. I don't know. It depends on what's going on. I can't give you a formula. It's a felt sense. I feel my way through it. Ross, uh, Him, and then you. So yeah. What's the best way to, to redirect questions from her, which would turn out helpful, like what are you doing for work? Or oh, you, uh, well, that's a separate question. It's not dealing with this, but we'll get there. I read in a, in a book about women that they're always multitasking. That is like they are thinking of a few things at a time. Every human is constantly multitasking. Beneath the surface of your conscious awareness, you're having a million thoughts going on in parallel. Okay, this said that women are more capable of this than men. Men can focus on only one thing, blah, blah, blah. But it may be true. Is to occupy all her multitasking I don't know if that's true. I don't know. I don't know if it operates. I just know it works, okay? So you can fractionate the focus of your attention, correct? Outward. You can fractionate the vibe you're coming from. And the four vibes, don't get too confused here, get clear. Fundamentally, the four vibes that attract women are, and I, I'm going to do a loop. I'm hoping, the, oh, look here, the overall loop we're talking about now is fractionating as part of the overall sequence of how you conduct a successful Sarge. So I'm tracking it, I'm not losing it, I'm tracking it, all right? So a loop within a loop within a loop is... Is what were we talking about? <laughs> fractionating? Yes. Oh, the vibe. You can fractionate back and forth among the various different vibes that attract women. Look here. There's not any order, Germans, but the first vibe I will talk about, it's not like vibe one, vibe two, vibe five. The first vibe I'll talk about is being dominant. Being dominant, being strong, being a leader captain of the football team, the president of the school class, dominant, strong, a leader. But do understand me. Do look up here. There's a key distinction. Dominant, dominant is not domineering. Authority is not authoritarian. What is the distinction between dominant and domineering? If you take dominant and you slide inside of it, arrogance, and having no concern for other people, it turns to domineering. If you take dominant and you slide inside it hostility and abusive behavior, then it turns into domineering. Subtract it out, and it's just dominant. Dominant simply means you will set the direction for things, and you're the one who's in the lead. Do you understand that distinction? Yes. Many of you have had abusive fathers or abusive male figures in your life. I know it's the case. And so for many of you, it, when you make the distinction between domineering and dominant, it would allow you to understand we're not talking about the way those people acted. Because they were never dominant, they were domineering. Do you understand? Yes. That's dominant. Here's the basic belief behind being dominant. You ready? Look here. Don't write. I'll tell you when to write. My belief, I rehearse this. I do the magical self ritual, and like once a week, I rehearse my vibes. Here it is. The basic belief is I'm not your girlfriend with a penis. At some point, I could fuck you, and I'm also going to make sure you're safe every step of the way. Now, do I say that? No, no. no but it's conveyed. That's what's conveyed. So the basic belief is I'm not your girlfriend with a penis. I said Shirlene is so cute. When Shirlene was getting married and picking out all her wedding stuff, she didn't have any girlfriends around. She said, Paul, you have to look at the plan for the China. I said, Shirlene, I love you. You're my best friend. I'm not your girlfriend with a penis. I'm a guy. I have no interest in any of this. Find a girl to talk to about. But please, will you just look at the pattern? No, I won't. I'll come to your wedding, but I'm not going to look at your China pattern. I have a penis. Yes. Am I lying? I, told, I said that, didn't I? 
Was it the China pattern or something else? What was it? It was something stupid like that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Jim. I'm not your girlfriend with a penis. At some point, I could fuck you, and I'm also going to make sure that you're safe. You got that? That's the basic belief behind it. I'm not your girlfriend with a penis. At some point, I could fuck you. Now, you notice what I'm saying? That I said, I want to fuck you, or I'm going to fuck you. At some point, I could fuck you, which implies that she has to earn it in some level. It's implied. At some point, I could fuck you, and I'm also going to make sure you're safe. You got it? That's dominant. That's very attractive. So you can, what's another vibe? Look here. Being playful and fun. Now look here. This is a key distinction. The way the alpha male I idiot imitators, what do they teach you? They teach you, well, you've got to have a really exciting life. You should go skydiving and pet a tiger and tell her tales so she'll be envious of your exciting life. There's nothing wrong with that. That can be fun. I encourage you all to stretch your horizons and to try out things that you've never tried before. I think it's wonderful. It adds juice to life. Do it. But it's not what I mean by this. What I mean is you have a happiness that's independent of external circumstances. You have a way of finding joy in your life that's not dependent on external events going your way or on other people approving you. That's much more subtly attractive. And again, having an exciting life, fun adventures, it's great. I'm all for it. But it's not what I mean. You understand? I mean you have a, a, a joy that's independent of external circumstances or external validation. This is deeply attractive to all people, men and women. Will you validate me externally and tell me I'm right, Shirley? No. Uh, <laughs> I know the contradiction. I, I see what I'm doing. It's a happiness, a joy, independent of Where do you get it? Through a spiritual or meditation practice, I find. Can't always get there, though. It's an ideal. It's not necessarily where you get. You understand? OK. Yes. Not really, but hold on, hold on. Okay. Let me teach. Even if it seems it's not according to your standards and where you want to go, let me teach. <coughs> Trust me. Playful and fun, dumb and strong leader, demonstrating authority in her world, demonstrating understanding. This is deeply attractive. Deeply attractive to demonstrate understanding of her world. Deeply attractive. It implies that you also show curiosity, deep curiosity about her world. The parallel hand holding, what's holding hands with this hand in hand is having genuine deep curiosity. If you're ever stuck on where to go with your seduction, get really curious. Part of this demonstrating understanding also is the capacity to be deeply curious. Part of what makes me interesting is I'm deeply interested in other people, deeply. But in order to be deeply curious, you have to have, be quiet in your mind and know what to set aside temporarily. Get deeply curious. You understand? and demonstrate you understand her world. I demonstrated some of that with this lady by showing I understood what her world felt like, right? right. Playful and fun, demonstrating understanding, dominant strong leader. And the final vibe is vulnerable. Vulnerable slash authentic. Which is not to say that these are not authentic, but it's more like vulnerable. What I mean by vulnerable, look here. I don't mean you cry at movies. I don't mean that. I really don't. I don't mean you cry at movies, or you're graspy or needy, or you tell her 10 times a day how much you love her, or you think she's a ray of sunshine from the butthole of heaven. I mean, you speak your truth. If she pisses you off, you tell her. That's just one example. 
The basic belief behind this is, look here, is speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. I told you this Friday night, remember? Yep, yep. Speaking, now at first it's going to be something you're playing with, but when it gets to be the truth, that's really powerful. Speaking my truth is more important to me than getting into your pants. It's the ultimate challenge for women. What? It's basically being honest in the way that may risk offending her. Is it a question or a story? I, I only have time for questions. Quick questions, simply, elegantly phrased. What? Right. So. You can fractionate, look here, you can fractionate the direction of your attention. You can fractionate among different vibes. Yes? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Look here. You can fractionate locations. You can move her to a different location. Let's go next door. Or you can walk to a different part of the location you're in. Fractionate locations. How do you demonstrate authority? Yeah, the, the tools demonstrate authority and hold. Yeah. You can demonstrate authority by the nature of the questions you ask, by showing that you understand, by pacing. What did I do with her? I said, I bet your job is really important to your family. They're very proud of you, and that matters to you, doesn't it? Understand? You can fractionate locations. You can fractionate intensity, in your case, right? Fractionate the level of intensity of the interaction. Yes? You could go back to a little bit of chump talk or fluff talk. <coughs> you could do that. And then you come back to this kind of talk. Yeah. But basically you have the control. You could go back to like, right. You have yes. To keep the control. That's a loaded word, but yes. Let's say you have to control the direction. It's about direction control, right? If your direction gets out of control, there could be a problem. You getting this, Jonathan? Yeah? That make sense? You can fractionate the intensity with which you communicate. You can go back to a chump topic briefly if you want to. Uh, so, um, where do you live, or, or where'd you go to school? It's a jump topic. You can also fractionate. You know, you can fractionate. You can talk to somebody else. You can turn and talk to one of her friends. That's, but also that also counts as fractionating the focus of your attention. Or you could involve a friend in the conversation with the two of you. Right. These are things that I can't give you a strict formula for. I can give you options to play amongst. I can't give you a strict formula because there, it's, it's done by feel. Understand? But this is the overall pathway. You wanted a pathway. I'm showing you a pathway, right? All right. So where do you go back to? What's the next good thing you could go to? OK. So we've gone this far. We've gone from opening. Right? To, yes. to doing some little fun quizzes, then to launching into something, yeah. either by asking a question or playing a game. Right? Yeah. Now, we want to run a second round of this stuff. What could we do? Well, it's pretty easy. Look up here. Look up here. We could pick something that involves a different topic or theme. Yes? So we either pick something that involves a different topic or theme, or we continue on the same theme in a different way. So those are our two choices. We can continue along with the same topic, just with a different example. Yes. Or we could pick, we could do something from a different category of topics and themes. Does that make sense? Simple, right? 
So our next decision tree is we could flow to, here are our choices. Different topic, different topic theme, same, but different example. Different example or angle. So if our topic, if the first theme has been about, say, connections, and we want to go on with it and do same topic but a different example, we could start talking about how we connect with other people. If our first example of a pattern is connecting, yes? Yeah, is it interfering strongly? Has it been constantly interfering? Or? All right, good enough. Sorry. I don't know who that is, but thank you. Someone just said I was a genius. I don't know who sent that, but thank you, whoever it was. Okay. Better? Okay. So, we if we're let's say we're let's say that in this example we started off with adventure, escape, indulgence, right? We could continue along with that same topic, but use a different example. Yes. yes. So from there we could go. You know. Um, we could go into the blowjob pattern. You can say, you know, I was w watching this show talking about the difference between compulsion and, and anticipation. We could flow into the blowjob pattern. Or we could go to any other thing that deals with escape, adventure, indulgence, right? We could choose to continue with it, right? Or we could go to some different topic. Hold on, hold on. But what if she catches me making the transition? No, I don't want to hear any more questions like that. What's your question? They're in the home study course. Do you have my basic home study course? Yeah. They're there. Listen again. They're there, and they're in the workbook, too. I didn't get the workbook. Well, you can download the workbook. Uh, who did you order it from, me or the other guy? Well, then don't blame me. Blame that asshole. Blame that worthless piece of shit. I'm not talking about anyone I used to do business with. Um, anyway. I'll get, give you your email. I'll send you a link. You can download it. All right, listen. So we could go to a different topic, or we could go to a different example, the same topic. But listen, you better be damn well certain that I'm going to incorporate all of her responses again. Remember? I'm not just going to drop all the juicy sauce she gave me the first time around. I'm not going to drop her trance words or drop any of that other stuff if she gives me a self-anchor. How many think I'm going to let it go and start from the beginning again? How many think I'm going to fucking incorporate it in the next round? Look up here. So let's say in the course of doing that first one, she talks about buzz, energy, excitement, and she does one of these. <sighs> Look here. Do you think I'm going to not incorporate that in the next round of patterns? You better believe I am. Or let's say, look here. Look here, guys. Let's say the first thing I do is the twin brothers. And I have a bunch of anchors stacked in my thumb and do this. Do you think I'm going to ignore that the next thing I do? Or am I going to go, hmm, here's something interesting to talk about. That's right. That's an example of something I return to periodically. Remember I said when you return to things periodically, there's mastery in it? So you better believe that any good responses I get from the first round, I'm going to bring them along. I'm going to keep rolling that snowball down the hill in the direction it's already going and adding mass to it till it becomes an avalanche. Do you get it? Also, one of the things I'm doing when I pop out of the first pattern is I give the safe door a tug. So when I do that first round of patterning and I pop her out and fractionate her briefly into something else, I'm sort of giving the safe door a tug. What does that mean? I could lean in closer. I could look at her lips. I could touch her. I want to do a little bit of lean. I want to give the safe door a tug in between patterns. So that could mean looking at her lips a little bit too long. Look at me. Here's some ways you tug the safe door. You look at her lips. You look in her eyes just a little bit too long. You look in her eyes like you're already lovers. I could touch her in a way and hold the touch a little bit longer. 
These are ways of tugging the safe door. If I look at her lips and she looks back at mine, I may lean in for a kiss. I don't know. Do you understand? So I'm, when I fractionate in between patterns, that's when I give the safe door a tug. How do I give the safe door a tug? I could look in her eyes and hold her gaze too long, more than, more than a stranger would. I could look at her lips. I could touch her a certain way. Maybe that's when I throw in a little innuendo or, or, or you understand? I'm going to give the safe door a tug in that moment of fractionating outside of the pattern. Does that make sense? Now it's coming together, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I can go to the same topic, but a different example or a different angle. Or I could go to a different topic. We have six different things to pull from, right? Generally speaking, I like to change it up. So I've if I've done something regarding connections, then I want to go to indulgence and escape. If I've started with indulgence and escape, I want to go to connections. Or I want to go to a demo. Or, or a, do you understand what I'm saying? Or a joker story. But they're going to incorporate the things that were in the first round. So with speed seduction, we're constantly, we're getting response. We do a first round to get some strong responses. We fractionate, and then when we fractionate, we test the safe door. Then we go back into the second round, and we bring forward into the second round all those juicy, saucy responses, verbal and nonverbal, we got in the first one. You get it? Yes. So, wow. So, hmm. Let's look at, hey, here's something we could, hey, you know what? Here's an interesting thing to talk, here's something interesting. You get it? Yeah. Or you've anchored all her best feelings to the glass of water. You take a sip, you go, you know. You get it? Yeah. So now we're going to incorporate everything into this next round. The next round could be any, anything you want. It could be, you could tell them the dream story. My friend had this incredible dream. Let me tell you about it. Right? Mm -hmm. You come out of it. Now, look here, strictly speaking, look here, let me speak with full rigor. I'm not speaking with full rigor. It's also okay, if, you, if while you're doing a pattern, let's say you're doing the dream story, and she's like, she gives you the eye scan. The eye scan is when she looks back and forth, she scans your eyes. She looks in this eye and that eye, looks at your lips. If she's giving you that eye scan and she's like leaning into you and like all over you, or she pulls her panties aside to show you. <laughs> While you're doing the pattern, you don't have to stop, fractionate, and then tug the safe door. If you hear the tumblers are going whir, 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 and it's swinging open, give the door a tug. Don't formally stop. You understand? These are just suggestions. Formally speaking, it's part of the formalism of the equation, you test the safe door when you fractionate between patterns. But if you see strong responses, she's looking in your eyes, holding your gaze, looking back and forth between your eyes, looking at your lips, you know, leaning into you, breathing heavy, you feel the heat coming off her body. Sometimes you literally smell lubrication. Give the safe door a tug. Don't say, because Ross said you have to wait to, these are ideas. You get it? James didn't have to fractionate. She pulled her panties, showed them the wet, dripping wet vagina. He didn't have to. Stop and enjoy. What? Stop and enjoy. That's the time to stop and smell the saucy roses. Do we need to change tapes? Yes. Give me one minute to change. Are you guys enjoying this? Yes. I'm teaching with full energy at 7.30. Yes. I'll go for another hour if you participate. Yes. 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 Oh, well, slow down. <laughs> shh, shh, shh. Let's all get quiet. Shh. We've been together since Friday night. We're learning a lot. Calm down. Savor the last moments we have. This will pass and it'll be a memory. And, we'll, and so let's savor it. Let's go slow. Slow down. I know your eager little chicks, you want the mama to throw up in your throat to have, give, give you worms. But let's slow down and say, look around. You know what's really good, Jonathan? This is an opportunity for men to join together and support each other and learn something important together. Many of us, who here had a father who taught them all about this? Are you watching? Who had a dad who took him aside and hung out with him and explained about women and really knew what he was talking about and showed us how to get on with ladies? Does that tell you something? We are men whose fathers did not teach us this. 
My father, I love my father dearly. My father busted his ass supporting six kids. Plus my cousin Paula lived with us for six or seven years. So he had, and my mom, and there's, he had seven mouths to feed in addition to himself. He had to work three jobs five days a week, and then he worked on the weekends, two jobs, to feed his family. My father was far from being a carouser or a drunk. He never abused us or any of that. Didn't beat us, nothing. But my father couldn't be around for me as someone who is a teacher because he just, he was busy earning a living to, 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 so we could survive. <laughs> you want to change the tape or did you change it? What's that? All right, we'll keep going and let me know what, give me a count when I have like 30 seconds, all right? I love my father dearly, he's still with us. He's a horny old man who tries to make out with every girl I introduce him to. That's just him. And he, he, he said, I don't know, I tried his stuff and I got my face slapped. Well, <laughs> But my father was not there for me in this way because he couldn't be, and I don't think he had a clue anyway. So, you know, this is something that we really need. We are, a group, we are overall, we're men who didn't have fathers and really didn't have teachers. We're a fatherless, teacherless society when it comes to this subject. So this is a place where men can join together, not come together, I was going to say that, join together and learn about something that's powerfully important and support each other in that. I think there's some friendships that have been made here, yes? Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is really good. How many, how many ways can men have camaraderie and brotherhood? Not a lot of ways. So I'm very happy to be supporting that and facilitating that. It's one of the side benefits. In addition to teaching the technology and doing the lovely change work, men are, men are joining together in friendship. Yes? Yes. So we launch into the second round. It could be anything. Challenge me. Pick a topic, uh, pick a category of topics for me. Fascination. Fascination would be an overall example of what? Yeah, but what kind of theme does it fit under? It's a subcategory of connection, because you're only fascinated with things you connect to, right? Right? True? So, I'll say, so I can go, you know, what also interests me is how we connect with the things that really, truly grab our interest, like in a place like this, you go and you meet people and there's not really much, but then some people, it's like when you meet someone and there's just something about this person where you go inside and you find that part of you where you can feel your opening <laughs> for something that's totally incredible, you know, with me. I almost, sometimes I feel like there's a, a whole new part you want to take in. No, it doesn't matter. I'm making it up on the spot. Yes? I wanted, I, I'm getting good response, but uh, often the girls ask me, do, are you studying psychology? Or you okay. If she asks you, are you studying psychology, are you? No. Anymore, because I'm too old, and I'm too tired, and I'm too sad with the weight of years. <laughs> No. Ross, is this yeah. all of time? Yeah. Is this all about um, getting her in bed the first night? Or Not necessarily. Meeting? No. So you wouldn't have two or three meetings? Good question. My general philosophy is do as much as you can on that first meeting. So then you will get the second meeting, and she's primed in the second meeting to do what you want. Right. Many people say, how can I get more phone numbers? Why would you want to? That may not be the best thing. I'm not aiming at phone numbers. I'm aiming at getting these kind of responses. So stop wondering, when do I get her number? And instead go, OK, how can I get these responses? Because when you get these responses, they say, how can we hang out again? What can we do? They'll close you, usually. Your question is, do they, what if they ask, do you study psychology? How often does that happen? 50% of the time they ask you, to, so if that's happening, you're presenting it too seriously. You're presenting it as an academic discussion or an analysis rather than a fun thing that requires your participation. He's Are we clear? <laughs> Are we clear? Claro? You're just too deep? That's a clue. I can tell you exactly what's going wrong there. I'm not being funny. If you're getting things like you're too deep, then you're attempting to, to
to deal with conceptual patterns with someone who needs it directly related to her experience. One of the other things I'm tugging and pulling for to see is, is she highly conceptual? Can I talk about general ideas? Like, what's the difference between what you think you want and what would come along and really totally blow you away because it's so different? If she's a conceptual, conceptual thinker, she can apply that to her own experience. If she's not, if she's more sensory oriented, then what has to happen is you need to bring it to that level. So if you're getting things like, oh, you're too, you're really deep, essentially that's her mind saying, I don't respond to conceptual approaches, bring it back down to earth with me. So with someone like that, you re-engage by coming in with a game, a quiz, right? A demonstration, you understand? Does that make sense? I, this, I, I've learned that distinction, and it's okay with me. That's fine. You get a sense early on. You'll start to develop really good intuition within the first two or three minutes. You'll be able to tell. You'll be able to tell. But that's what's going on there. What's going on with you is you're doing it too seriously. You need to come more from the fun, playful vibe. And you, you're not engaging her enough. You're probably doing too much talking. Yeah. These are certain troubleshooting things that you can look for. And I should also say, when you do this, women will tend to respond according to the energy that you present. If you present nervousness, like, oh, I'm doing something slightly naughty, like I'm going to pick her pocket now or steal her watch, you really got to get it out of that mind frame. What you're not doing that. You're presenting things that feel good to her and please her. You're giving a gift. The trick is to believe that you're giving a gift, even if you're giving it at first awkwardly or without any kind of sense of style. You're still giving a gift. James. I was going to say, one of the big issues I had to get out of my way with, with doing this kind of shit was, like, I didn't deserve the reaction. One thing that guys have to uh, say is deserving this problem. Yeah. Me. Yeah. That you may think you don't deserve it. That's in a whole other issue. All right. You got this? Yeah. So it may be the case if she's show. Now, look. Some guys say, well, how do you decide whether you try to get her home with you that night or you have to go for a second meeting? Yeah. Right? I can't give you an exact formula, but I can give you some guidelines. Here's some guidelines, some parameters. First parameter is what do I want? Do I feel sufficiently comfortable? Is she doing anything in the interaction to make me feel more comfortable and more welcome? I bet you never thought of that, did you? Is she in any way like that girl in my dream who's doing something to make me feel more welcome? Anything. It's key. How strongly is she responding? Is she showing readiness? Is she ready to? Do I have the time? Am I exhausted? Do I have to get up in the morning? These are different things you have to weigh. It may be that in my mind, there's 10 numbers in that combination. I've got seven out of the 10. But I just don't have the time or the circumstances, or I just don't feel like getting the other three. If I'm 70% of the way there, or at least 50% of the way there, I'm going to go, you know what? We need to hang out again. What steps can we take to make sure we hang out again? I don't say, can I have your number? I'd like to ask you out. It's very simple. It's one thing. I say, you know, we need to hang out again. Or why don't we hang out again? What steps can we take? That's it. That's my one close right there. I don't have 50 of them. I have one. You know, we need to, I got to get going. We need to hang out again. What steps can we take to hang out again? And then if she gives you the number, she's doing it as part of her investment in the process of hanging out again. She's not giving it to you because you asked her. Does you see that distinction? If I say, you know what, I'd like to get your number, all of a sudden all that autopilot social stuff could come slamming down. Wait a minute, I only give my number to guys I'm going to date. I only date guys who look like that guy over there. So even though I felt wonderful with you, you can't have my number. You get it? I don't ask for phone numbers. Because that triggers the wrong kind of autopilot. She'll pop right back to her social approval level of the mind, and all that beautiful work I did went right down the tampon drain. <laughs> and that thing will not hit her when you call her or make an appointment? Just don't go there. So I'm going to say, you know, I need to get going, but we, sh we, we got to hang out again. What steps can we take to make sure we do that? Now, she'll say, well, why don't you, why don't you come home with me now? Or she'll say, you know, well, let's go somewhere now. Or she'll say, well, why don't we hang out tomorrow? Why? Or she'll go, well, I have this thing called a phone. Or she'll say, let's exchange numbers. If she doesn't have an answer, you go, I'll tell you what. Let's just exchange information. I'll give you a call tomorrow. Right? Then 
you call her tomorrow. By the way, when you get the number, always write it down in at least two places. Put it in your cell phone, write it somewhere so you don't be like that guy yeah. in the dumpster diving story, right? I always call her the next day. Don't wait, it's bullshit. You don't know what's going to happen in the life of a really hot woman. You don't know how much stimulation is thrown her way. That iron is hot, you strike it. Yes, sir. What? I can't hear you. Road sync? Okay. It's emailed. Oh, that's nice. Okay. That's nice. I like that. Okay. Sure. All right. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's my call. I don't do anything other than that because then it gets too complex. This is like John Wooden drilling the Bruins, making them take 10,000 practice shots from the same place until they're experts at it. That's it. Yes. Uh, yeah. The next day, um, what happens if I have a lot of problems with jealousy, you know? What does that mean? Ladies um, that I date. In other words, if I'm dating one, um, then I start dating another. Are you bragging or complaining? That's not part of this discussion, though. Okay. I, well, I thought you were done with that. No, I'm not done. Okay. So now you're in the position where you're going to call her, right? Or she... <clears throat> when you call her, one of two things will happen. You're either going to get her on the phone or you won't. Right. If you get her on the phone, they're always eager to talk to me. If they're not eager to talk to me or suddenly cold, that's it. Game over. I don't play it. But if I get the message machine, then I'm really going to have fun. <laughs> then I'm really going to have fun. Huh? I, I do something like this. I'll go, hey, uh, hey, Debbie, I don't know where you'll be when you get this message or when you get it or what you'll be doing when you get it. But I do know you'll probably be pleasantly surprised to hear my voice. So... Um, why don't you give me a call uh, and, and we'll talk about what we could enjoy. Or we'll, you know, give me a call and, and we can talk about hanging out, seeing how much we could enjoy each other. Why don't you give me a call and we can talk about hanging out, see how much we could enjoy each other. Right? Can we Yes. I'll say something like, uh, hey, hey, Debbie, it's Ross. You know, thanks. Did you enjoy it? What was that? What was that? I didn't hear you. Absolutely what? Over the moon? All right. Um, hey, Debbie, it's, it's, you know, it's Ross. You're not going to say it's Ross, okay? Uh, I don't know where you'll be when you get this message or what you'll be doing when you get it. I don't know where you'll be when you get this message. What you'll be doing when you get it. or when you'll get this message. What am I doing? I'm pacing it, right? Can she deny any of that? I don't know. I don't know where you'll be when you get this message or what you'll be doing. When you get, when you get it or when you'll get it. But I do know you can remember how much fun we had meeting each other last night. And uh, we can look forward to talking and seeing what we could enjoy. That's another way to put it. But I do know you can remember how much fun we had hanging out the other night. And I'm, I'm going to call it, uh, I, after I finish this, we're going to take a short break. I do know, I do know you can remember how much fun we had hanging out last night. And we can look forward to talking and hanging out again. And we can look forward to talking and hanging out again. You got that? The basic structure of it is I'm pacing the reality that I don't know when, when where, when, or right? right? And I'm saying, but I do know that you, you can remember. There's a command. Remember how much fun, hear the command? And we, we can look forward 
to talk, to hanging out again. We can look forward to talking and hanging out again, seeing how much we can enjoy. You understand? Yeah, it is. Now, no matter what I do in the next 15, 20 minutes, someone's going to be unhappy with me because I can't give everyone everything. But let's get back to this. The phone message. So I leave that phone message. Almost always I'll get a call back right away. Do we get the gist of the phone message? It doesn't have to be exact. Now look here, here's a key point, guys. When she calls you, the purpose of that phone conversation is to like have a little fun and then get her to agree to meet you. Don't, I used to make the mistake of talking for hours on the phone because I like talking to girls and it's a bad idea. You don't want to spend a lot of time on the phone yakking away, becoming her phone buddy. The purpose of that call, be pleasant, have some fun, remind her of some of the fun you had and make a meeting, right? Do not fall into my trap. I love talking to girls, and I get lazy, so we talk, 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 talk on the phone. And if you do that, they want to keep you your phone fantasy, so be careful there, all right? Now, let's say you don't get, she doesn't call you back. That's when the fun begins. Let the games begin, because that's when my patented answering machine destroyers. <laughs> I have these cool names, the answering machine destroyer, the boyfriend ignorer. I'll run into one, of, I'll do one of my answering machine destroyers. I'll say something like, I'll say something like, hey, it's Ross calling. Uh, don't write, I don't want to see writing. I want you to get the understanding. Come on, guys, we've been together three days and you're still not getting it. I'll say something, hey, it's Ross. Uh, I just thought I'd give it a last shot at talking. You didn't strike me as someone who'd drop an opportunity without at least checking it out. You struck me as someone who would see an opportunity and take it. So if you can find your own reasons to call me, I'm at boom. That almost always gets a call back within an hour, if not within three minutes. Now let's parse it out before I give it to you word for word. Hey, so-and-so, it's Ross. I thought I'd give it a last shot at getting a chance to talk. What's the implication? What am I saying? This is it. I'm busy. You didn't strike me as someone who would drop an opportunity. You struck me as someone who would see an opportunity and take it. Now, am I saying what kind of opportunity to do what kind of thing? No, it's vague. And I'm also issuing a challenge of saying, oh, you know, you, you struck me as someone who's adventurous and fun. Are you that kind of person? So listen, if you can find your own reasons to call me. Now, is that a command or is that a command? Mm -hmm. Am I telling her what the reasons are? The only way she can make sense of it is find her own reasons to call me. It's remarkable how that works. Find your own reasons to call me, it's, right? And by the way, if she can't find, look at here. Here's a real cool, cool thing. If she can't find her own reasons, she won't call you and she shouldn't call you. Did you get that? Yeah. If she can't find her own reasons, she won't call you and she shouldn't call you because why would you want to be with someone who after all that beautiful stuff can't find a reason to call you? can't get it through her mind to call you. Something is wrong with that equation and you don't want to go there and deal with it. Trust me. And you don't want to bother even trying to figure it out. I used to bother, don't. That's a samskara. The fixed pattern thinking that says you have to figure out everything that doesn't work, forget that. Go off your gift elsewhere. You hmm. understand? Yes, sir. So she gets two calls. This is the second one, right? This is the second one, if she doesn't return the first one. Yeah, I thought I'd give it a last shot at getting a chance to talk. Talk about what? Talk in what way? It's vague, right? Well, I'll give you the last shot. I thought I'd, I thought I'd give it a last shot. Or I thought I'd give it a last ch I thought I'd give it a last shot at getting a chance to talk. Got that? Mm -hmm. You didn't strike me as someone who'd drop an opportunity. Strike me as someone who would drop an opportunity. Now, guys, this works if you had delivered matter of fact. If you deliver it and you're angry and you show somehow you feel hurt that she didn't call you back, it won't work. 
I've had students repeat things I've said word for word and it didn't work. And I said, well, tell me how you said it. And well, no wonder it didn't work. Mm -hmm. You didn't strike me as the kind of person who would drop, you didn't strike me as someone who would drop an opportunity. You struck me as someone who would see an opportunity and take it. Now, opportunity is also a very positively loaded word. There's a little trick here. I am playing a little bit of a crafty trick for which I will own up. Look here. Opportunity is a really positive word. When you hear opportunity, opportunity implies that it's not an obligation, it's a gift, it's something you want. Would we not agree that opportunity? When someone tries to do a sell you, they go, well, the cost of this opportunity, and you go, fuck you, I know you're trying to sell me, right? They never call it a sale, they call it an opportunity, right? But given that you've had this good interaction with her before, it will then be interpreted as being positive, right? So, you didn't strike me as someone who would drop an opportunity, Struck, struck me as someone who would see an opportunity and take it. Yes? Did I do now? Do I even say what that means? What does that mean? What does it mean? What kind of opportunity? Hold it. What does it mean? Take it in what way? How does that? What, what does it mean? It's all completely vague. It's up to her to interpret. But in the context of her having a really great time with you, she'll interpret it in the right way. Now listen. The pre my, my, in my mind, the reason I'm leaving this message, I'm just telling you, is it could be that something's going on in her environment that she really does want to call me back. The only reason I'm leaving this message is I'm assuming she really wants to talk to me, but something's happened in her environment to, to derail her attention. And by giving this call, it reminds her. You understand? This is basically a clever and f a clever reminder. It's not a punishment. It's not an intrusion or an infringement. It's really important that you guys get that line and stay on the right side of that line. Mm? Times, Cowboys, how long would you leave that after the first call? Three to four days. I usually give people three to four days to call me back. Because you really don't know what's going on in her. But she could have any number of million things. Maybe her cat got lost. But see, the advantage of this is she doesn't have to tell you. She, you don't get excuses. She either calls you or she doesn't. Right? It could be any number of things distracting her attention. Nothing to do with you or her. That happens. So this is giving her a window of opportunity to step back through into the connection that you shared. Without, you know, without it being blaming or mean. I'm not going, hey, you fucking dumb cunt. <laughs> Who the fuck do you think you are not returning my call, bitch? I'm not going there. I'm simply saying, hey, you know, you didn't strike, blah, blah, blah. And then notice the kicker. If you can find your own reasons to call me, that's a command. Find your own reasons to call me. Now, there's something else going on there. Not only is it vague, but I'm also saying it's your ability. I'm, I'm actively saying that if you want to engage with me, you have to take an active role. I'm not saying, do, I didn't say do it to please me, right? I'm saying find your own reasons. It's a challenge, but it's a true challenge. Look here. The best challenges are true challenges. I want a woman who finds her own reason to do things. Not because I'm coercing her or scolding her or making her feel bad. I want her to find her own reasons. It's a challenge and it's a true challenge because it really is what I want. The, the most clever, slick language works really well when there's truth behind it. If you can take standing, if you can take being utterly truthful and project it through clever language, the, 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 the power is still in the truth, but the clever language acts as a really nice massage to let the truth go in in an even more sexy way. Do you understand what I'm saying? It helps her receive that truth in a way that's that is more receptive, more sexy. It's still truth. It's just coming through that filter of, of, of clever language. Do you understand? I mean it. When I say find your own reasons, I want her to do it because she wants to. This is not designed to make her do something she doesn't want to do. It's to remind her, hey, get back on track. And to let her know that I am very busy. I'm not going to chase her down. Some girls want to feel chased down. I don't do it. So I'm even then I'm screening. She won't call me back if she doesn't really, if she doesn't really want to, 
That's fine with me. Or if she's out of control in her life and is so chaotic, because I don't want to deal with something like that. Or she wants me to chase her. So isn't that great? If she doesn't call me back, look at the time I've saved. <laughs> if she doesn't call me back, it's because of one or more of those three reasons where I wouldn't want to deal with her anyway. She doesn't call me back because she wants me to chase her. No, I don't want to chase her, so good. Thank you. She doesn't call me back because her life is so chaotic she can't control it. Great, I don't want to be around that. Or she can't find her own motivation to do it. Great, I don't want her. You get it? Yeah. So the best patterns have, a, have are coming from truth, and they're screening and setting standards. And the languaging is just a way to make what you're sending more acceptable, more fun, more, do you understand? Sometimes your truth comes through so powerfully, you need a filter around it. You need to buffer it, some lubrication, because it's a really big truth going in. So if you can find your own reasons to call me? Yeah. Call if, you can follow, if you can find your own reasons to call me, my number is. Do you need me to fill in your number, or you got that? I think I got it. Now, I want to do one more thing, and then I'm going to stop, because I've been going, we want to get back to this little meditation thing I did, yes. right? And how to do that. Yes, yes. Right? So, yes. I had this question before how to uh, redirect her smoothly if it breaks in from topics. You are really worried about things not working. No, no, I'm not worried. I'm just... <clears throat> how to redirect her if she gets on topics that are completely what? That never like happened. Topics, sir, sir, he wants to know what to do. Okay, I'll take the question. He wants to know what do you do if she starts in on questions that are not useful, topics that are boring, topics that go on a chart or a graph. I swear to you, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never once had it happen. Not even once. If that's happening to you, it's because you're presenting things in a way that are not, that's either not fun or playful enough, or you're too highly conceptual. Something is, you need to go back using those different categories I gave you and look at the different levels. Because if that's happening, something is incorrect in your presentation and the way you're presenting it, or you're picking people who just don't get it and you need to move on more quickly. I've never, ever had that happen, ever.